nutrition, relaxation and racing. Motorsport on the mountain on the long weekend is a tradition that goes back 85 years to Bathurst's first ever car race. It's the base on which the Bathurst tradition was built. One that continues today as this wonderful regional city comes alive again with the sights and sounds of the mountain's most diverse grid yet. 60 cars and 160 drivers, along with a wide array of sensational supports, descend on the mountain this Easter for what has become another must-win Bathurst Classic. With the fast cars, big stars, and the thrills and spills you've come to expect from a Bathurst Enduro, it's set to be another Easter to remember. With thanks to major sponsor High Tech Oils, welcome to the 2024 Bathurst Six Hour. Well, what an amazing place for Easter. Mount Panorama awaits the eighth running of the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour, the production car classic at Mount Panorama. The grid is filling. We're not too far away, 15 minutes away from race start here at Mount Panorama with 58 cars about set to tackle this mountain. A guy who knows all about winning here, Jason Bargwana, 2000 Bathurst 1000 champ, part of our coverage today. Bargs, happy Easter to you. What are you looking forward to most about today's classic? Well, thank you, Aaron, and happy Easter everyone at home. This is certainly becoming one of the most iconic events on the uh, motorsport calendar throughout the course of the year. Production car racing, endurance car racing here at Bathurst. It's not only the battle for outright today, that's very exciting, but it's the class battle throughout the day. Reminds me of when I was a kid watching Bathurst, you've got that huge intense battle for outright, and let's keep an eye on how it goes throughout the course today for the class as well. We've spent the last couple of days up and down the pit lane chatting to teams, drivers, teams, families, living the dream, racing at Bathurst. This is the clubby race at Bathurst. This is the one that the state level racers can go up against Bathurst winners like Will Davison, Hall of Famers like John Bow. It's such a diverse mix of cars, makes, models, drivers, teams. There's so many people here today who are living the dream of tackling the mountain. And as you say, it's not just the professional drivers, it's the rookies in the field as well, but there's also crews here. They've never been to this sort of event before. They're getting their first taste of something that's very special, and that's racing at Bathurst. Make sure you've got plenty of Easter eggs ready to go. Sit back and enjoy the day, that's for sure. It is going to be a very big day. And running it all from the commentary box, the voice of the six hour, Richard Crow with Brian Vanderwacker. Good morning, boys. We've got a big day ahead of us at Mount Panorama. Noons, Bugs. Happy Easter. And to everyone joining us from home, this is a special event. Everyone in the paddock, Brian Vanderwacker, has been calling it the Happy Bathurst. Everyone wants to be here. Everyone's looking forward to it. There's anticipation. There's real joy in this paddock. But when it all comes down to it, it's a serious Bathurst endurance race, and when it gets to about five hours and 45 minutes in, <laughs> this will be as big a battle as any enduro held at this racetrack. A very good morning to you, Richard Crow. Good morning, everyone. I love this event for all those reasons that you just mentioned. We took a bit of a tour up and down the back of the paddock a moment ago, and there's that nervous anticipation, isn't there? And it started yesterday in qualifying, and it was your traditional Bathurst thriller to set the battle for pole position. And in the end, it was two-time Bathurst 1000 winner, Will Davison, who did the job for the second straight year. And it'll be the fifth time that the 23 car that he shares with Berwick Linton and Tim Lay will start from pole position in this race. A record lap for this event. Two minutes, 22.2 seconds. A nice number and a very nice lap for Will Davison in the BMW, yet to be beaten that brand for pole position, or indeed the race win here at Mount Panorama at Easter. It was a superb lap time. So Will Davison on pole, alongside him, one of the surprises was young Tyler Everingham, a really impressive performance to fire his car onto the front row. Speaking of pole, the 23 car is there and alongside them is Aaron Noonan. Well, Rich, I thought I'd grab the pole man, Will Davison, but I've been uh, bombed for this interview by his co-drivers, Tim Lay and Berwick Linton. Let's chat to Will. Two years in a row, you've got the pole for this six hour in this BMW. This is about having fun, but does the fun stop in about 10 minutes' time? It definitely does. Yeah, we kid ourselves saying we're just here fun for fun, but we're not. No, nah, we're here to get a result. So, But it's, I love it. It's, it's a good vibe, um, this type of event. You know, so many different cars out there, different levels of drivers. Um, but we mean business, but it's it's very unpredictable six hours ahead, as I've found out in the last two years. It's been a wild eye-opener. So we're in a good spot again, but so many unknowns. And that's that's cool. It's exciting. Quick one. Tim Lay, is it a case of win on Sunday, sell on Monday tomorrow? <laughs> 
Let's hope so, mate. Then I'll win both days. You can win on Monday, win on Sunday. But we've got to get this done so we can get home so the Easter eggs don't melt. Fair play, fair play. The important issue has been covered at Bathurst today. All right, I'm here with Tyler Everingham. Look, yesterday, a very impressive lap. We're on the front row, best place to be starting for this race. Look, the car next to you, we know it's fast. Can you run with it or can you jump away from it? Yeah, look, the, um, we've definitely got some pace on board. You know, I didn't really get many laps in practice, so it was sort of just put on the line for qualifying. Um, been fighting a few little gearbox issues, so um, I think it's just about managing it and just uh, see, see where we end up. And it's a long race. How do you think the tyres are going to hold up in this heat? Um, yeah, well, the track temp's a lot higher this year. Um, you know, we're, we're earlier on, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's all unknown, so we'll just uh, see where we end up. Absolutely. Best of luck. Hope you can do a good job. Yeah, thank you. I'm super. Thomas Randall was just having a bit of a chat here while he was having a swig of water and having a laugh and a joke. He's going to start the car that starts from third on the grid. He's about to kid up and get on in. Uh, you ready for this? This is your second year in a row and you've, you, you can't get away from these supercar guys. You're all hanging out together. We are. It's, it's going to be fun down to turn one. Obviously rolling starts, so see if Tyler can hang tough around the outside and um, it's going to be on for this first lap. But, you know, it is six hours. So we've got to look after it and um, try and be there at the end. Any concern today? It's a bit warm today, warmer than last year's race. You've got to turn off your engines this year in the pit stops. Any worry there? Uh, not yet. I think we'll, <laughs> hopefully we should be good. I mean, GWR and the, the boys there have prepped the car really well. So it's, it's been all good thus far, but we are going to be stopped for 60 seconds. So, yeah, fingers crossed it'll refire up. Um, but, yeah, it's all those little things, right? You know, making sure you nail the procedures and keep it clean. Try and stay on that lead lap, and then the pit stops. There's a lot of things that you can get wrong, but um, you know, I think we'll be okay. Have a good one today. Thanks, Nunes. Appreciate it. Just, get your belts all done up. just here with uh, Cameron Crick. Look, quick one. This brand new car. It's beautiful. Starting P5, good start. How do you think the tyres are going to hold on? How do you think the race is going to play out? Yeah, it's a tricky one. We haven't really done long enough runs yet to know, so I think everyone's in the same boat, but obviously, it looks like it's going to be a sunny day, so all that to play out but um yeah but car's really good so far so good the, the hills um have done a really good job with with this new car and, and dean's starting to drive really well so fingers crossed for a good day absolutely look the car looks beautiful so best of luck hopefully we see you up there at the end thanks mate cheers Ben Barguana down there with Cameron Crick uh, topped the practice times early in the weekend. Couldn't quite get there in qualifying on a new tyre, but one of the key contenders, uh, he'll share that BMW. It's car number 118 with Bathursty and Dean Campbell. He's one of a host of local drivers, Brian, on the grid this weekend. We love having that local relevance as well. Plenty of them here, isn't there? And that's the great thing about the high-tech oils, Bathurst 6 hour. The thing that will stand out for me today is how teams will play the strategy. We'll touch on that, of course, throughout the course of the day a lot of pro drivers ready to start the race as well noons you're still down there on the grid mate well, i am george gambino from high tech Alls. this is year number eight of this race what do you love about the six hour oh it's fantastic it's just all production cars and what we used to race in the old days and stuff like that i just asked the guys how many years have we been doing this now and it's, you told me it's eight obviously so we're looking forward to the next few years so bring it on it's going to be a fantastic race thanks for your support thoroughly appreciate it. enjoy the day that's okay that's what we do thanks very much aaron Great Aussie sponsor for a great Aussie race, and they have been on board since day one, High Tech Oils. This race started in 2016, and High Tech have extended their deal through for another couple of years yet. So great to have George and his team on board, and they've been very busy in the paddock looking after the teams and selling some merchandise as well. Beautiful conditions and a great crowd on hand for the Easter long weekend here at Mount Panorama as well. We're not far away from getting this race started. We're going to go down to the grid and pause for the Australian National Anthem to be performed by Eliza Gunther.
beautifully performed. Eliza Gunther, congratulations. Hails from Queensland and recently completed her degree at the Queensland Academy of Excellence in Music and that was an excellent rendition of the Australian National Anthem. We're not far away from the start of the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour. Stick around, race start, coming your way after this from Mount Panorama in Bathurst. Class competition has been a staple of racing at Mount Panorama for as long as they've been battling on this iconic circuit. The High Tech Oils Bathurst 6 Hour tips its hat to the Bathurst Enduros of old, with a category for everything, from big banger BMWs to the smallest of hot hatches. At the pointy end of the field is Class X, dubbed Ultimate Performance. These are the fastest cars on the grid and the top of the production car performance tree. Dominated by BMW's famous M cars, expect to see the pole position and outright winner to come from this class. In fact, the M2, M3 and M4 have all tasted success in recent years and it's hard to see that trend changing in 2024. Class A is split into two categories. A1 is for extreme performance forced induction, which means super quick cars with engines turbocharged or supercharged. A2 is for similar specification cars without the addition of forced induction. This is a huge battle, and this year has a new storyline with the addition of a Chevy Camaro to join the Ford Mustang dominated class for the first time. The win was decided in the final corner last year, so keep a close eye on this fight between the big Bathurst V8s again in 2024. Like Class A, Class B, high performance, is split into two categories for those with forced induction and those without. A slightly lower performance level than their big brothers further up the alphabet, here you'll find the BMW 335i's that have been so effective in production car racing for more than 15 years, winning both Bathurst's 12 and 6 hour races. Class C, hot hatches. Turbo cars, mostly front wheel drive, with the performance potential to upset some of the much heavier hitters further up the grid. Expect the Renault Megans, HSV Astras and Volkswagen Scirocco's to be the form cars here. Class D might be referred to as the Toyota 86 Cup, the small sports coupe has dominated proceedings in recent Bathurst six hour memory. In fact, they've never lost the class, but there's plenty of competition here. Finally, Class E, the smallest cars in the race. Class E might be at the back, but the little cars that could always put on a great race among themselves, while entertaining fans as they're driven at 110% every lap for the entire race. Beautifully explained by Richard Crail, and the mountain is looking glorious on this Easter Sunday. Cars have left the grid. We are already two and a half minutes into the race before they come through and greet the chequered flag for this rolling start. Plenty to look forward to today. Plenty of storylines between now and about 5.45 local time this afternoon. Thoroughly looking forward to it, and there's that nervous anticipation as drivers get the tyres up, up to temperature as well, Richard Crail. This is going to be a long day, but it's all about to start right now. That was a shot on board with George Medici, who joins the defending winners of this race, Simon Hodges and Jaden Ojeda. They were our victors last year in a thrilling race. They had to work hard for it. In fact, at some point, Jaden Ojeda had two wheels on Conrad Strait, passing for position. Stunning conditions here on the mountain, just touching 23 degrees ambient at the moment, heading for a top of 29. That makes this one of the hottest Bathurst six hours on record. And there is real stress up and down the pit lane about how that plays through. A quick run through the grid for you. Will Davison starts from pole alongside Tyler Everingham. Tom Randall will start from the 92 car from third and George Medici alongside him. Cameron Crick out of five. Missing is Jordan Cox. He'll go from pit lane. The Sharons are former winners. You can tell the class delineators by the colour. We'll be referring to them over the weekend. Great job by the all-girl team. Puccini racing in the BMW. Courtney Prince on pole positioning class B. Caught up with them on Friday and there is some great excitement around that team. They've come down from Queensland. They're in the minibus on the weekend as well. So a great family team and looking forward to seeing how they're going to play out today. You could almost run this list for the entire six hours as that many <laughs> cars up and down the grid but as we mentioned there is so much to look forward to here throughout the course of this Easter Sunday and of course plenty of the Class E and Class D drivers are going to have their heads basically looking out the front window just as much as the rear vision mirror as well Richard. 
So, we're away. Six hours, side-by-side -side rolling start. Race record is 131 laps, or 813 k's. The race averages eight safety cars. There's 58 cars in seven classes on the grid. It's Bathurst's biggest enduro. For the eighth time on Easter Sunday, we're racing for the high-tech oils Bathurst six-hour. Nothing in it in the start. Davison, blue car, Everingham, white, Randall, yellow in the middle. There was a bit of a plan from Garth Lawton Racing as well to try and do a bit of Ricky Bobby up the start and finish straight. If they could, they were very keen to beat the pole sitting car into turn two. Here's Medici. And he's got a challenge on the outside from Cameron Crick in the black BMW as they battle for third, fourth and fifth place. But to Griffin's Bend for the first time, it's Will Davison who leads the six out for the first time. Great start, wasn't it? Look at Cam Crick though. He was really aggressive on the outside then going through Griffin's Bend as the entire field now looks like so far so good on this opening lap. Still side by side. Cam Crick then had the inside line heading into the cutting for the first time and looks like he's taken away that spot. The reigning champions already starting to fall back through the field early. Chris Lillis in the Chevy Camaro has jumped Jason Gomesal, who started the pole-sitting Mustang in the A-class battle, the big V8s. There's the Camaro, there's the Mustang car number 30 in front of the Sharon BMW. So the first time we've seen a Chevy Camaro in this race, great start so far. Geez, they're pushing pretty hard early, aren't they, guys? I mean, this is uh, very exciting. There's cars, I don't know where to look here at the moment. <laughs> there's cars happening, there's moves happening. Cameron Crick there, he had a great start, but he, he uh, chose to get out of that battle with Tommy Randall. It is lap one of a six hour race. So this is a very nervous time for drivers. You're trying to make a good move, clean move. You want to try and gain some track position. But, of course, you don't want to risk it all on this first lap. I kind of don't mind this from George, though. And he's just sitting a car length back from what we're seeing in the front. This is probably, I would say, Richard, the most intense start that we've seen to the six-hour right now because they are nose to tail from first back to fifth. Yeah, pretty racy. And a lot of the top teams have started their pro driver. By the rules, you're only allowed one called professional driver in the field. So we're talking a Will Davison. We're talking a Thomas Randall or a Cameron Crick who's just sticking the nose out in this battle for third and fourth place between the two very... Very similar BMW M2 competitions. So it's M3s at front, M2s next. There's a BMW M4 there as well. This is a brand that's never lost this race. In fact, the last three years, they've locked out the podium. So the battle is to beat the Bimmers. It could be a Camaro or Mustang today. One lap down. Somewhere in the vicinity of 800 kilometres will be the target of racing over the next six hours. It's Davison, Everingham, Randall, Crick and Medici. Great names. Chris Lewis in the Camaro leads A2. Down one class led by Chapel. He's down in 16th position. Patrick Navin, who started the Volkswagen Scirocco from polling Class C, continues to lead the way. Change of position, side by side on the run up the hill. Good exit, Thomas Randall on his teammate. Tyler Everingham won't make that too hard, but Cameron Crick wants to argue that as well on the run to Griffin Barks. This is feisty early. Here we go, boys. It's on. Uh -huh. So Tommy Randall's got a very good run off uh, the exit of turn one. Managed to get up the outside of Tyler. Tyler certainly didn't fight that very hard. And you can see Cameron there. He's just waiting, isn't he? He just wants to be part of this and get on with it. They can see Will Davis just starting to pull a little gap. And, uh, and obviously on those ties, they, they just got to start uh, that little gap there that they can uh, try and now hunt down early in this race. For Tyler, it was almost a case of, look, if you want to fight this early in the race, I'll let you boys go for it because we're here for near enough to six hours here this afternoon. Let's just play this early. And that's why I quite like this George Medici machine, the reigning champion, just sitting back there at the moment because we reckon in the early stages of this race, Richard, tyres, typically you could do this entire race on one set of tyres, but up and down the field, particularly with the temperatures that we're seeing today, two tyres at certain parts of this race might be the way to go. We should bring you up to speed on the pit stop regulations as well, because they are somewhat complex and they'll take some explaining. We've got Aaron Noonan and Ben Bargwana patrolling the lane for us this uh, today as well. Uh, they got the uh, short straw in that they have to wear race suits all day and we're up here in the AC on a pretty warm Easter Sunday. Central West there, New yeah. South Wales. No, it's very nice. 23, uh, right? yeah, yeah, casually 23. Yeah. Nice uh, player comfort level for us <laughs> so far today. Um, the outright cars, the Class X cars, red numbers on your timing totem there left of screen. Six pit stops, mandatory in this race. Behind them, everyone else, three or four. So the Mustangs and Camaros have to do four stops. And then when you get to the baby car classes, they only have to do three compulsory stops. 
Some of them could do the race on one stop if they wanted, but you're not allowed to do that. And we're going to go safety car for the first time today. I'm not sure exactly what's happened there, but uh, just before that safety car, I see Shane Smolin managed to get past uh, Lillis in the Camaro. So the Camaro was certainly running with these BMWs in that first sort of lap or two. Uh, Shane Smolin's now moved up. That car was a little bit out of place where we thought it would be. We expected it to be right at the front in terms of uh, qualifying battle. But uh, due to the red flag in qualifying, David Russell was down in ninth place. So Shane now is back onto the, uh, the front bunch right here as we are under safety car. Not exactly sure what the issue is at the moment. I talked to David Russell this morning, Bugs, about his qualifying performance. And you would have been here before. When you go and talk to someone after a quality lap at Bathurst and their eyes are like dinner plates and they're like, they've, they've clearly just had a life experience that they're going to remember for a while. They had braking issues in that car and he said, I just could not get the thing to stop at the chase. I couldn't get it to stop at Murray's. Oh, well. It was all over the place and the Sharons couldn't get their car to stop at the top of the hill because it's buried in the gravel trap at Brock Skyline just after McPhillamy Park, right-hand side of the road and it is well bogged. That is a deep gravel trap. And these are the former winners of this race. They won in 2018. They finished second in 2019. One of the most successful teams in Bathurst six-hour history. And they have found the gravel early. Yeah. yeah. There's absolutely uh, no doubt that there was uh, those guys were going to be one of the contenders towards the end of the day. And who knows exactly what's happened. But we've got one of the uh, Mustangs limping into pit lane here at the moment. Doesn't look very well. It's the 121 Century uh, real estate car. The... Um, Ryan Cash is in that car this weekend, so it may have been involved in something with the Sharons. I'm not too sure what's happened at the top of the hill, but clearly here's the race start. It was a very clean, gentlemanly start. They've all agreed to get through turn one nice, but it didn't last very long, did it? You can see Will Davis in there on the pole. He's got a good, clean jump. Tommy Randall was in there as well. Cameron uh, Crick got involved in the, uh, the, the whole action on that first lap, so a nice, clean start. And, uh, and away we go for the six hours. Just putting one and one together on that, Bargs. Ryland Gray started 12th in that Mustang. Ian Sharon started 11th. So uh, we won't throw any stones until we know we're not in the glass house, but uh, it would seem logical that they were close together on the racetrack and bring up to speed with that as we can. This was busy stuff. That's Crick looking down the inside of Everingham. Cameron Crick and Dean Campbell have a very, very fast race car today. They're quietly confident about uh -huh. it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Well, we sort of, uh, we might have predicted that one. Um, certainly this is what we talked about that first couple of laps at, at an endurance race here at Bathurst. You want to be aggressive. You want to try and make moves, but they've got to be clean and tidy moves because it doesn't really matter where you're, you know, your 11th, 12th, 13th or 14th in these first couple of laps, but being a lap down in the sandpit or with a damaged uh, right front wheel, that's not a good place to be today. How hard is that at that particular point of the road. It's fast, it's basically blind, it's undulating. You've got a lot going on up there, don't you? You certainly do, but in this early part of the race, you're also aware of the cars around you. So, um, you know, to be able to give each other enough room, to be able to get through that, I would like to see the lead up to that and see how it, 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 it unfolded, really. But um, certainly if they, uh, the grey car felt like it had more pace, it was trying to find a way through. Let's jump down into the lane and learn a little bit more, perhaps, about that with Ben Barguana. I'd just like to thank the boys in the com box with uh, their nice air con while we have the suits on down here. But uh, look, I'm here with Anthony Saul, team manager at 96 BMW. Had to start from pit lane, devastating. Talk us through it. Yeah, look, it's a bit of a shame. I mean, we had only two weeks to get the car up and running. Um, the boys sort of late notice with this. Um, so we had a little bit of a fuel leak, unfortunately. Um, yes. Couldn't get it done in time and just couldn't quite get out in time. So a bit annoying, but not much we can do. But otherwise, car's going good and, and uh, Geordie's already uh, made up quite a few spots. Yeah, look, that's really frustrating, but we've seen a BMW win from last before, so how's the race pace going to be? How do you feel it's going to be later in the race, and, and how do you feel? Yeah, look, I think the key thing about this race is obviously, you know, you've got to take your time, and it's going to be six hours, and it's going to be hot. And a lot of these cars, production cars, they're not going to like the heat. Um, I think that's our advantage. There'll be quite a few safety cars, there'll be guys fading, getting a bit, you know, loose because their minds are going because of the heat. Um, so that might, you know, play into us, so hopefully. See so how we go. Best of luck. Thanks, guys. Ben Barguana with Anthony Sewell, the car owner of the 96 BMW, Jordan Cox, 36th from 57th, basically In, in a lap. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll continue Cox Watch, which we've done before in this place, I feel, and in this race, in fact. 
So sorry, we're back to Brain. So hang on, that's 35th, that's 34th. <laughs> I'm just watching him in front of us pass through oh, no. four Toyotas. So he's uh, he's on a mission, that's absolutely for sure. I just noticed there that where Sharon's have popped back into that, they're about the 10th or 11th car in the queue. So there's a chance for them to get their lap back as the pit stops unfold. So if they're, they're smart, they may be able to play their way back into this race, even though they were buried in the sandpit very early on. The Ryland Grey Mustang was in the lane as well with some attention to the right front, which was where the contact was. The BMW, very wide. Shane Smolin at the cutting, understeering out towards the fence on the exit there. And a big slide too from George Medici as they get back up to operating temperature and pressure. So the first restart in the race. The other point we didn't quite get to finishing with pit stops, Brian, is that the window for the compulsory stops doesn't open until the half an hour mark of the race. So right now, you couldn't take advantage of that safety car to get one of your stops ticked off. And the regulations state that you can only do one compulsory pit stop per safety car throughout this race. You can't keep bringing them back in to knock off those compulsory pit stops. The interesting fact about this race though, once you complete your compulsory pit stops, you do not have to do a minute 30 stop for the rest of the race. You can do a splash and dash. That might be key for the final stint here this afternoon. So Randall continuing to put the pressure on Will Davison out in front. Everingham, Crick and Medici next. Shane Smollin is in the mix. This is car number one. It's George Medici following that battle. And there has been a change of position because Cameron Crick's gone through on Tyler Everingham. Tyler mentioned us to, uh, to us at the start, I should say, that they were struggling with some gearbox issues early. That car's been pretty slow on a straight line right now. So I wonder maybe if that's starting to rear its ugly head again as Tyler had it all crossed up there on the exit of the chase as well as George Medici is right on his rear bar now as they head down to Murray's corner. So one thing that you mentioned there, we are talking about pit stops and strategies and how these pit stops unfold. For a minute and a half, the car has to be stationary during a CPS, 90 seconds. But one thing that's different this year with the rules, they have to switch the car off. Now, for fans of endurance racing, you've probably seen that at places like Le Mans or the, the Bathurst 12 Hour here, that the cars get switched off. It's the first time we've done it here at the six hour, but that's gonna be a real problem there's a lot of people predicting that some of these big BMWs, turbos, heat soaking, they may not refire too easy. And if it doesn't refire, you've got to push the car back into the, the garage. You can start it in there and away you go. So that may play out uh, into the hands of these bigger V8s as the day goes on. And already you can see an engine hot warning light at the moment on your rating champion. So we mentioned that this is probably the earliest, well, certainly the warmest race that we've had since 2022. You go back to that particular race, there was four BMWs that had issues in the first half an hour of the race. And setting a pretty hot pace already, Will Davison last time round, 2.20.0. That's the Sharon BMW looking pretty dusty and dirty. So they have dropped a lap as a result of that incident at the top of the hill. Noons? Rich, I didn't want to come down to this garage this early in the race, but Grand Sharon, 58th, one lap down. This was not in the pre-race plan. No, definitely not in the race plan, you know. It looked like a bit of an immature move up on the inside of Eno, going over the skyline and punting into the um, sand trap. So lap one, you don't want that, but let's see what we can do. It's five hours, 40 minutes to go, so see what we can do from here. It's dusty and dirty, but is there any damage to the BMW? From at the moment, um, what Ian reports, there isn't. He doesn't feel like there's any damage, so he's just going, we just continued on, and fingers crossed it keeps going all right. But at the moment, it's all looking good. Good luck. Thank you. Interesting to note, too, just on our timing screen, that incident is under investigation as well, so we'll keep you updated on what the decision might be on that one. And uh, while we're sitting here, for those interested, Jordan Cox is now 19th on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He will be top 10 before the first round of stops. And this is the incident. If you've just joined our broadcast, young Ryland Gray, down the inside of the Sharon Rentals BMW. They'll, they'll both have an argument to make of that one, whether the 121 car was far enough down the inside. The, the probably other side of that is very rarely do you make a successful overtake at Philomy Park. Uh, you, if you're going to get that job done, you've got to be very committed and it's got to be done well and clean. But uh, it looks like a bit of contact there, that right front on the Mustang touching the left rear on the, uh, on the BMW. So that's obviously... Uh, put both cars in an awkward position for the start of the day. It's interesting watching Will Davison there. He's managing the pace well. Tommy Randall went with him very quickly and even looked like he was uh, putting him under threat on that, that start, restart lap. But they're now just settling into a nice rhythm. Cameron Crick's going with them. They're just leaving Tyler Erringham a little bit behind. So um, I'm 
We've got a bit of a drama there. Now we've got some smoke coming off a couple of cars, but that's what you expect here at uh, the day. As the day goes on, you'll see cars all over the place having good days and bad days. Or the Lexus, perhaps, that was trailing some smoke, or had just been off the road down at uh, Murray's Corner. Big Lexus Coupe. That thing is a wild car. They've actually made some really big strides with it this year. It's a reasonably competitive package in its class. The great Stevie Owen is co-driving, as he has done so for the last couple of years. It was a car that ended up parked in the wall a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but it's been resurrected. These are some of the Class A cars. The Quinn Game Over Ford Mustang which Ryder and Tony are driving with Grant Denyer, like celebrity that he is. And they're currently in 11th. Chapel just behind in the Mercedes. Then Tony Levitt in the big bright green Mercedes AMG GT3. They had an issue in that car this morning. It was battling with the ECU. They put a replacement ECU, electronic control unit, in that car overnight, and it was no good. So they've swapped back to the other one. He said, Luke King, the co-driver, said they were 30 k's an hour down Conrod Strait. What? That car's doing 280, so it's a significant lack of straight line speed as we go back and find the battle for the baby class, Class E. And these are the stories we'll follow throughout the course of the day. Races upon races upon races. And this is pretty serious stuff. So on these two. Sorry, is this the last 10 minutes of the race? Yeah. I'm not sure where we're at here. Car 20 there going up the inside. Looks like it may be taking the class lead. Uh, misqualifying. That car was in the fence up at Forest Elbow at the end of uh, in, uh, during practice three. So it misqualifying. They sent it to the local panel beaters, got that car back, and it ran fine in the, in the uh, warm up this morning. And it's uh, now out there. Looks like it's just about leading the class. At the moment. You've got turfed into it. Oh, and the big Lexus, we're just talking about it, has been turned at the exit of Forest Elbow. Oh. The worst part about that is you cannot see what's coming in terms of traffic. Do you wait for every car to go or you try and get the car turned around? That's not a very good position to be in. As Tommy Randall, we talked about that earlier, he looked very strong on that restart. So he's certainly probably got the pace at the moment to put pressure on Will. That car of Will Davison is very quick in a straight line. So it's going to have to be an aggressive move by Tommy to get the job done. But certainly the two M2s are sitting there. They're just stalking. Will Davison, he's got the mirror turned, he doesn't care. <laughs> he's just getting the job done at the moment. Typically, Tommy's car has been very quick across the top of the mountain. That's where he was exceptional yesterday in qualifying as well. Just look at the right rear bumper, in fact, on the Will Davison machine. It's just sticking out a little bit. So whether or not a bolt has come loose, or he might have even popped a little bit of a whack in the rear as well. But if that comes any further loose, it might even get attention of the people upstairs in race control. It's noticeable how these cars are moving around yeah. early in the race. Cameron Crick, especially out of the cutting on that lap rear end, sliding around on the DA Campbell transport car. Will Davison, 224.01 on lap four, quickest lap of the race so far, and also a new Bath, a six hour lap record, seven tenths under the existing benchmark. So the pace is hot early. Randall kicking up the dust on the exit of McPhillamy Park. Ben. I'm here with Ryan Kasher, teammate of Roland Gray there. We just saw that incident, uh, the, the Mustang and the BMW. Talk us through it. Yeah, look, um, to be honest, I, I can't really say. I wasn't in the driver's seat, so it's hard to judge from the outside. But, um, yeah, look, Roland's out there giving it his all. Um, the car's fast. We didn't necessarily qualify where we think we should have. Um, but, yeah, for us, it's really just about plugging away now and making sure that we make the most of where we are. So was there any damage to the car? Is the car OK now? Has he reported back to the team? Uh, yeah, he hasn't said a whole lot. Um, realistically, it was just the puncture, and um, at the moment, it seems fine. Long race ahead. Best of luck to you guys. Thanks, mate. The interesting thing to note from that one, no further action from the race stewards, so it's play on at the moment, as we are still in the early stages of this year's uh, Bath Six Hour. Interesting call, Jase. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> as I said, I wouldn't mind seeing the... Uh, the entirety of it, but anyway, we saw the end result of it. So, uh, race control do a good job. They've got access to footage from all different angles, so they have a chance to have a good view of what was going on there. Um, and this is probably that uh, Lexus situation that we saw earlier. A bit of contact, yes, there was, and it got spun around. So the uh, little golf has got into the back of the Lexus, turned him around, and he's uh, parked it safely. No damage done, but a lot of spots lost. So. Um, and for anyone that cares, Jordan Cox is 12. <laughs> There's a lot of people that care, I think, working his way towards the top 10. It was Jem Usel in the Harding Performance Golf that just tipped the Lexus into that spin. So uh, if there was no action for 1, 2, 1 and 27, I'd suggest there may be for that. 
fairly optimistic lunge down the inside. Just had it pointed out, they kind of did uh, penalise themselves anyway because they had to go to the back of the train through the pit stop. So True. I guess things work out. So obviously Will, Will's just setting a really comfortable pace here. He's got that clear air in front of him. He's the fastest car on the road at the moment with the fastest lap at a 24-0. So what we saw in qualifying, 22.2 uh, 22 yep. 22 in qualifying, we saw a 21.7 during practice three. That was the Cameron uh, grid car on Saturday morning. The, the temperatures were up a little bit during qualifying, so the track was a little bit greasy. The UV was up, and uh, we thought the times were impressive. 24s now, that's really fast, considering we're in this early part of the race. But Will's just got that clear air, looking after the car, looking after the tyres, and finding a nice rhythm. That warning's definitely gone away, hasn't it? We. Uh, we saw that earlier with George Medecki had that, that temperature warning, so he's now, oh, oh that was a handful. <laughs> Wait, he's got himself in clear air, so he's dropped off the back of Cameron Crick. I wonder if that's just helped the cause a little bit. He was running very close up behind that leading group. The Brown Davis Ford Focus has just rolled into lane, uh, the lane beneath our commentary position as well. They've been battling, it's right behind the wheel. Uh, that car with David Brown of Brown Davis fame and John Bow of Bathurst legendary fame. They've been battling that thing all weekend before focus. It's been a massive challenge. And on lap seven with a safety car, lap traffic. All of a sudden, the leaders are getting to the back of the 58 cars that circulate Mount Panorama. And they now have to play the game that they will play for a vast majority of the race, which is picking their way through slower cars. Meanwhile, at the top, this is four position. Car number seven is the game over Ford Mustang. Quinn and Locarno in the Mitsubishi Lancer Evo. And that was a fight for 15th and 16th position. Jeff Eusel just up the road in that Volkswagen Golf that we saw in the thick of the action before. And I think it's Chris Holt just in behind them, that bright green BMW, which was the class pole sitter in A1. So this is a feisty little battle pack. The lap traffic plays such a role in this race. We saw the lap traffic play a role in the Bathurst 12 hour at the start of the year. And it's one of those things in this race that can make or break your day. And sometimes a little bit of patience getting past a slower car, it might delay you early, but it might pay off later. Because if you go for a half a percent lunge on a slow car at McPhillamy Park and end up in the gravel track, you're probably not gonna win the Bathurst yeah. six hour. But if you wait and lose two seconds, it might come back to you later in the day. We've definitely seen what happens when you're aggressive and you try and make the move. Um, and it uh, obviously ends in tears, un unfortunately, for a lot of cars. So this is a really important part of the day. As a driver, you've got to make the executive decisions. You've got to make the tough decisions. Do I pass? Where do I do it? Try and set yourself up. Even in the battles, you can put cars between you and the car that's chasing you or the car that you're trying to uh, attack. You can use the traffic to your advantage. But it is an important part of the day, and it's going to certainly play out uh, as the day goes on. We saw that focus in pit lane, unfortunately. They put a lot of effort into that. An engine change on Friday night. They finished at 2 a.m. They went back out the next day and had some vacuum dramas, some braking issues, some electronical issues, but they were confident they had the car running okay. But unfortunately, it's made 26 minutes in the race and it's in pit lane. I was watching Paul Razum here in the 29 HSV just having to sidestep a couple of cars, then going down into Murray's corner. He was one of the drivers that had to start from pit lane in this race. They're trying to somewhat recover some of that ground they lost early on and try and pass all those class E and D cars early on. And back to our battle for the lead here. Still having to manage that traffic through some of those class E cars right now. The margin, incidentally, has not changed really from first back to second, as you can see. As you can see, still half a second. But Randall's pace, albeit two minutes ago, was almost half a second quicker. So I reckon he's just biding his time there at the moment and waiting to see what can come off this beautiful machine. So plenty going on, not too far away as well from the compulsory pit stop window opening for the first time here today. Continues to lead the race. The margin, 1.1 seconds over Thomas Randall. The bright yellow, pink breast cancer trials, yellow pages, number 92 BMW. Cameron Crick is third the son of late super truck great Rodney. George Medici, fourth on the famous Bathurst surname. Tyler Everingham is fifth in the number 24 BMW. Shane Small on sixth. So they've gone on a slightly different route in the number 81 Hastings Deering's BMW. 
starting the AM driver with Tom McLennan and David Russell, very fast drivers to jump into that car. Chris Lillis, first in class A2 in the Camaro, he's seventh. Jason Gomesell, second in class, first Ford Mustang, he's eighth. Lindsay Kearns and Brock Giblin in the HSV GTS rounding out the top 10. A little bit going on in and around us. We've had a spin for the Queen car out the exit of the final corner. We're in the midst of lap traffic and the compulsory pit stop window has opened and pretty much a standard day in the office at the High Tech Oils back at six hour. Yeah, we're not sure which way to look here at the moment. There's cars spinning in front of our commentary box. We've got cars going slow. There's cars going to pit lane. There's vehicles smoking everywhere. We just watched Jordan Cox drive down the front straight here at what was about 35 kilometres an hour. So um, it's definitely all happening. The, the, uh, Tony Quinn in the Mustang, he had a spin right in front of us here in the commentary box on the last corner turned it around and got going again. I believe we've got a bit of a replay of that. So um, he did a good donut flick turn, though, I've got to tell you, <laughs> right in front of us. I'm not sure what was going on there, but, yeah, he's uh, he certainly got that back. No no harm, no foul, just lost a few places. So while we were all talking about that, the Sharons were the first one I noticed to, to pit. They come into pit lane. So they're the first of the big X-Class cars to get their first compulsory spot stop out of the way. Well, that does surprise me a little. They were a lap down. I would have thought they were going to actually... Uh, you know, hold on as long as they could and try and get that lap back. But anyway, they've made their call. Noons. Richard, I've just stopped by Garth Walden Racing, who are pretty busy this weekend. They're running four cars. They've got their drivers kitted and ready for whenever they take this stop. And there's a shot of a young lady with a knee tapping here with helmet on, suit on. This is Brianna Wilson. will take over the 24 car of Tyler Everingham. And just up the back, also helmeted, just out of camera shot, is Michael Cavage will step into that Thomas Randall car. So, uh, Gut Wilder Racing with two cars running right up the front here. These guys have been suited and booted, ready to go for the last 15 minutes, just in case as we get into that window of where they want to make that driver change. No, Bree Wilson's been doing a really good job. Uh, fun fact, and this will make you feel particularly old, me too, uh, Brianna Wilson and Tyler Everingham born two days apart in the year 2001. <laughs> so, well, that actually and, makes me feel old. Yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I know both those kids because they used to race betting carts. Yes. So we all saw all those kids around the cart track, and it's great to see them here at Bathurst as we've got another couple of the uh, the leading cars stopping at the moment. There's cars coming to pit lane everywhere. So, um, yeah, it's, it's great to see Browner in, a, in an opportunity like this with, with Tyler. She'll learn a lot. A well-run team. They've had success here in the past. And, of course, uh, as the day plays out, between uh, obviously Tyler driving that car, Brianna and Michael all, they'll obviously uh, be very competitive. We expect to see them towards oh. the end of the day as the battle there. Yeah, there's a bit of a, for the a confident look there. Did he have a go? No, he didn't. I've got out of it. It's not worth it at the moment. So, Tommy Randall keeping that pressure. I would say that's the faster car at the moment. Has another look down the inside. Can he get the job done cleanly? It's a little bit early to be taking those risks. So, certainly at the moment, the, uh, the Yellow Pages car is, the, is probably the faster of the, of the two. Cavage boys, it's a great story. They've been raising money for breast cancer trials in this race for years now and almost $200,000 raised. In fact, Tyler Everingham in that camp in the sister cars put his lid up, the helmet that he ran in the Bathurst 1000 last year that he's using this weekend. They're going to auction that off after the race uh, at the end of the year. So great fundraising causes. I think there's about six cars raising funds for various charities in the race this year. It's a great opportunity to do that. Um, Peter Mack on John Bow's car. There's a Ronald McDonald House Foundation on the Peter O'Donnell BMW 335i. It's terrific causes up and down the grid. Everyone getting right into the spirit of racing on the Easter long weekend. This battle energised. So as Aaron said, they're just waiting for a safety car before they take that gamble to pit. But I wonder, perhaps, if you're the 92 team with Garth Walden, that you pull Thomas out of this battle. Now, there's not so much an overcut or undercut scenario that we talk about in supercars or F1 in a race with a timed pit stop. But I wonder if you do it just for safety's sake. Get them out of the fight. Get them into some clean air and just take a little bit of a pause. Well, they ran that strategy 12 months ago, so they pitted under safety car, and uh, sorry, pitted under green. A safety car came out about 10 minutes later, and they pulled the car in again. Yep. So they, bur uh, they burnt themselves a compulsory pit stop early compared to everyone else, and they gained that track position later in the race. And I don't mind that. No, I agree. They just missed a podium last year, too. It was a terrific yeah. drive. This is great, isn't it? I've thoroughly enjoyed this battle. Two guns of supercars.
fighting it out in the early stages of a six-hour event. And don't say this doesn't mean anything to them either because you heard Will Davison at the start of the day just watching the hit that ball sideways out of, out of uh, Forest Elbow. Yeah, it, it means so much to these guys to get that triple crown now that we speak about yeah. here in Bathurst now is so highly, highly regarded. The dude, Paul Morris, the only guy to win the 12, the 6 and the 1,000. Pretty remarkable achievement, a great race here with Luke Searle in a BMW in 2017. Just edged out Chaz Mostert in a really close finish. And Morris became the first to win all three of the majors. The Buccini BMW leaves the lane. BMW 6 has sounded <laughs> great. The straight six, there's something about a straight six. They're very good, aren't they? We get 202 every day of the week. Oh, no. Unfortunately, the 43 machine, the Astra, that has had issues already this weekend. They melted a piston on Friday. They had the engine back in the car 1 a.m. on Saturday morning, and this car has got 38 minutes into the race, and it's gone to a halt. Well, if this triggers a safety car, it's manner for all of our leaders because it's bang on when they would like to stop. And I'd suggest it will be very busy in the lane now as everyone prepares for this. The thing with this race, race control will give these cars every opportunity to reset themselves. Because it really is a case, Bargs, of a control alt delete sometimes, and you can get the car going again. So race control does take that into account when they're managing the race and calling safety cars. They'll give them every opportunity to get back under their own power or get going again before they throw a yellow. Now here's an indication of when um, the, the team's obviously spotted something on the screen. They've called the 90 car in. The driver's not even ready. He's still putting his gloves on as he's running out in the pit lane. So that's the pressure of the teams. They've got to make these decisions. As that uh, car come on screen has stopped, you can just see the action. People running from pit walls. It's all starting to happen in pit lane because they know this is the first opportunity that could present itself to start with the strategy for the day. out in front. They're still green. So what you can see here in this pit stop is obviously as the driver change, you're allowed to have an assistant that can help with the driver, someone who isn't wearing a helmet and gloves and so forth. The refueling's happening at the time and it looks like we may have a safety car which we kind of predicted. So what will happen now is they'll bunch the field up. There's a bit of yelling down there in pit lane. They'll bunch the field up. Now we, the question will be for these guys, do they pit now or do they wait? I'd say these leaders will pit straight away. They'll take the opportunity, they'll be into pit lane, there'll be uh, a plenty of action, and hopefully Aaron and Ben down there can see whether there's driver changes or we're going to leave drivers in double stint. Look at Tommy right on the back here, Will Davison. He is going to just about be bumping him by the time they get in the 40k speed limit line here in just a moment. They've got a couple of cars in front of them. Do we see these leaders nip off into pit lane? We certainly do, and it's both the leaders. So first compulsory pit stops now starting to happen in this race, 40 minutes into it, and they've even got traffic for them as they enter in to this first compulsory pit stop. Yeah, it was a late call from the 143 Subaru, the Inwood boys, local Bathurst team that won their class last year in the Subaru, bailed across into the blend line to get themselves in. So both of our leaders in, Will Davison and Thomas Randall, expect them to jump out of these cars at this stop. Cameron Crick is in the lane too from third position. George Medici from fourth position Tyler is in the lane. Yep. yep. They're all rolling in. Take the opportunity of a free safety car pit stop. Now the timing for the stops commences at the control line where you've got to get the car to 40 k's an hour and then at 90 seconds from there to pit exit. If you go beneath that, if you go one second beneath that, it is a quite serious penalty. But that includes the stationary time. The other thing to take into account is that none of these BMWs with six pit stops are going to put a full tank of fuel in all day. It's basically just topping the tank up every time they fill. They can go 70, maybe 75 minutes if they're brave on a tank of fuel, but with six stops in a six hour endurance race, you won't need to do that. What's happening here is a lot of cars are being or unlapping themselves. While the leaders are in pit lane, a lot of those D class, C class, B class cars have continued on the track. They'll keep running around. Chris Lillis has come into pit lane as well. In terms of outright, it's possible that Will Davison may pop out here and still lead this race from an outright point of view. Jason Gomesel's in pit lane. Most of the Mustangs are now stopping. So everyone on that timing sheet from the top 10, Brock Giblin, where's he? We're going to see him pit lane as well. He's in pit lane. So basically the entire top it 10 is, yep. is in pit lane. Will Davison, I suspect, will pop out of this and still lead this race. Looks like a driver change there as well. 
possibly Beric Linton going into that 23 machine as well. And he's just covering a little bit, making sure they're underneath that 1 minute 30 by the time he leaves pit lane. A 1.39 second stop it was in the end for that 23 cap. OK, I was wondering what was happening there. The 143, they were double stacked. Yeah. There's nothing worse than a situation where you then have to sit and wait for the other guy to have a 90 second pit stop for you to be in pit lane as well. You can see now that the 92 is back out of their stop. And Cameron Crick, I'm going to say, is probably going to join them very soon. Uh, and we'll be interested to see whether Cameron's actually done a driver change on his stadium. No, I think Dean Campbell Dean Campbell's in that car. Yeah. They're, they're in a slightly different position, Bugs. They've only got two drivers, so they need to be a little bit more strategic. No driver can do more than three hours and 30 minutes of the race. So you've only got 30 minutes of leeway time between each driver. So it makes it slightly... Uh, challenging for drivers with two cars. That's why the defending champions have added George Meadick here. It gives them much more strategic flexibility from a driver's point of view. There's also one element to that, Richard, and that's that you've actually got to be out of the car yep. for a full hour. Correct. So even though you've got this problem, we've had this discussion running cars ourselves with Ben and Jude, you've got this problem that you have with two drivers, you've got to bring this element of uh, a one hour out of the car into the equation. There's going to be a mark, I think, against the 81... BMW, Shane Smolin, a 128.9 compulsory time pit stop. That will not count. That will not count. So they will have to come and bring that car in once again. Keeping in mind, though, that probably won't count then as their safety car compulsory pit stop. They might be able to bring that car back in, possibly this next lap. Ouch. Well, you've picked it up. Has the team picked it up? That's the challenge. They've got to get themselves organised and understand whether they've complied to the rule or not. Then they make the decision to come in. They can only do the one CPS, as you mentioned, during any safety car period. We can see Jordan Cox out of the car there, uh, the 96 car. So that's made it back to pit lane. Um, so, yeah, will they... Oh, you nearly put it in the fence. <laughs> this is under safety car, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> The interesting thing for mine is that a lot of the teams up and down the lane on their Motec dash do have a countdown timer. So it goes into a pit mode when they cross the control line at pit entry and it starts counting down for 90 seconds. That way the driver can sometimes manage their pit speed as they're exiting the pit garage and therefore maybe try and buy back a couple of seconds. But keep an eye on that 81 car if it comes back in the lane. Otherwise, I'm sorry, they have not completed a compulsory pit stop yet. Race control will be all over that. That will be flagged. So Beric Linton's jumped behind the wheel of the race leading number 23 BMW. It looks like George Medici stayed behind the wheel of car number one. I don't mind that call, and they've got a bit of flexibility there as well with the fact they've got Jaden Ojeda up their sleeve for later in the race. Dean Campbell shown behind the wheel of car 118. There is George. Confirmation he stayed behind the wheel there. Chris Holt shown in fourth place in the B1 number 19 car, yet to stop. So they have not peeled off into pit lane. It's the same story for Paul Blomquist in the number 93 class A1 entry, fifth outright. Shane Smolon stayed behind the wheel of car number 81 but with a question mark over their pit stop. And then Michael Cavage has jumped behind the 92 car. They actually lost quite a bit of track position. Their stop was about 15 seconds longer than the number 23 team for the Breast Cancer Trials yellow entry. So they've lost a little bit of track position through that sequence. Brianna Wilson has jumped behind the wheel as the car Tyler Everingham started. And they've shown in 10th position Chris Lillis is behind the wheel of the big HSV Camaro. And they've actually ticked a stop off as well. But remember, they've only got to make four pit stops. So they're going to play a track position game at the end of the day and hope that they're out for longer late. And that might buy them some space and pace on the racetrack. Recovery happens at the uh, run up the shelf to Reed Park. Back in the day, that would be done. Great flags flying way back when. <laughs> Glad they don't now. So obviously as the challenges, I mean, the, you know, you sit there as a team, and I know we've run teams here before, trying to work out with these pit stops, do you take it? An A1 car, for example, do you take that early one? What's it do for the rest of your day? Um, you know, how does that play out during the course of what you've got to consider? You can see now, and one of the, one of the keys to these uh, class cars is they often pit after the train is formed, right? So that's where your best opportunity to is to not go down a lap. As you wait till the trains form, then you do your pit stop, therefore you lose the, the least amount of time. And we've got Ben down in pit lane. Ben, have you got some news for us? I'm just here with team manager of car 43. Look, 
I know how much this race means to everyone and it's really, really devastating to see a car on a tilt tray, but you're going well. Look, give us an update. What do you think? Yeah, look, um, we've had a big week. Boys haven't slept. We did an engine change Thursday night. Um, prior to that, we did a suspension change Wednesday night. Uh, Thursday night, sorry, engine change Friday. Um, now we believe after we've done everything and got it right, we've actually got a clutch that's let go. Um, we were consistent. We we're building up. We've got a couple of really good drivers there. That's motor racing. Um, we can't do much about it. Um, it's very devastating for everyone in the team. Um, our sponsors, Champ Group, Petrol Head Productions, um, everyone that's on board with us, I can't name them all, we've got too many. Um, Steve and Sue McHugh, who own the team, put so much into this. And for something like this to happen, you know, it, it hurts. Um, but we'll battle on, we'll get the car back here and have a look, see if it's not something we can't fix. Um, we will certainly have a go if we can, get it out there, get the cars circulating for our sponsors um, and, and see what we can do, mate. You know, that's all we can do. Absolutely. Look, best of luck getting it back out there. I can see the pain. I understand. But, look, hopefully we get you back out there and see you back on racetrack. Thank you very much. And just a quick shout-out to um, Matilda and Zane from Cham Group, who are in Japan at the moment. Couldn't be here this weekend. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Nice work, Ben Barguana. You can see what it means, this race. It's so special to so many people. Steve McHugh, Ian Cowley and Adam Talbot in the number 43 car and walked down there after practice two and there was uh, HSV Astra with very little of the front end remaining installed. They had one engine out, another one in. It's been a huge job. There are stories like that up and down this paddock. But the joy is, if they can fix that, they 100% will. They'll put another clutch into it if they have to and they will get that thing back out on the racetrack and they might get a chequered flag at the end of the day and they will party just as hard as those that win the race outright. Ben? Yeah, just here with Jordan Cox. Look, we were watching you climb up the timesheets there. The car was rapid. Get to start from pit lane. Bit disappointing, but we saw you drop down a bit. Do you want to tell us what happened? Yeah, uh, transmission got hot, long story short. So, um, yeah, she went into limp mode and had nothing, and we tried the control out delete, and that didn't do anything, and then spent half a lap, and then it cooled down, then we went again, and then it went into limp mode again, and had all these alarms for ocean mode. Mate, it was telling me to service the car at one point. I'm going, mate, well, <laughs> typical production car racing. So um, we figured out a way to sort of, we can't drive the car at full throttle, so if we're half throttle, it, it seemed to be okay. Uh, for a few laps then. So, uh, long day, it's a hot day, uh, anything can happen. It's the Bathurst six hour, bring it on. Absolutely, well, best of luck. Yeah, thanks, Benny, cheers. Two Super Cheap Auto TCR Australia rivals, they trade paint on other weekends, and now one's got the microphone. Nice work, Benny Barguano, working him hard today. Oh, proud dad, he's doing a good job. <laughs> he is. He's very nervous, but he's enjoying his, uh, his time down pit lane. It's good that he knows a few of those guys, and uh, no, they don't short trade paint. Jordan and Ben, they're meant to very be Very clean, no, you're right, right true. True. But what we have got is after all that action, we've now got a green flag. We're about to go racing again, and it's the uh, the 23 car that's maintained that lead. This is where it all gets a bit interesting, though, because now we've got lap cars in between all those battles. Remembering, something to look out for here, when they go green, you're not allowed to overlap, you're not allowed to overtake, and I'll even get side by side with the car until you get to the control line. The control line's right under the bridge here. That's the timing line. So you can see here that Barry Glinton's got to jump but uh, George Bedecki can't do anything about it. He's got to wait behind that car before he can actually get on with it and go. So back to green, second restart for today's High Tech Oils. Bath is six hour, believe it or not, almost an hour into the race. And away we go, it's a big margin. And that, that's 2.1 seconds he gained out of that. Huge margin, contact. The 81 car just moving across it. Shane Smaller behind the wheel, working his way past the lap car, just moved back across to driver's right and there was a little nerf. And, and like Jason was saying, it gets so busy as everyone finally gets that permission to overtake when they get to the control line. Restarts at this place are perilous and they are very, very busy. And that is an indication as they're two and three abreast running up the hill to Griffins. Yeah, it's very difficult at this point of the race, particularly with all this traffic. You've got an X-Class car, you've got a C-Class, an E-Class. They're all trying to overtake each other, and there's damage. There's damage to the oh, 81. We've got a tyre come off, have we? It's let go already, so... That, that's, that's where it hit, Jason. That's where it hit. The contact. Going, yeah, going into Turn 1. Little moments can decide big enduros. And that is a little moment that could rule this car out of contention. It's early days. There's a long way to go. But, wow, 
It's going to be a very slow lap limping back to pit lane. And then another pit stop. They'll lose a lap. And it becomes a pretty tough ask from here, even with drivers. The talent of Tommy McLennan. Shane Smollins, a former winner in this race. We saw this car. We expected this car to be very competitive when it came to qualifying. They caught themselves out with the red flag, and Dave Russell had to have a crack right with the dying seconds. It's, uh, it's put itself on the back foot for the day, and it's moved across slightly. A bit of contact there. Probably not giving enough room, and that contact's obviously cut the edge of that tyre. And uh, that's why we've got the problem. Five kilometres to go on three tyres. That's a long way to limp the car back. And hopefully that tyre holds together in a way where it doesn't start tearing apart pieces in that back suspension, brake lines, things of that nature. And as we talk about that, Barry Clinton is under pressure from George Dickey down the inside of the chase. This is for the lead of the race. And he'll get it, Medici down the inside. So the defending champions of this race will lead for the first time today. First lead change of the race as well. And Medici gets in front and peels off into pit lane immediately. Did we miss something? I'm not sure what's happened there, but he's uh, come back into pit lane. It's a bit, old, bit weird just after a stop like that, unless they decided to execute a second CPS early in the race. Get it out of the way, get Georgie out of the car while the, the field's compacted, and you lose the most time. It's a bit of a weird one, but uh, obviously we'll see if that strategy plays out. Which again now goes back to a lead change. Good, we've got car 23 back in front yeah. again. So Barrett Linton spent oh, 400 metres in second position. And a former winner of this race and Australian production car champion finds himself back in the race lead. So we'll get our team on that job for you down at the Secure Finance team because they are the one of the favourites coming in. In the meantime, Aaron Noonan has found Cameron Crick, who's had a very good opening stint to this race. I have, Richard, and for a guy who's more used to racing Super Utes and Super 2, uh, this BMW is a little bit different. Is it a case in those early stages where you've got to control yourself more than the car? Yeah, it's definitely hard to do. You want to, uh, you got behind Tommy Randall and you just want to keep going, but you sort of, I had Cam Hill in my ear just saying, hang on, just peg it back a bit, long race. But it'd um, be interesting to see how the tyres last because the car probably wasn't feeling great towards the end of that stint, obviously the hot weather, but um, yeah, it's just going to be looking after the car and hopefully we can make it to the end. Speaking of tyres, is it a case of if you do change them, it'll be two only down one side of the car because of the way, I mean, it's no, it's not like supercars here, you don't have those, all those, those, um, those compressible jacks and all that sort of stuff. You've got the good old trolley jack. This is old spec stuff. Yeah, I know. It's going to be interesting. The guys have been doing a few um, practice changes, so fingers crossed they do it pretty well. But um, yeah, obviously the right side will be key. Uh, obviously the right, you know, the right rear then was starting to feel quite ordinary. So um, anyway, fingers crossed they do it with a good, good stop. But I'll be hoping to get some, a good set of tyres when I get back in. There's a bit going on at the moment. There's some rubber rolling down to go and join its brethren down at uh, the final turn. We might head back to the track here. It's all going on, but good news here for Camp Cricket, Dean Campbell. Second on the road at the moment, boys. Yeah, thanks, news. The uh, MRF off the back of Shane Smolin's car has gone to its friends. It's gone home. Very nicely departed. It lasted the whole, almost the entire lap. And just as he peeled off into pit lane, it spun itself off the rim. The tread departed. It was gone. Just looking at car one there a moment ago, heading back out onto the racetrack. It appears that was a 1 minute 32 pit stop, which is a compulsory pit stop. So they yep. might be buying themselves a little bit of green track at the moment, fresh air to possibly try and jump everyone a little bit later on the day. So keep an eye on that number one car. Yes, giving up track position at the moment, but they are going to buy that back at some point later in the day. Well, there'll be more safety car. Yes. 100% chance of more safety car today. So you get one safety car and all of a sudden you're back in the queue and you're a pit stop in front. This is this race. This is a premium example of Bathurst <laughs> six-hour parks. <laughs> Throw a tram in the middle of that. It looks like you're trying to get down through St Kilda or something. There's cars going everywhere at the moment. There's a monorail on the left-hand <laughs> side there on Conrad Strait. So I'm not joking, by the way. But, uh, yeah, this is one of the challenges. I mean, it, it certainly makes for the race, doesn't it? It, uh, it certainly it, it brings that element of, of decision-making into it in terms of strategy. We're now seeing a bit of a different strategy from an outright contending team. So maybe that's the winning one. Maybe it's not. We don't know. Or did they have a problem? We'll find that out and see if they had to uh, service the car or it was part of their intended their day. But what I love about this, you've got the two C-class cars there trying to pass each other. You've got a BMW in the middle of them trying to find a way through it as we see the 81 car rejoining after that that uh, damage and that tyre change. So, um, yeah, certainly a part of the day that certainly makes it exciting. 
Yeah, the question and Brian's uh, strategy <laughs> laptop, the smoke pouring off it already, and we're only an hour into the race, but you are allowed a discretionary stop that, that it doesn't have to take that full 90 seconds. So you can come in to put another tyre in the car and don't have to do the one minute 30 thing. My question is, did they make that a compulsory stop or did they just throw a tyre at it? Well, it was a, it was a 1 minute 48, so, so they could take that off, yeah. Yep. Good. Nice work. No worries. Here to help. L l lucky you're here, Brian. You're keeping us up to date. What's happening? <laughs> well, I've got a headache already. I don't, I don't know which way to look. There's stuff going everywhere. We're trying to keep up with it. <laughs> Who stopped? Who didn't? How long have they been in pit lane for? So about hour four and a half, that's when we're really going to start to see <laughs> these strategies play out. And then the last hour, that's when it's on. That's when the endurance racing at Bathurst, we've seen it in every form of the race here, 12 hour, 24 hour, certainly uh, the 1,000 and the six hour is, uh, is how exciting the last hour or so of motorsport can be. Is now a good time to say I was never good at maths at school? No, bad notes. Gents, I wanted to talk about this car that's currently in for the driver change. This is the only car in this race that has raced in the Bathurst 1000. It's the Toyota Camry. Remember the GTP and the showroom showdown and David Ratcliffe for the late Ron Searle? This is the one and the same car. Shane Logan and his mates from Queensland have got their hands on this car. They started from the back of the grid. This is the classic scenario of a team living the dream. This is their Bathurst, the six hour. They've got their opportunity. They've got a donor car out the back with spare parts just in case. They bought it four k's from the track the other day. It's a classic Bathurst story and a car that's been racing here at this mountain since the late 90s. How good is this? It's a great story. They worked very hard to get a... It's not an exact recreation of its original livery, but it is a really convincing homage to what this car looked like back in the day. That 1998 two-litre Bathurst 1000, this car was part of it in that production car class. It's great to see. They have been battling all weekend and, in fact, we've just been told, we understand they've actually got radio issues in that car and they're struggling to get communication, so they've reverted to the old school semaphore with the pit board over the wall like they used to do at Bargs back in the day. Send someone down to the local news agent to buy some chalk, <laughs> find something you can write on and then that's how you communicate. Pit now and then you uh, you work it out. One of my very first Bathurst, that's how we communicated with the lap board, the radios were not very good. But um, certainly, Aaron just mentioned it. There's cars out the back. You walk around the back of the paddock here, and there's an atmosphere that's fantastic. There's uh, spare cars on trailers. There's half. There's BMWs with gearboxes out of them. There's bits everywhere for teams to uh, to uh, be ready for the the course of the, the day. So, as we saw with that car with the clutch, the Astra, they'll get that car back. They can get a clutch in it. They might lose a couple of hours, but they'll get that car back out on the track and uh, enjoy the race. We lost count at 14 donor cars in the paddock, but that doesn't include the cars that the general public have bought and may have unwisely left in the car park because uh, I think if you own a BMW and you've parked it out in Harris Park, it may be missing some bits by the end of the day. Uh, just a few little uh, updates for you that have come our way from the team in pit lane. Uh, the reason they stopped car number one again is they don't know how much fuel went into the car, so they came back to make sure it was full. So they wanted to make sure the tank on our defending champions, George Medici behind the wheel, was absolutely brimmed. So that was what we were told, uh, how much truth is in that. Teams always play their cards pretty close to their chest. And a couple of cars, 9 and 143, are going to get a five-second penalty for safety car restart breach. And I'd throw money at the fact that we'll be overlapping or weaving prior to the restart. Once the lights go out, no weaving the safety car, which is one of those quirky rules that catches people out just about every Bathurst Enduro that's not the 1000. Aaron? Just when you give a car a wrap, the Camry's still in the pits, boys. It went to leave after it stopped. They've got a fuel leak. We talked them up, and now they've got a drama. They're straight into it to try to get this sorted out, but, oh boy, kiss of death, isn't it? Typical Bathurst stuff. It, would, it wouldn't be a great Bathurst without some sort of drama, would it? I mean, come on. I mean, I remember as a kid, one of the first times I came up here with, with my dad, it was uh, nothing like it is today, the Bathurst, in terms of the back of the paddock. Race cars were intense. Guys were sleeping next to race cars. There was engines on the ground on a Sunday morning. They're building engines in, in, uh, in the dirt, and uh, that's what the Bathurst 1000 used to be like. And in some ways, it's a little bit similar. You've got that atmosphere 
here this weekend. I reckon it's fantastic. A lot of uh, families and friends and helpers trying to get through this weekend. And of course, you see these little dramas, but they overcome. They get the car out there, they fix the problem, and they get it racing again. Barrett Linton still leads the race. The margin 19 seconds now over Dean Campbell, who's taken over from Cameron Creek. Michael Cabbage behind the wheel of the 92 car. They're third, 23 seconds from the lead. Got a second up their sleeve to the teammate, which is Bree Wilson, who's behind the wheel of the 24 car. Chris Lillis running in fifth outright and first of the A2 cars in the big Chevy Camaro. So they're going along nicely, leading laps in their class for the first time. That car on debut at the mountain. It's a very cool bit of kit. I'll tell you more about that as the race goes on. Blomquist going along well, leader in class A1 in sixth. Brock Giplin in the big HSV GTS supercharged Chevy V8 under the bonnet in seventh position. And Jason Gomesell, second in class. He's remained behind the wheel of car number 30. That's the Ford Mustang. He's sharing with his son, Ben, and Aaron Seaton, who took two and a half seconds out of the class lap record in qualifying to put that car on pole position. Pace has been electrifying. That is the 30 car. On screen into the elbow now being chased down by the tyres and more. Grey Mustang, another one of the class contenders. That's the Graham Cheney, Paul Hadley, and Tyler Cheney car. Is it? No, it's not. It's Lindsay Kearns, Jake Camilleri, and Scotty Nicholas in the 25. Jake, the Queenslander, who's won his class on several occasions in a Mazda 3 MPS, is behind the wheel of that car, but Lindsay Kearns driving it now. This is a good little battle for track position in the class, and Grey Mustang's going to pass red into the chase. That was an amazing lap by Aaron Seaton, oh. wasn't it? We thought how uh, how impressive it was when he got that Mustang. He actually sat about second or third on the timesheet at the time, and then some of the bigger BMWs found a little bit more time. But to improve so much, this is a manual gearbox. Both those Mustangs on, on screen, they're a manual gearbox. So when I mean that, you've got a gear stick, you've got a clutch pedal, you change it like old school manual in terms of some of these BMWs and some of the other Mustangs in the field do have a 10-speed or an eight-speed with a, a paddle shift. So um, certainly the, the, that was a great job by Aaron. And then we watched the Camaro got very close later on in qualifying. So Chris Lillis at the moment, A2, he's currently P5 on the road. He stopped early. We saw him come in with the most of the other uh, the other cars on that early stop. So uh, A2 still running in the top five. You can see the class leaderboard, the various leaders in each category in this year's High Tech Oil's Bathurst six hour. We're into the second hour of this year's Easter Classic. Nine today in the central west of New South Wales. Couple hundred k's inland from Sydney over the Blue Mountains. What a place to spend an Easter long weekend. The High Tech Oil's Bathurst six hour continues with 23 laps, an hour and eight into the race. Countdown clock has 4.49 to go. That's the countdown to the final lap of the race. So the race is basically five hours and 58 minutes plus one lap, which is two and a half minutes, which gets the six hours in. So when that clock gets to zero, you know that it will mean something and there will be another spirited Bathurst battle to the chequered flag. Barry Linton is the race leader. Margin out to 30 seconds now. Head down for the 23 car. Michael Cavage second, Dean Campbell third, Bree Wilson in fourth, Brock Giblin in fifth place. And he's just taken that spot away from Chris Lewis in the big Camaro. Wonquist next in seventh, Kearns eighth in the grey Mustang. And then we find Jason Gomesell and Chris Holt, first of the A1 cars. Blue number, you can tell the different classes with the colour assigned to them on your timing and scoring graphic on the left of screen. You can see the mark there as well. So lots of information coming your way across the course of this six hour race. Great team, Richard Crowell, Brian Vanderwecker, Ben Barg uh, Jason Bargwana upstairs. In the lane is Ben Bargwana. And next we find Aaron Noonan. Rich, if you're playing back for six hour bingo today, you've got the Astra card. It's not really a good one. We've already seen the 43 car on the back of the tilt tray truck. I've got bad news. The 78 is in here with major open heart surgery. They've got an issue with this car's engine. Uh, and I want to point out to you, you might see on your timing screen today, car 46 Faulkner. Familiar number, familiar name. It's Peter Faulkner, John Faulkner's son, at the wheel of one of the other Astras in this race. It's his first time racing at Bathurst, but so far, if you're an Astra today, it hasn't been a very good day. Peter Faulkner driving with Carrera Cup racer Matt Slavin Noons, and spoke to Matt this morning, and they're just, they're another team, and said, we just want to finish. We just got to get there. They feel like if they get to the finish, they'll get a good result regardless. But it's been a tough old weekend for those HSV Astras. 
This is the battle for second. There's third. There's fourth and fifth. So the fight right in it. 45 car a lap down. One of the contenders in the A1 category. Brooks behind the wheel, 31st outright. Another one of the GWR stable. So the race just settling down now into a groove, a long green flag run. A vast majority have ticked off their first compulsory pit stop. In fact, the first car yet to stop Brian is the Blomquist number 93 car that leads the A1 class. They're running long, but they've only got four compulsory stops to make in this race versus the six for the outright cars in Class X. Plenty going on so far, hasn't there, Rich, in the first hour of the race. So let's have a look back at how it all got underway. Good start from Will Davidson, was able to lead the field through Hell Corner for the opening time. What was going to be a long, long opening stint. We saw this tremendous battle forming for position number two. It was Thomas Randall that would get by the inside at the end of Tyler Everingham. And Everingham would actually lose out a little bit because those in behind would ultimately catch this number 24 car and elevate themselves up through the field in that early portion of the race. It was this tremendous battle, but unfortunately we were halted underneath the first safety car very early in the race because the Sharon Rentals BMW was turned at Philby Park and was stuck in the sand trap. 10 minutes into the race, we had our opening safety car. And as you can see, it was a dust storm up there at the top of Mount Panorama. A little further back as well, Scotty Gore was turned around at Forest Elbow. The car was stuck there, but was able to get that car back underway once again in what was a precarious position. And further on through the field, there was Battles Galore, one of the BMWs there, unfortunately, just dropping it on the exit of the chase, making slight contact with the outside wall on driver's left, thankfully got away with it. But there was a little bit of a heart stop moment for those leaders out in front because the second safety car would fall on lap number 40 when the Class C Holden Astra would come to a stop on the way up to Mount Panorama. And that was when our leading contenders would take the opportunity to head into a pit stop. Speaking of leading contenders, the 81 BMW driven by Shane Smolin contacted the Hell Corner. Right rear damage, a flat right rear, and they would come in to complete their compulsory pit stop. Then this brilliant battle for position number one. George Medici staying in the car. Beric Linton was the race leader at the time, but Medici was able to squeak down the inside at 270 kilometres an hour as they turned it into the chase, took the race lead at the moment. They are tough to beat at the early point of this race. As we mentioned that, though, whilst we're in this highlights package, the third safety car has been deployed in this one. So it's all about to change as we click over to the two-hour mark. Nicely surmised, Brian. Here's how the leaderboard sits into the second hour of the race. BMW is continuing to lead the way, and there will be pit stops in this as well. Every opportunity you can get to get a free stop under safety car, you'll take it. In fact, the leader is in. A2 leader going along nicely, the Camaro, and then the Class B1 leader climbing their way up. So Chris Holt's done a great job at the start of the race to drag that car into the top 10. The Lyconos in 11th in the first of the Mitsubishi Lancer Evos. What a staple that car's been. Tony Levitt and Luke King running along nicely. 16th place in the Mercedes AMG C63. Patrick Navin, who qualified on pole in the VW Scirocco in 19th outright and leading the way in Class C. They've had a great day so far, just in front of the Courtney Prince Team Buccini car. Michael Cavett just stayed out, so the strategic games begin. We love this. As you work your way through, you can keep an eye on where your favourite driver and or team are watching. You can see the Class D leaders there. The Toyota 86 is going along well. This will be a good test for this new pit stop rule where teams have to shut the engine off and they'll just sit there and bake for 40 or 50 seconds. A couple of cars have come in. A couple have stayed out. We'll bring you up to speed with all of that down to the back end of the 58 car field. And we're told this is the reason for the safety car. So it's what's been a pretty troubled day for the number 96 BMW. Class X car for Mackay Goodwin and Lloyd's auctions. Jordan Cox was flying early on. Scotty Turner and Rob Rubis, but they've had a fueling issue in this car since the very start of the race. In fact, before the race, and they're now limping back. So this car, we think, was stopped at the top, and then they've, as a result, thrown the safety car for the first time. Now, Jason, leaders peeling off into pit lane, but one car stayed out. 
One car did say it. Brian's sitting here with his calculator. He's trying to work out who, where, what, when at the moment. But what we saw, the biggest thing there for us was the 92 car did not pit during that stop, so during the safety car. So everyone else has come in. Uh, Campbell stayed in the car. They've just refueled the car. The one car's back in again. That's its third stop now for this race. A lot of the A2 cars. We see the 93 car. That was leading class A1. It's having its first stop for the race. So it's managed to make it all the way to an hour and uh, 16 minutes into the race. But the cabbage car, that was now the 92. We saw Tommy Randall, that was very fast at the start of the race, is going to be leading this race. And uh, the, the safety car will pick that car up. This is what's fun about these races, is that from now on in, we're not going to know for quite some time about where all this plays out until they all complete their sixth and final pit stop. This is car one. So this one. will be another stop for our defending champions. They're ticking them off early. And that's a good strategy and it's a proven strategy in this race because what it means is that later in the day you can do whatever you want. If you want to make a really quick stop, you can do that. You don't have to be behoven to that 90 second maximum or minimum time for a compulsory pit stop. Noons? Rich, I just wandered down to the end of pit lane just to double check on the 23 car. Beric Linton did stay on board. They just did fuel his back on the road. So uh, it was busy here. Steve Owen climbing aboard the Lexus, the only one in the race. It's a bit of a different car to the rest of them out there, but uh, busy times down here, boys. We're, work we're working hard. Is that air conditioning really terrible today? No, or is it's, it, it's, it's functioning. It's kicking in just nicely. It's Good to hear. Oh, nicely. Good to hear. Actually, Actually, if I was to get pretty complicated, maybe just maybe down a notch, Rich, if that's yeah, right, 21 nice. degrees maybe. What's yeah. the player comfort level in the lane? No, because it is, in all seriousness, it's a talking point. It is a warm day. Yeah, it is. I mean, we're talking about an expected top today of 28 degrees here at Mount Panorama. Obviously, on the track, it's a bit more toastier than that. But pit lane's still pretty busy here. All the, the X-Class cars have been in and out, but there's a range of class cars. That's what you love about this race. There's always something going on. There's, what, five or six fights within the fight. And uh, you've got all these composite pit crews. You've got a lot of people who are weekend warriors. You've got some full-time uh, supercar people having their weekend off to help their friends. It's a real, I've seen some really familiar faces here this weekend in very different shirts and race suits. It's, uh, it's good fun down here, that's for sure. There's been a lot of good stories told at the bar this weekend so far already. And uh, I think the best ones will be tonight. So this is the 96 car. It's finally made it back to pit lane. There's some thumbs up, but uh, this car has had a pretty troubled run in the first 78 odd minutes of this race. The lights are out on the safety car. We've got to say thanks to Bathurst Mazda for providing our safety car and course vehicles today. Thank you for their support. And we're back to green. Third restart in the high tech oils Bathurst six hour. And we've got a new leader. The 92 car leads for the first time. Michael Cavage behind the wheel. A great Bathurst surname. Ben and Michael's dad raced in the Group C era in a Mazda RX-7 and a Yellow Pages Commodore. They've got the sponsor back, the surname's here. They've got Tommy Randall alongside and that BMW leads. Chris Lillis did not stop. Second position for the Camaro. And Tyler Mecklem in third position now in the Class A2 car. Tyler's a properly fast driver who was on the pathway way back when in Formula Ford racing. He's up to third, Lycono in fourth, and Grant Denyer now up to fifth. So early dramas we saw for the number seven local legends Mustang. They've rebounded. And uh, Bathurst's favourite son, one of them, is now inside the top five. Grant going along nicely. It's good to see that Camaro up there, isn't it? The Berwick Linton car, the 23, after his splash for fuel. Uh, they took the full 90 seconds. They, they filled that car up, back out, still in the car, and has rejoined in sixth, although probably around about 40 odd seconds behind the leader so whilst uh, you, you might be sixth on the road there's still a lot of uh, a lot of time that you've got to try and catch up oh, that car was very fast but now as you can see he's got, they've got to find their way through the, uh, the traffic i've just seen the number one car co bus it's still got george Medici behind the wheel parks it's just crossed the line so the leaders are at the top this is the car in second outright george has just crossed the line having taken another pit stop, the third for that car. But they can only, they were, what I can only assume was five wide as they battled past lap traffic and got to that control line. But that's the difference on a restart like this. If you're not right on the back of the queue, you are miles, miles back. So track position loss for them at the moment, but they've got a 90 second CPS up their sleeve for later in the race. I was just gonna say, that, that's all good and well. You might be that far behind, but you've already got one stop up. 
So the strategists and the team engineers and the crews down in pit lane, they've got calculators and bits of paper and whiteboards flying everywhere. I'm just trying to work out exactly what the best strategy for them is. The 81 there is past, uh, just gone past the Mercedes, also past Lillis. You can see the battle. Oh, a bit of contact. The Mustangs in the side of the Murkies uh, managed to gather it up. That's the nine car and the 45. We saw the 45 put a new tyre on that car. But it's good to see uh, Cabbage out in front now. He's got some clear air, although there was some cars on that restart that hadn't joined the queue. So traffic's going to play into it early. He's not going to get a clear road um, is what he would probably expect on the, oh. on the start of a restart. Bit of a rub, bit of a push, but that's how you can easily cut a tyre, bend the steering arm, and uh, that can certainly uh, play into the way the day pans out for you. Saw the McLennan Motorsport car with Shane Smolin still behind the wheel doing a long double at the start of this race, but they're the first car a lap down in this race. So they'll be looking for the next safety car to perhaps stay out, although they're going to have to get Shane out of that car at some point. So they're in an awkward little position where they really need to get a lap back. And that's why Shane's hustling oh. now, because up the road is the race leader. So actually, he could do this on pace, Shane Smolin. But just, actually, just as he went to that shot, I just saw Shane, he was in front of the Camaro. He ran wide at turn two, and it, I think it touched the fence. It was, uh, it was hard to see, although he got very close to the fence. So now the Camaro's got back in front of him again, and he's got to do all that hard work again. So the point I was trying to make was that Chris Lillis is second on the road. The only car in front is Michael Kavich, who's the race leader. So Shane will be setting out after him, try and get back on the lead lap. And then when you get that next safety car, you can catch up to the back of the queue and get your lap back. These are the kind of races, though, where if you go down a lap early, it's not the end of the world. You can work your way back into it as the day goes on. But not with mistakes like that and little moments like that. Well, I mean, he's going to have to push pretty hard to catch the cabbage car. He's got the car underneath him to do it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, certainly when it comes to that traffic and so forth, he's got to find a way through and not make those mistakes. So you can see Glenn Seaton there. He's trying to work out with Aaron which way to go and uh, what's the best way to, to get this day underway and make sure that they stay where they want to be. Currently, uh, the A2 class leading car, the class they're in is that, uh, that Camaro, Tyler Mecklen. Uh, is third on the road at the moment, Berwick Linton. Um, the, the Tyler Mecklen car, that's obviously a Mustang as well. So uh, Berwick Linton car is uh, the second of the X-Class cars. So it's all over the place at the moment, trying to see where it all sits. And you can see Shane Smolin using all the road again there, running a little bit wide. We've got another one. I don't know which way to look here at the moment. <laughs> We've got another one that's had a bit of a moment at turn two. Looks like it's still rolling around, the 105. That's uh, a Class B1 car. So they've obviously had a bit of a moment up at uh, up at turn uh, turn two. Oh, there's a car I know. That yellow and white little golf. Oh, yeah. That's our old little golf. Nice. Ben and Jude raced that one. We had a successful day uh, in that car, and it uh, we ended up P2 in Class D. So it's uh, it's good to see these cars out there racing away. There's some stories there. Uh, Matt Dikonoski, who's behind the wheel of that car. It's been a, a long dream to race at Bathurst. Wow, busy in front. Car taken to the grass. Katsumasa Geo style going on the outside there, making the Bathurst 12 hour. This is the Camaro providing us with all of the great pictures at the moment. And he's just been overtaken, so that was a lead, a class change. Um, right. I got that wrong, didn't I? Tyler that, was a, that was a change for the lead of the class, sorry. So Tyler Mecklen there just down the inside of Lillis and has now got a Mustang in front of that class for the first time today. Adrian Morrell co-driving this car, hugely experienced guy in six and 12 hour racing here at Mount Panorama. So that's a good combination. Tyler now second outright, only six and a half seconds behind the leader. The 81 car continues to navigate traffic. He's catching Michael Cavage and he needs to get to him and pass him before, if, and when the next safety car runs. So Cavage, Mecklen, Lewis, Linton, Lycono, Denya. It is shuffled though. And remarkably, still some cars yet to make a stop. And the Class D leader has not pitted yet. An hour and 25 into the race. Well, they've only got to make three stops. Yeah. So it makes sense to try and stretch that out to around the two-hour mark, the four-hour mark, and then you've got one you've got to try and get in there somewhere. Some of these little 86s and so forth, they will go for two hours on the uh, on the track without those stops, particularly with a few safety cars. And let's find out from Aaron Noonan what's happening in pit lane. 
All barks, I've stopped in with the number 30 Mustang team. We saw that red car having a little moment of the chase before with the Merc, but I've grabbed Aaron Seen. He's fresh for a very good reason. He's done nothing today. Jason Gomesall's done the first dip, but the good news is you've got to do four compulsory stops. You've done two. You've only got two to go. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Jason said the, the car's handling well. Uh, obviously, I was fortunate to, to drive it over Friday and Saturday, and we just kept cheering it up, cheering it up, and got it really good for qualifying. So, yeah, looking forward to getting in this afternoon and going to the end. Can you knock some off, some of those Class X BMWs off? Can you get on an outright podium, or, or are you all about the class win today? Yeah, definitely going for the class win. Obviously, that's that's all we can control and 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 focus on doing the the, uh, the little things right over the race distance. Uh, obviously, Ben's in, out there at the moment and doing a good job. So, yeah, looking forward to um, seeing how he goes and then jumping at the end. It's a family affair, so Jason and Ben Gomes, or father and son, you've got your dad here too. He's on the headset. Is he all right to deal with an engineer mode, or, or is he hard work and you just have to unplug it occasionally? No, he's, he's very good, obviously. He's had a lot of years of experience uh, with his own supercar team. He used to engineer his own cars, so no, he's got plenty of experience, and he loves the technical side. So uh, a fun thing about our team this weekend is actually we have three sets of father and son pairs, so it's, it's pretty cool to be here at Easter and, and be uh, surrounded by sort of a real family team. Good stuff. All the best. Thank you. Trouble on the mountain. The Brock Giblin branded Madden X car, the only HSV X car in the field this weekend. That right front is looking a little bit worse for wear. It might even be suspension damage because it looks like even that right front guard is hanging very much over that right front tyre as well as he works his way down to the dipper. Yeah, we're not sure if that's obviously a uh, tyre failure or he's maybe had a clip with a fence or another car or something that's caused that issue. But to limp that car back, you've just got to go nice and slow. You don't want to tear the whole thing apart. Being on the front tyre there, it's rubbing away. And oh. in saying that, we've got the... Uh, hang on, are they near each other on the track? We've got the 81 with another damaged tyre. So it's out limping back now with the left rear. We've got a right rear, a left rear. We're not going to surmise, but who knows? Um, the 81 is now limping back, obviously, to pit lane as well. So two cars out there with uh, tyre issues at the moment. And that's certainly made their day challenging, hasn't it? Well, if the first flat tyre didn't ruin their day, this one certainly will. And it's happened at the most awkward periods of the racetrack as well, because they've got to do a whole lap just about in order to bring that car back into the lane. So a lot of time cost there, unfortunately, for the 81 BMW. It's on the unloaded side of the car for the BMW, loaded side of the car for this one. So the right-hand side tyres, and everybody in the lane, for the most part, was talking that you put right-hand side tyres on your car, especially that right front, which has so much load going through it here at Mount Panorama. Some teams were talking about the drive tyres, so putting two rears on as well, and you could even do three tyres, but it's quite a lengthy process. So you can only work on one side of the car at any one time. That's a long, long lap back in. But we've avoided a safety car, which for everyone else is fine. For these guys, it's not. It's been a pretty checkered start for the 81 team. It's been put together by Tom McLennan and his family. They've drafted in David Russell and Shane Smollin, who drove that car to victory here three years ago with Rob Rubis and Shane Van Gisbergen. Looks a little bit more than just a flat tyre, that damage, doesn't it? That car is certainly dragging its nose on the ground. So um, I'd just say some sort of suspension failure, maybe. It looks like the, the tyre is well up in the guard there. So how that's come about, we'll have to uh, try and get an update for you and understand what's gone wrong. But so the number 10 car starting from the back of the grid in pit lane now. And uh, they'll have to do some uh, handy work on that vehicle to get it back out. It's so far down on that right front, they're actually trying to keep that left rear on the ground as well. It's got that much uh, angle over on that right front tyre as we look a little bit further back through the field and the battles that continue for class honours, the Buccini triple nine racing entry. And we go back towards the head of that field, just behind that shot, in fact, was George Medici, who's continuing to stay in that car. He started in that car, so a long stint for him at the moment coming up to the 90 minute mark and because they've got three drivers they can almost split this race into thirds two hours for george two hours for the next driver two hours for your final driver and we suspect that that final driver will certainly be jade no jade and they'll plug and play he did a limited number of laps on friday in fact two albeit keeping in mind he's just come back from some hang believe it or not this week he was doing some mercedes gt driver 
training and coaching. He had the red eye flight on Wednesday night, got here very early Thursday morning, and he's come straight to Mount Panorama and having plenty of fun as well. Just saw the triple nine car of Team Buccini, the all girl team, doing a really good job. Courtney Prince qualified that car on pole in class, first female to be on pole in Bathurst six hour history. And they're doing a really nice job, still leading the B1 class at the moment and just cruising around in 16th position. Actually, I tell a lie, Matt Charter's leading the B1 class. They're up in seventh outright in the 335i Turbo Bimmer, the most raced car in Bathurst Endurance history. We'll talk more about that later on. Because, Brian, we've been joined by a special guest in the commentary box from a spectacular opening stint, the DA Campbell Transport BMW is going along nicely. Cameron Crick's been kind enough to jump up and join us. Hey, Cam, how's your day? Yeah, so far so good. It's um, yeah, the car was really strong in the first stint. It's uh, it's one of those things like I got in behind Randall and Davo, and you wanna you wanna keep pushing. But um, you know, long race. Cam's in my ear. He said, you know, just peg it back a little bit and try and look after the tire. Um, the right rear seems to start to to go fairly fast. Obviously, last year we were in the Evo and it didn't seem as bad. But obviously, this car being rear wheel drive, the, the right rear started to, to go quite quick. So it's um. Yeah, we'll have to play the strategy game and, and see how we end up at the end. Talking about Cameron Hill, who won this race a couple of years ago in spectacular style with Thomas Sargent, and the car you're driving is the sister car to that. Touch on that in the minute, because in the meantime, we need to get down to Aaron Mann. Yeah, Rich, I just was in the back of the garage of 81, the BMW that's just gone back on the track. I might just take a, a bit of a look in here because Shane Smolin's just stepped out of this car. Have a look at this tyre. It's been absolutely ripped to shreds. I just spoke to David Russell. He's now in the car. Uh, he said that Shane had run onto the grass on the run at Mountain Street. He's just got out of the car. I might just dive in here. Sorry, Shane, to interrupt you. What's going wrong here? David mentioned to me that you might have run on the grass up Mountain Street. Has that got anything to do with this? Um, yeah, there was a slight amount of grass uh, just passing cars on the lap before. Whether that's got anything to do with the tyre failure, I have no idea. Um, yeah, just went in uh, in turn two, and uh, it's a long way back. No warning? No warning, no. Never fun. No fun, but uh, yeah, that was the second one for that uh, double stint, so uh, yeah, definitely got my attention. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We'll go back to comms, there's some action on the road. Certainly action, the second placed car at the time, and that was overall, unfortunately, has found the wall. Tyler Mecklen and heavy, heavy right front damage on this Mustang was in such a good position, but unfortunately, their day has come down in a crashing way. Class leader, so that will bring another safety car. The Bathurst Mazda will be back on the racetrack. We've got Cameron Crick in the box with us, Cam. This is such a busy race. First question is, how hard is this traffic to navigate? As we go, oh, look, you can become expert here and just tell us what's unfolded. Oh, oh Yeah, he's just oh. a little bit offline on the approach to the grate there. And um, the, the marbles start to build up quite quick here. And you, you can be half a tyre width offline and, and, like, there's no stopping that thing hitting the fence, unfortunately. And it's very, very easy to do there. Like, a couple of moments I even had early in the race, you just... Um, it, it becomes quite a single, single line there. And, um, as I said, the, the tyres start to to go away quite quick. I think one, one lap you feel like the grip's there and the next it's not. So um, really unfortunate there for Tyler because that's, that's, that's easy to do. That's Courtney Prince suiting up to jump into the triple nine car for her first into the race. Uh, the traffic. I mean, it's such a factor in this race. It's something everyone has to deal with, whether you're in an outright car or a class E car, but what's it like from your point of view? Oh, it's crazy. There's obviously no no race quite like it with, with the approach speed so different. You know, last year we were in the Evo and, and the... Oh, sorry, again. Um, but yeah, the the traffic last year in the Evo wasn't so bad because um, you know the speeds aren't crazy fast. But obviously in the BMW, you, you're coming up on the D and E class cars so fast. It's um, it's and it's hard for them too to you know as I said from the cutting all the way to to the elbow. It's um, you know they're they're like a deer in the headlights too, so they can't just get out of our way. Yeah. Um, and we're coming at them quite fast, so um, it's tricky for everyone us getting past them and them getting out of the way. It's a, obviously it plays a massive part of the race. So safety can quite quite hard, and, and the tyre starts to go quite quick as well. I noticed in the first 45 minutes of my stint, like the right rear was was near shot. So um, as I said, very easy to do there, but unfortunate for tyre because um, they built a good Mustang there, and they were they were going quite well. It's a shame to see. 
The first point of that race was incredible, wasn't it? Because there was so much intensity between you guys at the front and having to manage that. I said to Richard the call that it's probably the most intense start to a race that we've seen here since its entirety. <laughs> yeah, it was all it was all happening. Um, it was quite interesting. I haven't really been near Davo or or Tommy all weekend, so to see where their cars make speed compared to ours was was quite interesting. Um, but yeah, like I wanted to keep going with them, but um, yeah, Cam <laughs> Cam Hill was in my ear saying just. Maybe peg it back a couple of seconds and uh, and try and look after the thing. But yeah, the, the first half an hour it felt like a bit of a sprint race. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely definitely good fun. But um, probably a bit smarter to, to cool it, cool it out. And the temperatures obviously uh, are that bit high too when you you know ride in behind the other car. So they they seem to drop down a little bit when we when we pegged it back. But um, but yeah, it was a good start of the race. Just looking at car one here, the reigning champions looks like they're going to do tyres here but they were only just in a moment ago which kind of holds my breath whether or not they may have had a slow leak possibly when the car went back out because like I said they're only in two and a half minutes ago. George Medici staying behind the wheel of that car and they're looking more towards that right rear and not the right front which possibly suggests maybe they did have a slow leak. Luckily enough that that did happen under safety car and it's not going to cost them too much time as opposed to if it was under green flag conditions. We'll get our pit lane team on that. We need to let Cam go. Uh, he's got to get back into a race car at some point in the near future for what I imagine is going to be a reasonably warm afternoon for you in your triple layer race seat and hot conditions. Thanks for coming up. Good luck this afternoon. Go well. No dramas. Thanks for having me. I, was I, was, I reckon I can stay up here in, in the air. Very, car. very That's nice. quite good. But um, yeah, better head back and, and get into it with the boys. But thanks for having me up here. Well done, right. mate. Good stuff. Cheers. Let's go down the lane. Here's Ben Bargwana. A uh, very interesting update. I just wandered down to see how Tommy Randall was going. And as the car pulled into pit lane, the left rear deflated. So it went totally flat. They pulled both uh, both rears off the car and they were both really bad conditions. So looks like these BMWs are using the tyres pretty hard. Good update, Ben. Thank you. And that just elaborates a little bit more on how this race may play out later in the day. Tyre changes may be required late in the race to give you something to fight with in the back end of this car race. So we wait for everyone to compress behind the safety car. We'll get an idea of the actual running order, but there's some cars that are out of position that are yet to stop. And that is a pretty mangled Ford Mustang. Jason Bargwana joins us once again upstairs here in the Mount Panorama pit building. Big old accident up there at the Metal Grace. Old classic, yeah. Run wide at the grate there. You, you, you get the uh, opportunity to turn in there. If the car's just a little bit wide into that grey area, you just can't get it back. So, unfortunately, an incident there. That was the class leader at the time, obviously, and uh, and now that's certainly changed the format for the day. This is the 71 car that's had some issues. We touched on that with Jet Johnson earlier in the race. They're limping this car back around. We're told one more lap behind the safety car, which... Might be what this team and indeed the race needs to get themselves out of the way. So the number one car stopped again. Yes, but that one that they just did does not com uh, count as a compulsory pit stop okay. because it would have been their second stop under yellow. Correct. But also, they do one under the safety car. Correct. It was also only a minute 26. So they've done four compulsory pit stops in this race, more than any other car right now, and they're still on the lead lap. I actually quite like that. Yeah, it puts them in a really good position for the end of this one with two fresh tyres. Correct. Yeah. Or one. One. One fresh tyre. Right rear. So they are uh, certainly put themselves in a very strong position. Um, we've mentioned it all morning so far, the, the way these strategies play out, but it's, it's all the class battles as well. Who stopped, who didn't, who's going to wear, it's just hard to know. One of the challenges of the class cars is even though you're battling a car, um, you, you know that you're in the fight for the podium or wherever it is, that car could all nearly be a full lap ahead of you based on where you sit on the, uh, the the road in terms of the safety car. So it has its challenges. It caught us out a number of years ago. We were about seven-eighths of a lap behind the leader of the class. We were second. We kept opening the gap up. We tried to find a way to close it, but the safety car kept coming out. And because we weren't the actual race leader, the, the Class X car was where the safety car would grab that car. That means all those class battles closed back up again. So. Whilst uh, those strategies, you've got to think about it during the course of the day because they're the things you can get catch you uh, catch you out. So that's the scene. Everyone will catch up to the safety car and we'll get a reset. This should be the final lap before we go back to racing. There's some cars that are massively out of position, but 
I quite like where they're at too. And one of them's the car shown second outright. And it's Matt Charter, the man from Albury, who's sharing with Peter O'Donnell, who hails from Parks, not that far away from here in country New South Wales. Yes, that's the town where the dish is. It's great to have Pete back. This is his 10th Bathurst Enduro 6 or 12 hour. But that car, the 335i Turbo, is a remarkable bit of kit. It's the bright orange car in the middle and it's done 21,600 kilometres of racing in Bathurst Enduros, which is more than a lap of Australia noons, which is the kind of distance you're traversing in pit lane for us today. And it's because I'm traversing so much distance, Rich, I thought I'd take a bit of a seat here and stop in at Team Camaro. And by the way, if you don't have one of these, jump on the Bathurst Six Hour website. This is the spotter's guide to know who's in what car. Crucial for pit lane reporters too with 58 cars in a race. Chris Lillis is uh, the man who's heavily involved with this Camaro. We spoke earlier in the week and I reckon this has gone better than you would have expected, surely not. Yeah, no, the car's going awesome. We're just, we're just keeping to our pace and doing our thing and it's looking after the tyres and, yeah, we couldn't be happier so far. Have you passed some Mustangs today? Because that's got to be aim number one when you drive a Camaro, surely not. Well, true, but we sort of got them on the start. So I got done by one and then one hit the wall. So technically I have passed one. <laughs> um, just quickly too, I stopped in before here and lunch was going on at, uh, at your team. Uh, pastry, sausage rolls, what have we got today to fuel the six hour assault? We've got homemade uh, pies, we've got brisket. Stuart is our local brisket man, he's a master at it. So yeah, we've got very well catered for here. Team Camaro, powered by pastry biscuits. <laughs> My favourite team. Send some upstairs, I think. Thanks, uh, Aaron, down there. The uh, Camaro team have done a nice job fourth outright at the moment, and they've just got the radio call that, uh, Nathan, you're on television. Nathan Callahan behind the wheel. Josh Muggleton did a superb job in that car in qualifying. Just missed the class pole by two tenths. As Noon said, probably above expectation for where they would expect that car to run. Just speaking of new cars, I just heard from Alan Jarvis that he's got something in the works, a long-time production car racer, something Volkswagen branded for Class C, brand new for next year. So we hope that that will happen. It's cool to see lots of new cars being built and developed for this race. And who knows, someone will find a BMW beater at some point that can come and take out the outright victory as well. The field bunched up there. Obviously, uh, good to see Beric Linton back in the lead of the race. Um, as that day goes on, you know, these, these battles with these X-Class cars, it's exciting to see because they've got different paces, they've got different drivers, they've got different strategies. Uh, and obviously we saw that drop in the field earlier and now it pops back up to the top. So Beric Linton, no stranger to this race, certainly done a lot. He's, uh, he's got the spare grey car in the truck there as well. We talked about bringing spare, um, you know, wrecks and things on trailers. Well, he's got a full spare race car there. They weren't sure of the, uh, some of the issues they've had in testing and so forth. They wanted to make sure they're ready to go. But, um, yeah, so obviously the, uh, it's exciting to see them out the front of the race. And except for a restart this time by. So we'll be under the control of Beric Linton, who has gone quite quickly away from the rest of the field because we've got a Class E car in behind him. So he is going to gain a lot of track position off this restart early, keeping in mind they've only done two compulsory pit stops in this race so far. So they've got a little bit out of sync compared to the rest of the field, but we'll have to wait until later on in the day as to how that is going to particularly pan out. Oh, the 81 BMW locks up big time heading into turn number one. Thankfully, didn't career into anyone else by the time they got through Hell Corner. It's massive smoke screen, isn't there? As we take the drone shots above Mountain Straight, as the field files up this wonderful bit of road. You've got to be careful though how you manage this early point of a safety car restart because the old saying goes, safety cars breed safety cars. You don't need that two hours, or almost at least at the two hour mark in this six hour race. A couple of the 86s battling in amongst each other as well, heading into Griffin's Bend. It's hold your breath moment as the door almost shuts and we saw Nathan Callahan not too far in the rears in that beautiful Camaro. They're still sitting very good in terms of position in this race. And then Dean Campbell a little bit further back as well. Sitting sixth overall right now is down the inside, if you don't mind me asking. It's often that that particular corner ends in a little bit of carnage when that particular move happens, but they got through it then that time by. And so far, so good on this restart. 
Interesting to note, though, Berwick Linton, 7.9 seconds ahead of the rest of the field already by the time they got to the top of Mount Panorama. And that's sometimes the thing. If you pit up a safety car, you do get balked a little bit in terms of track position with some of these slower cars because you can't pass them and overlap by the time you get to the start-finish line. You've then got to play the patient game and work your way through the traffic for the rest of the lap. Oh, look at this traffic jam in front of him. Where do you go? You just, you've got to slow down. You've got to uh, wait. You get stuck behind those Class E, Class C cars when you're a big Mustang trying to find your way uh, down that's right of Quinn at the moment driving that Mustang. So he's, um, yeah, obviously trying to find a way through. Stuck behind the uh, the Lexus. Ooh, Will he have a go? That's probably not a good spot to have a crack, I would have thought. Just as he went to pull out. <laughs> How's this? George Beatty here. What is going on here? <laughs> that's probably the slowest pass that he's ever going to put there at Forest Elbow. He almost came to a stop then that time by. It is wild in the middle point of this pack. Look at this. He's going to go three wide here for a moment. He thinks better of it. This is busy, busy stuff. But this is the sort of thing, though, that can end your day in a heartbeat. You've got to be so careful here. Now he clears the game over Mustang. Thankfully, it's not game over for George and continues on. Remember, he's got that fresh right rear tyre. He's going to try and make the most of it here. You've got both Ford Mustangs there. Brian in one gulp on the run down the hill. We've got the red one as well, the 30 car that's led the class early. Cabbage in the 92, that's the fourth and uh, fifth and sixth position. This is what restarts do in Bathurst six hour mode. It's like video game stuff. And some of them think they've got indestructible mode on. I can tell you they don't. Here's Mita Key squeezing down the inside of the Evo. There's no space to do that. That's Liam Lycono in car number 14, just in front, A1. Second position car, the BMW will deal with them in a straight line. So meanwhile, serenely, lovely out in front, Barrick Linton with 11 and a half seconds. He had the 1800 lasagna car, true story, sponsor. He's been in the wars today, number 20, uh, behind him at the restart. So he got a massive free kick there and huge amount of track position. Charter still second in the BMW we talked on just recently. And then Nathan Callahan, and it's still peak hour up the hill. <laughs> nerve-wracking time. The, the teams in pit lane are just, you know, watching their cars going, oh, please get through this, please get through this. Everyone's been really well. They're giving each other space. We've got the blue flags out there. You know what's happening at this point, but in the middle of all that, you've got a Class E Mazda trying to be passed by X-Class cars, Mustangs, and, of course, uh, on board here with George Medecki trying to find a way. He's, uh, is that Randall's car? The cabbage car is up right behind there now, so, and that would be a battle for position. Uh, P6 at the moment. And a pass as well, so he gets down the inside then at the top, McFillory Park, so into position number six at the moment. Gee, this is working out really nicely right now for your reigning champions. They've completed four compulsory pit stops, and at the moment, they're sixth outright. This could not be playing any better right now in terms of strategy for that number one machine. Ryder Quinn has never raced as slow as this <laughs> in a battle pack for position and checks up behind the big Lexus. There's a little love tap there. They're running down the hill into the elbow. There's a Osborne Motorsport, the 31 car, the sole entered car in that race. Ben Gomesales in front is too. The Lexus is actually out of position. Brown and Wilson, that is it, trying to go through in there as well. So those X-Class cars also trying to find their way through. That Lexus is quite fast in a straight line. And uh, Ryder Quinn has still not been able to find a way through in that battle in the Class A2 class. So, Rhonda Wilson there, she's plucking her way through some of that traffic. You see a little bit of damage to the front of the 86 that she's just gone past as well. It looks like Alice Buckley is it in the 50 car. So, that's the reigning champ car from Class D from last year. She did a great job finding a way through the traffic, but obviously a little bit of damage on the front of that car. Alice Buckley, she's a great little 86 racer from Queensland, does a fantastic job, but you can see the damage just behind the Ryder Quinn car there now. He's trying to find a wall. That gap closed up very quickly, didn't it? <laughs> Alice has done a great job with uh, Brett Parrish's team, B Pro out of Queensland. Brett's been racing excels here. If you go to the Bathurst Six Hour socials, you'll find an extraordinary photo taken by Nathan Wong of Brett clipping a curb at Murray's in an XL race yesterday. And the things that, I don't know, 
60 degrees to the straight line. I was going to say line. 70 degrees. Yeah, it was tilted on two wheels. I swear the mirror was rubbing on the ground. It was that close. I did see him at the restaurant last night, um, just having a little debrief about that particular moment. But they're running that Toyota 86 B Pro. Good race team. Lots of experience uh, in this race as we continue to work our way towards the end of the second hour of this race. Time flies when you're having fun on Easter Sunday, doesn't it? And finally, Ryder gets himself into a little bit of clear racetrack now in the local Legends Mustang. He's a great young guy. He's racing Carrera Cup full-time with McElroy Racing. Coming off a really good weekend at Albert Park 2 in the opening round of that championship. One of the top young Porsche junior drivers in Australia. Mark Griffith and Nash Morris, speaking of Porsche juniors. The red AMG A45, car number 91. They've had a checkered weekend. They actually missed qualifying with some eligibility issues that they sorted, but they've climbed up to 14th position in the leaderboard now. Griffo was very keen. Griffo's raced here a lot in 12 and six hour races. Very keen to inform me that he's got two cats named R2D2 and Obi One. <laughs> and he was quite keen for that to be talked about. And then Nash said, yep, my cat's called Dale. And knowing the Morrises, I would bet that there's an Earnhardt that follows that in the name of that cat. But they were very keen to get that across. I was going to say, is that junior or senior? Oh, well, <laughs> freaking senior. <laughs> but good to see them out there. 14th outright, actually, climbing up the leaderboard in the AMG A45, the A1 class car. So, deep breath settles itself down. And Ooh, which way do we look? A little bit of rhythm now in this race again with Berwick Linton leading. 17 seconds over Matt Charter. He's paired up with Pete O'Donnell. And he's doing a nice job. Matt had the wild card start in the great race a couple of years ago with Jay Robotham, who's also in this race in the Toyota 86. Nathan Callahan behind the wheel of the Camaro is third. Three different classes in the top three positions at the moment, which gives you an idea of how this all plays out with the strategy point of view. The big Mercedes dives down the inside. The MoMA solar lighting entry Anthony Levitt's car. And Luke King is behind the wheel. He's climbed up into 10th position. And that was a change of position as well. So that C63, we've talked about the Mustang and the Camaro, that C63, and also that V8 Lexus in that class. So uh, certainly for uh, that was a, a change of position. We've got a bit of a replay here. Contact Ooh. down the inside. That's uh, the Faulkner, I believe, Astra. Yeah, and the 971 Buccini BMW. So this was uh, race control have actually asked to look at this uh, as an incident they're investigating. So that was a little while ago, but we need to hop on down the inside there and get the car that's sort of a car length further in front to uh, dispense some uh, judgment over that one. Uh, good stuff by Luke King, this Mercedes. They've had a pretty challenging weekend. Um, Anthony Levitt, who's the team owner and co-driver, did the drive back to Sydney on Friday night to get a new crank angle sensor for that car. They had an ECU problem this morning where they found they were 30 k's an hour down in straight line speed. And they've dragged that thing into the top 10. This has been a huge performance. And they've got MoMA solar lighting on that car where Tony met the guys from the major sponsor at Monaco at the Grand Prix. And they just, uh, as Australians do, gravitated together, completely unplanned, met each other and said, oh, you would love to get involved in your race car. And that's how the relationship was formed. So go to Monaco to the Grand Prix and help get you on the grid at Mount Panorama. <laughs> as Aussies do. <laughs> Correct. And this is that BMW 335i. So this is the car that won the Bathurst 12 hour in 2007 and then won it again in 2010. Paul Morris. Craig Baird involved in the driving combinations with Gary Holt, who owned the car at the time. It's won its class in the 12-hour a couple of times. It's won its class in the six-hour before. There you go. Who needs a new race car? <laughs> Correct. It's more than 15 years old, but it continues to go well. Bright new livery. And we are going safety car for the fifth time. Another safety car interruption. And a 20-second race lead for Berwick Linton will go away, and that's why the 88 Mitsubishi Lancer has found dramas at Brock Skyline and it is a very perilous position as the world drops away beneath your feet on the run down the hill towards the dipper. Looks like a bit of fluid leaking out of that car, so obviously it's a very uh, awkward position. You approach that area at around 200 kilometres an hour 
in some of the faster cars. So damage to the front of that. We'll uh, hopefully get a replay of exactly what's happened. But we've obviously seen an accident at that point of the uh, circuit. Over the years, it's a common place. It's a dangerous spot. It's one of the high speed parts of the circuit. So all, to, all you need to do up there is to drop a wheel in the dirt and it can spin oh. you around. We've got Alice Buckley now. We just talked about how what a great job she's doing. Now she's found herself parked in the sandpit at the end of the chase. So that front splitter may have come off. We're not sure. Um, but certainly uh, that's uh, last year's class winner, class D winner from last year in the sandpit at this point of the race. Graham Wakefield behind the wheel of the Evo. They were 28th. He's got two wheels off on the exit there on the right-hand side. It's fired him across Alan Moffat style. I was going to say, the very one of my very first Bathurst, John Smith. Oh, he's, yes. Uh, he walked me around, and we can see Alice Buckley. She's locked up and gone straight ahead. A car with ABS, that's a bit odd, so maybe a failure there that's caused that drama. But John Smith walked me around. I was a young 18-year-old, never been this place before, and he said, if you ever put two wheels off over the top here, don't fight it. It's going to turn your left into the fence, and that's what's happened with the 88 car. Just looking ahead at strategy here for a moment, gentlemen. Car number one, which we're riding on board with right now. George Medici still in the car. He started the race. We are bang on the two-hour mark. So if you were to split this race with a three-driver combination, two, two, and two, I would expect George to possibly be in this lap, complete their fifth compulsory pit stop in this lap, in this race, and hand the car over. I would expect Simon Hodges to take over that car as well because they'll keep uh, Jaden O'Jada's powder dry for another thrilling Bathurst finish. Shows you how narrow this racetrack is up there. There's a car width to get by the run past what was the old uh, Castrol Tower. Don't forget, you can tell who's leading your class, Class B1. That's Class C. So Nathan Halstead leads the way over. Matt Slavin, Cody Mackay next. Tim Barwick leads the way in Class D. And Scott Tidyman leads the way in the baby car class. The drama continues. The high-tech oils Bathurst six hour into the third hour of the race. And this car has just peeled off to the side of the road. A key contender, a leader early. The Cavage Brothers and Thomas Randall for Breast Cancer Trials. We're under safety car, but this car has stopped on the run up to Griffin's Bend. Under the control of the safety car. And they've just been through the lane as well. A key contender has struck dramas. So with these BMWs, we heard Jordan Cox talking about a little bit earlier. You do have the opportunity to stop, turn the car off. Bit of a, what do you know, we, we, we call it a control alt delete, reset the car, and hopefully it will go again, which is what seems to be happening here with the 92 car. So whilst he stayed on the lead lap, obviously uh, not a good situation, but uh, he's only lost track position. So under safety car, he certainly has kept that car in condition with that control alt in, 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 in terms of the race, the control alt delete, and the right, there they go again. Driver change going on here for car number one. So as we mentioned, George Medici has jumped out of that machine. Now Simon Hodges jumping in, and that was bang on two hours and four minutes into this race. So a long opening stint there for George Medici, but he has done a tremendous job early on in this race. And this is going to be their fifth compulsory pit stop. They keep pitting under safety car here. This will launch them back into the field once again. Yes, okay, losing track position at the moment, but they are sitting very handsomely right now. Well, they've got some boffins down there at Garth Walton Racing running those cars. They'll be on the radio to Kavich to try and understand what's going on, but... Well, speaking of that, they've got Matt Harvey running the strategy for them this weekend, and Matt has an enormous amount of experience when it comes to GT3 racing overseas. He's done the Nürburgring 24-hour. He won Petit Le Mans last year, works with Craft Bamboo Racing and also the WeatherTech Mercedes over there, and he is calling this race strategically perfectly right now. We've seen it in the 12-hour uh, the race, haven't we? We saw cars that had 16-odd stops, and you think there's no way they're in it. All of a sudden, in the last hour, they pop out as being a contender. So that's what we love about this race. That's why we enjoy it. We enjoy the strategy. We enjoy the battles. And trying to get your head around who, what, where, when as the day goes on is certainly a challenge. Um, under the safety car conditions, it certainly gives them the opportunity to think about it, take a breath, look around, look at the damage. What are we going to do with tyres? What are we going to do with the fuel? And, uh, and see what they're going to do down in pit lane. And we'll go down to Noons and see what else he's got for us. 
Yeah, Bugs, we've just stopped in at Garth Walden Racing. Garth himself uh, was just talking to Thomas Randall. Thomas, what's the story here with 92? Is this control alt delete or what's the story? I think so. It's, it actually happened to me twice on the formation lap. It just goes into some limp mode. We don't really know why. It doesn't bring up an alarm. It just goes straight to seventh gear and there's nothing you can do but reset it. You literally have to stop, turn the car off, power cycle and get it back going. So I don't know why it's doing it, um, but yeah, it's very frustrating. Has this happened at all in the lead-up practice qualifying or has it taken the continual running in the heat of the day to, to maybe create this? I mean, yeah, it hasn't done it at all leading into the weekend and it did on the on the warm-up lap. Like, it didn't, it didn't do it to the grid, it just did it straight away on the warm-up lap and then I had to park it, reset it, then it did it later in the warm-up lap, park it, reset it and then it's done it for Ben as well. So the good thing is, I guess, if it's going to happen, you'd rather it happen in a safety car but we've lost a chunk of time so uh yeah fingers crossed we can stay on the lead lap and there's another safety car that um we can get back up there chin up we'll see you a bit later thanks mate cheers gotta love production cars don't you gentlemen all these little niggling issues that pop up throughout the course of the day and unfortunately another one there just a slight issue once again but interesting that that car was doing it on the formation lap as well which was fascinating as we ride on board here with the Lillis muggleton Callahan machine, Nathan Callahan behind the wheel at the moment, second overall right now. And interesting to note, he is right behind the race leader in Matic Charter for this restart. So there'll be no cars, no lap cars, at least in between first and second here. Dean Campbell third overall, Ben Gobbersall fourth, Ewan fifth, Old Quinn Solteri, Lo Icono, Nash Morris complete the top ten. The field is completely jumbled up with the a massive amount of pit stops and different strategies that's unfolding in this race at the moment. And I wonder if we'll get that car park like we saw on the previous restart towards the top of Mount Panorama once again. Riding on board here with Simon Hodges. He'll get set for this restart further on back through the field. The only car in the field at the moment that's done five compulsory pit stops as Matty Charter brings us back to the green here. Resumption of play at Mount Panorama with three hours and 49 minutes left in the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour for 2024. And your leaders are all at the front of the field. Watch for Campbell here, third in the line there. I would dare say might take that class X car to the lead here in a moment. So they got an interesting situation after all that. Position one, two, three, four are on the road in position one, two, three, four. So the uh, Camaro there just going to uh, try and find a way past the BMW. We're going to have a Camaro to lead the race for the first time here at the Bathurst Six Hour. This is historic as the Camaro ducks up the inside of the BMW, but right behind him is the next class car. So I don't think it's going to last long, but we've certainly got a big V8 out in front. Campbell squeezing up the inside of Matt Charter. He races supercars. He's well switched on to this stuff. Three different styles, different classes of cars at the pointy end of the field. This is what's so good about the Bathurst Six Hour. What a drive this has been from Matty Charter to haul this thing to the front of the field after Pete O'Donnell started. But now Nathan Callahan leads the race. So the Chevy Camaro in front for the first time. We expect this car by the time they get to the bottom end of Conrad might well be in front. But across the top, Callahan will drive this car very, very quickly. Still yet to see Josh Muggleton jump behind that wheel, so he'll be in there as well. They're another combination with three drivers. Closing up right behind uh, the Dean Campbell car is also uh, Gomesel in the Mustang. So there's first, second, third, fourth on the road. The Gomesel Seaton Mustang has closed right up behind. There's a little bit of pace that Dean Campbell's lost across the top of the hill there, a good second and a half or so into it. But when we get to the straight, that uh, 118 car will certainly come to the fore. Although, as I say that, the Mustang's ducked down the inside under brakes. Great move there by Ben Gomsell. He's now got himself into P3. So we've got an A2 car in the lead. We've got a B-class car in second outright, followed by another A2 car. And then we've got an X-class car in fourth on the road. How good does that Camaro sound, by the way? Hauls the mail down the straight too. This has been a very good lap from Callahan. Young Ben Gomesell, son of Jason Gomesell, who's been in the sport for such a long time. Still races in his own right. A couple of cool supercars in the collection. He's had an involvement in the past with Matt Stone Racing. Now with Gomesell Motorsport. He and Aaron Seaton have raced together for a long time. It's been really cool to see Aaron back behind the wheel. He sort of stepped back from pursuing the professional driving career this year. Decided to focus on 
behind the scenes building Gomisel Motorsport in a more managerial role, but showed everybody in qualifying, punching out a 24 and a four Mustang, how good he still is. Dad Glenn on the tools looking after the car as well. And that's the battle for the race lead. So Dean Campbell back to fourth, first of the Class X cars. Michael all behind them in the 24 car. Remember, that's the car that Tyler Everingham started. Brown and Morris drove in the second stint. So they're onto their third driver. Well, this is what we predicted, wasn't it? At the start of the day, we looked at the grid and went, mm, these are A2 cars, two less pit stops. Their strategy, as the day goes on, may play into a strange and exciting outright result. Now we've got them up right at the front. The B-Class car, it's doing a very good job there with Matt Charter and the wheel, but his fastest laps are 31.5, so, which actually was on that last lap. He actually did his fastest lap of the race with the Mustang behind, which has also now gone its fastest uh, sector of the race. So the pace is heating up, boys. The pressure's on. The Camaro in front at a 29.6. The uh, Mustang of Gomisell at a 29.7. So those cars only a tenth of a second apart and actually pulling a little bit of a gap on Dean Campbell in P4. First time really this weekend, we have got a little bit of cloud cover at the moment as well, which is probably helping with the pace of this race at the moment. Confidently said at the start of the weekend that we would see no rain this weekend. I hope I'm not gonna eat my words by the end of this six hours here this afternoon. It'll be half my luck, I reckon. Let's find out about our Class E contenders, Ben Bargwan, is following that story. Yeah, I'm here with uh, Troy Williams, team manager of Car 76. Look, we're in the garage, the car behind us. Really disappointing. Tell us what happened. Uh, unfortunately, we just uh, lost the clutch. Um, we replaced one earlier in the weekend, um, so used up our spare. Um, and now again, just in the race, not sure why, but we've lost the clutch again. So very disappointing for the team. Liam Moyes did a fantastic job in, in stint one. Um, you know, Class E is a battle this year with four Mazdas, you know, so really punching it out with the other Mazda teams. And it just seems this garage, it's, um, it's not our weekend. So the, the Starlight Foundation team replaced an engine overnight. Um, so none of their crew have had any sleep. Um, you know, we've all been mucking in together to get both cars on the grid, so... They talk about the mountain curse and, you know, the gods up here and it seems they're just not in our favour this weekend, unfortunately. Look, unfortunately that's motorsport and sometimes that's how it goes, but will we see you back next year? Oh, absolutely. No true fan of motorsport can stay away from this place, so I'm sure we'll be back. That's what we love to hear. Thank you. Back on with Troy Williams, little team that could for the Mazdas. They bought their spare car for a couple of grand early in the week and Still had 11 months of rego on it, but I think they've pilfered some parts off it. So I don't know if they'll be able to on-sell that tomorrow as this fight continues. So Ben Gomisell has worked his way to second out right now. So A2 cars, which is the high performance, normally aspirated class in this race. So no forced induction turbo or supercharging. They lead the way, Camaro and Mustang one and two. Reverse order of how they qualified. Matt Charter back in third place now with Dean Campbell still just behind in car 118, leading the way in Class X, which is the extreme performance cars. Michael Old next. Tim Lays, drag car 23 up to sixth position, having made their third compulsory pit stop for the race. And the other one we're just looking at for car number one, and I think it might have actually just switched over, was it was still showing George Medici on 11th position at the moment for car number one. It's showing George Medici on our timing, but that's uh, Simon Hodges behind the wheel. George has jumped out. There's a little uh, button they need to push, Jason, when they get in the car. It's part of the sort of pit stop sequence when you get in and out and hit the driver ID button to tell timing who's actually behind the wheel. Yeah, three little buttons on your dash there. Gives you the opportunity to, to communicate. So we're, all of us up here, in, uh, in obviously in commentary and race control, knows exactly who's in the car. We saw the driver change. We know that's not uh, how it is at the moment. But I just noticed as just the, those cars went across the top of the hill, the fans are up out of their camp chairs. We've got flags waving. We've got a Camaro versus a Mustang at the front of this six-hour battle. Listen to those V8s. Classic Bathurst. This is exciting. And I know that uh, they've worked pretty hard down there getting some stops out of the way with these A2 cars. So that's certainly going to play out as the day goes on, which is exciting. And they're opening up a really good gap against Dean Campbell. There's no doubt that Dean Campbell car's faster. He's just nursing that car at the moment. But uh, 
running up very quickly behind him is a very fast Tim Lay, who's currently setting some of the fastest lap times out there on the track at the moment. So now he's got his way through some of that traffic. He's got um, Tim Lay there, Michael Ald in the car behind in the 24 car. So that's battling for position. They're dragging their way up to the Dean Campbell car to get back into this equation. The tortured squeal of tyres you heard wasn't from the Camaro, by the way. It was from Jackson Rice, who's behind the wheel of the Osborne Motorsport Renault and pressing on very hard. He's got the leaders coming up on him, so he needs to just be cautious of that. But that's the, the screech from the front wheel drive Renault down at Osborne Motorsport. Nates. Uh, good timing, Rich. I wanted to talk about Osborne Motorsport Renaults. So we've talked all day about donor cars, the parts that are ready in case anything goes wrong with what's on the track. Ta-da! This is the Osborne Motorsport Renault. No stickers, no numbers, nothing. This is all about parts. It's ready to grab if they need to get anything for car number 31. I might grab Colin Osborne, who's hanging around here in the sidelines. Um, uh, donor cars, they're a thing at the six hour. We've been talking about it in our telecast. It's like having a mobile spare parts division here. Well, that's exactly why you've got it here. You know, because they are essentially production cars, if you need a production part, you know, that's one of the things that you've got to keep then at least you know you've got one. And you've got one of everything. Is this sort of one of those deals where you can sell it for a profit afterwards? Because I've heard that's going on up and down pit lane this weekend. Uh, well, we don't engage in that sort of behaviour, but I'm sure somebody would. It's motor racing. Stuff happens. Hey, just quickly too, this team was supposed to run two cars with Colin and Zach and Rick Bates. If you've not been watching our telecast over the weekend, the sister car 13 had a crash yesterday. It's out for the weekend and not racing today. And that, that brings to an end 35 years for you. You've decided... A tough decision, but you're going to give it away. Yeah, look, it, it, I've been, you know, my heart has been wrestling with my head for the last couple of years about this, and eventually my head's won. Um, it, I think it's the right time. I, I don't want to hang around to be to the point where people say we should have get, given it away years ago. And there's a few other things that, you know, I, I want to do, but this weekend's been a bit like reading a long and relatively good book where the last chapter is just a real letdown. <laughs> It's been a very good book, though. A very good book. Yeah, look, there's been some some achievements of which our team's really proud, including 24-hour, 12-hour and 6-hour wins, Australian championships and racing overseas and all those sorts of things. So I've um, really enjoyed it. I really need to thank the people that have made that happen over 35 years, and we did a quick calc the other day, and there's been more than 100 people, you know, working this team over 35 years, so... Yeah, it's, um, it's a sad day, but I'm, I'm, I think I've made the right decision. You've got a funny feeling. We're still going to see him around racetracks watching on. Over 100 drivers have been through this team over the years with Mazdas and Salikas, even a Suzuki Swift back in the day in the first 12-hour. Colin was right there in among that first Easter Classic. It's an incredible story, isn't it? And great to hear from him down there in the lane. And geez, it's almost getting emotional up here at the commentary box having to listen to that one but he's done such good things for young drivers in the sport hasn't he because he's got the two Bates boys there this weekend Rick obviously Zach Bates coming up through the ranks as well so good to see that you know he's been a massive hand in helping some of those youngsters in the sport as well so we're rolling through this race at the moment two hours and 20 minutes of the elapsed time we're not too far away in fact from reaching that halfway point in the high tech Isles Bathurst six hour here for 2024 it's gone through very, very quickly right now. We've had plenty of lead changes to speak about. So let's run you through the story so far. And wasn't it drama field? This Camaro is starting to really make its way up through the front of this race. And unfortunately, contact for the number nine earlier on that we would see shortly after have quite a significant shunt into the wall. There was even more dramas though. Suspension failure for one of the Class X, the only HSV in the field for Brock Giblin. And that is for the Class X machine. And then I mentioned Tyler Mecklen right front. Failure in that car after hitting that wall and makes big contact just past the grate. That would bring out yet another safety car and change up the strategy in this race. Thankfully, he was able to jump out of that car and was all right. But heavy, heavy right front damage to that car as it came to a halt just on the entry there to McFilmy Park on the left-hand side. Some of the battles that we've seen on restarts have been incredible. The 81 machine locking up, they would go and have yet another tyre failure. But it was in the forest elbow that all these cars were almost just about on the anchors trying to get through some of these slower cars. You could not move just about. Watch George Medici here. 
almost at walking pace trying to get through some of those slower cars on those restarts. And unfortunately, the 88 machine, the Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 10 makes heavy contact with the wall on driver's left. Got it wrong, getting up on the kerb. Unfortunately, their day was done. Alice Buckley, contact earlier on at one of the safety car restarts, buckled that front bumper, goes into the kitty litter at the chase, and yet again, another safety car would be deployed because those two incidents happened at the exact same time. As it stands though at the moment, Nathan Callahan leading the race overall, and he is in a Class A2 car. That's how the leaderboard sits, approaching the third hour of the race. Callahan, Lillis and Muggleton in front. Josh still to drive that car. You can see where your favourite driver is running. The Harding Performance Volkswagen leading the way in Class A1. They're eighth outright. That's been a really solid rebound from a little contact early on in the race. Cabbage is still in the game. They're still circulating in the top 20. Class D leader Barwick and Wooler in the Toyota 86 GTS. After the dramas with the B Pro entry early on and Shaw. Tideman and Gilmore still on top in Class E in their Mazda. Some walking wounded a little bit further down the order. Cars that have been in and out of pit lane, including the number 69 Ford Focus, driven by Bacchus legend John Bow. Flowing though on drivers right heading down into Forest Elbow then. So we'll keep this one. That's the sister car, in fact. So easy to get those two mixed up. So the sister car, which has had a few issues throughout the course of the day, though, probably just letting some of those faster cars uh, head on through at the moment. Matty Charter has just brought the BMW, the number 28 class leading B1 car, into the lane at the moment. And that was from fifth outright. So they're continuing to really amp up their day. The oldest car in the field it is. And this will be their third compulsory pit stop in the race. Going back to the 92 car that's continuing to recover from that halt earlier on. Yeah, they're currently in 15th. So they, 15th, they did lose you, yeah. a lot. I was just trying to find them on the timing monitor there. Currently in 15th place. So just recovering from that, we saw that uh, that car being a very, very much one of the contenders for outright speed during the course of the day. Lost a lot of track time. And has that 24 car got a bit of a drama there? Well, Michael, uh, looks like the brake duck hanging down maybe on Michael Ward. So that'll certainly affect the braking performance of the car. Um, what One of the worst things there is you end up, particularly with ABS on these cars, you'll end up with one side of the, the car being warmer than the other, and therefore the ABS, it has a bit of a, it doesn't understand where it's at. So you've got to be very cautious once you end up in those sorts of situations. Michael Ald has been behind the wheel now for near enough to an hour, so a nice little stint here at the moment for himself. And there's still some firepower in that particular car to come later on this race. You would dare say that Tyler Everingham, who started that machine, will probably bring that car home. You would dare say Brianna Wilson will probably jump into that car next and then hand over to Tyler to bring it home. A bit of oil into the uh, B1 class car there. It has done a few Ks. <laughs> Just a little top up. That'll be right. It'll probably end up at the National Motor Racing Museum once it's all said and done. It probably would have done the most laps around this track <laughs> of any race car ever, I would imagine, ever. <laughs> there we go. We'll give that one to the team in a couple of years' time, whenever they decide to retire it. V8 Sleuth will know that one, won't it? <laughs> yeah. Dudes, you'd probably know that one down well, the pit lane there somewhere. Actually, I've got an answer for you, Jason. It's done more than 3,500 laps of Mount Panorama in its life. It sounds perfect. It's amazing, isn't it? Sounds tiring to me. <laughs> 21,600. So really, it's only just gone past the stage for the first service. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, it's, just, it's probably due for a set of brake pads by now. <laughs> just watching uh, Tim Lego past our uh, commentary position here. And uh, he's certainly worked his way up. But I noticed the rear bumper hanging off the car. So we picked that early in the day, didn't we? It was just hanging off. Maybe if the race control are happy with that, they'll let that continue on. If not, they may be giving a mechanical black flag to bring that car in. We don't need parts flying around all over the place, but um, that rear bumper has certainly got caught. It's popped off, so they can get that car in, cut that off if they need to, or wait to the stop. So uh, it looks pretty safe there at the moment. It'll be well connected. I can't see it flying off in terms of pieces, but that's uh, anything can happen during the course of this day. And that actually was a change of position just there. We saw that uh, Tim Lay now has worked his way up to the back of Gomesell. Found a way past Gomesell up the hill, and now we've got the X-Class car back into uh, P2. Although, 
He's got to do three more stops. And that Mustang's only got to do one. That's a good point this is exciting. Which is what we like. So it's, and it's all going to play out in the last hour. When everyone ticks that final stop off, you've got to have all your stops done before the final 30 minutes of the race. Jeez, a bit of attitude on that car too. Tim is hustling. Calls himself a car dealer from Orange, which, I mean, technically he is. But <laughs> this guy has had a sensational racing career. Raced in the Australian Drivers' Championship, Formula Holden, for a long time, was very successful there. And still, to this weekend, owned the quickest ever lap in Bathurst Six Hour in qualifying a couple of years ago when he did a, a high 22. It was only toppled for the first time this weekend. So he is as well credentialed as they come when it comes to this race in particular. Really good driver. He and Beric Linton have had a long, long relationship. Race winners here as well. They're looking to do the double and add a second victory to their tally. They started from pole position oh. four times. That car's not starting anywhere because it's parked against the concrete barrier on the exit of the cutting. The right front corner's out of it too. And this could trigger a next round of pit stops by virtue of what could potentially be the sixth safety car period of the race. It's not the 51 car there. It's uh, made contact with the wall, I would suggest, and it's uh, it's ended up plucking that oh. completely. Oh, there it goes. Plucking the right <laughs> front out of the car. Now we've got that sitting there in the middle of the track. Oh, and it's going to stay right in the middle as well. So teams need to get onto their drivers and make them aware that there's a lot of debris now as you exit the... Uh, and a little bit of a slide in the rear and slapped into the uh, to the fence. So, yep, that's the car 51. That'll be the end of their day, I would imagine, if he's going to try and drive that back or just get it out of the way safely at the top of the hill there. But with the right front plucked out of it, that's the second Mustang now we've seen with heavy contact with the wall. And, of course, it's um, ended their day for the 51. That was a new car this weekend. It was a late decision for that, those guys to, to join. They uh, managed to get the car out, get the team together, get a few people make it all happen and unfortunately they haven't made it to the halfway mark of the uh the great six hour race it's tyler cheney behind the wheel of that car too one of a couple of the family combinations here graham cheney in that car as well young tyler he's a first year apprentice plumber unfortunately at 16 years of age he is out of the bath of six hour learning some lessons early about this place a couple of cars peeling off into pit lane so the 24 GWR entries in the lane, so too Dean Campbell in the 118, hovering at the back end of the top 10. So too was the number one car. The number one car is just about to complete all its compulsory stops. Now it's going to have some freedom for the rest of the day. Jade, no Jader in that car, I'd expect for the last stint with some freedom in terms of strategy and pit stops. This could be interesting the way it plays out. I don't think I've ever seen anyone in this race complete all their compulsory pit stops before the half race mark it's it's the craft bamboo strategy of the bathurst 12 hour a couple yeah. of years ago where every safety car you pit oh there's a safety car pit get it in the lane tick a box get it done and it might hurt you early but it has benefits later on we're almost going to get to a critical point in the race as well in the next half hour even to 40 50 minutes when a lot of the pro drivers that started this race could jump back into their car and go to the finish so we'll keep an eye on that one if we get a safety car in the next you know 40 odd minutes again that might be a critical little point in this race let's go to aaron who's got an update on the uh, bruce linton service bmw well, Rich, it is the mystery of the flapping bumper bar here on the 23B, and I might ask Will Davison and Beric Linton. Gents, do we have any clue why there's a bit of your car flapping in the breeze, Barry? Oh, I think Will was hard on the equipment. No, <laughs> um, Will got tried passing a car early in the race, got um, squeezed into the wall a little bit. He touched the wall with the front left, but I think the car might have unhooked it at the rear right, and the wind's just worked away at it. We put some tape on it, but it just hasn't held, so... Now we're going to get the uh, saw out and see what we can do. Uh, well, we just came into the garage before and you were getting ready to pit, but Tim's missed the pit entry that time around. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, just with his track position when the safety car got called, he missed, a, missed it, but he'll come in this time and we'll uh, sort it out. 
Hey, Will, just quickly too. First stint, it was like a supercar race. That was epic. There was all sorts. Everyone was into it and forgot it was a six-hour race. I, I didn't forget. <laughs> um, I was like, just chill, Grant. Real ch chill, Randall. Chill, mate. I was just texting him going, we had six hours to get these things home. So I was definitely mindful of trying to look after the brakes and tyres. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. And when we come up on those slow cars, you try and be cautious uh, making your way through and... Uh, yeah, I was, I was next to one and he just didn't, just had no idea I was there and sort of came across and sort of pushed me into the wall. So um, it's tricky. It's all part of this race. Have fun. We're about halfway. I don't know about fun, but if we're on the podium, we might have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the beauty is you've got a public holiday tomorrow. Yeah, thanks. Let's get over it as well. So it wouldn't be a Pat Bathurst pit stop, would it, without a, a, a power saw, <laughs> some race tape, <laughs> a, some cable ties. We're going to see someone jump on a bonnet down here soon. <laughs> yeah, so they'll, uh, they'll pull in, they'll try and uh, cut the back of that plastic bar off and then keep the rest of the bar on the car. So obviously that was very lucky for them to be able to do that on the safety car. If they, it got worse, they could have got a mechanical black flag, which at that point you'd have to be, you know, change your strategy around for the whole day because it'd be an extra pit stop you shouldn't have uh, really planned for. Just looking at pit stop times at the moment, the number one machine slightly in the lane for a little bit longer than the... 1 minute 30, it was in for 2 minutes 13, so maybe possibly tyres on that car. We might get our team to follow that one up, but they've certainly got the time in order to do that whilst they're under safety car here as well. And a longer stop for Tyler Everingham. He's just jumped back into that car, but a 3 minute 53 pit stop time length. Yes, they'll gain that time back, so it might have been tyres for those cars as well. And into the lane, those two cars you could see peeling off from our drone shot were the two leaders heading into the lane. This is why we're under the control of the safety car. Oh. Bit yeah, look like, I mean, obviously no contact early. Looks like it's gone a little bit too hot into that part of the circuit. You can use the camber of the road there to really generate some grip and uh, push the car in quite hard, but you lose the rear. It's brought the front around and unfortunately into the fence. So at that point, um, obviously as a production car, as a road car, it's just plucked the suspension straight out of that car. And uh, whilst he was optimistic Going to try and get it back to pit lane. Obviously, uh, that Mustang had other ideas. So that's brought out another safety car for our day. It's, and it's created some action in pit lane, that's for sure. There's cars coming in everywhere. And, uh, yeah, getting their pit stops done. There's that rear bumper bar. So they'll go to work first. No, they're not going to cut it. They're just going to rip it off. And they're going to put tyres on this car as well, which is interesting. So they're going to roll the dice and put some new MRFs on the back of the 23 car. Real shame for that uh, young bloke from the Illawarra team based down in Wollongong, that Ford Mustang squad. As Bargs mentioned, their first Bathurst six hour and one of a number of the father and son or family run organisations running this weekend. Hopefully they'll come back next year with a year's worth of experience under their belt. So the leaders pitted. This is the Chevy Camaro. Nathan Callahan was behind the wheel. Won't confirm if they have actually made a driver change aboard that car. I would have expected Josh Muggleton perhaps to have jumped in. At the moment, it looks like Nathan. We'll still wait, though, if timing updates itself has those stayed in the car. I only saw one tyre being changed, the right rear there on the 23. So he now exits the lane and heading back out once again. And we saw that earlier on from car number one as well with George Medici taking that second pit stop really underneath the safety car to do a right rear tyre change as well. So maybe these BMWs just a little bit harder towards the rear of the car on that right rear tyre, just using them up a little bit more. Part of that too could also be understanding what the tyre is doing during the course of the day. It's a new batch of these MRF tyres and they're a fantastic tyre. I mean, we've seen them over the course of of this race, the cars can go the entire race distance, and we've seen, um, you know, how they can do the whole race on four tyres. So these bigger, heavier cars, though, they will change tyres, get a good look at it, get it stripped off the rim, have a look on the inside the tyre, have a look at the surface of the tyre, and really get an understanding of what they've got for the last few hours uh, of the day. Because as we get down to that last hour or so, that's when you'll be making those decisions. Do we go for a new tyre, uh, two tyres, one tyre, or can we just get right through to the end of the race? Go back to lap number four, and we saw the Cavage number 92 BMW set the fastest lap of the race at 224.2, which is a lightning time around here. And that was then bettered again by the 23 machine, driven at the time by Will Davis. And that pace from early on in the race was exceptional. 
And you would dare say that we're going to see that again in the back end of the race once the sun starts to go down. Keeping in mind, we're still in daylight savings, so the sun won't be as low as what it was in this race last year. It was almost dark conditions for the finish of the six hour, 12 months ago. But it's so tough, isn't it, Jace? Late in day here to try and spot your turning points and your braking markers when you've got shadows to deal with and that setting sun, particularly going down, pit straight and into the cutting as well. Pit straight always uh, is a bit of a challenge, but it's uh, the worst part of that is as you run over the cutting because obviously you're in that narrow part of the circuit. What would, I was having a chat with a couple of drivers. It was actually um, Ashley Wright who was driving on uh, Friday afternoon there. As you go up into the cutting area, you actually get the sun directly in your eyes and all you're trying to do is find that fence on the left. If you can find that fence on the left, you know where your turning point is, you know where your braking point is, and that's, uh, that's where you make your commitment. But as the confidence level builds, when that sun's in your eyes, you can start going there almost blind. You get through that little kink up into the cutting area. Once you turn the cutting, the, uh, the vision comes back. So there's that uh, 51 Mustang with the damage right front plucked out of it. They'll get that car back to pit lane and we should be uh, pretty close to a, a start. So I'd expect that in the uh, the next lap or so we'll see uh, the green flag. <laughs> Love you too, Ryder Quinn. How about that? <laughs> as he rolls down Conrod straight. So let's give you a little bit of an update as to where they sit once the field is cleansed from that safety car period and the pit stop. So Benjamin Gomesall leads this race the moment from Ryder Quinn, position number two. A lot of cars between himself, or well, between those two cars anyway, oh. and the 16 machine. Luke Kinn and Adrian Levitt, Anthony Levitt rather, has pulled off on driver's left and it might be yet another case in production car terms of alt control delete and get that car back underway once again. They've done not a bad job so far today. They are 13th overall and fourth in class right now. So still in the mix as we've got a couple of the Class D runners now making this opportunity to come in for their compulsory pit stops. So back to what I was saying. So it's Benny Gomesol leading this race so far from Ryder Quinn in Solteri in the triple two V-Dub Golf R. Just uh, Nash Morris peeling off into pit lane, by the way, out of fourth place. Uh, we need to give a shout out to our amazing volunteers and officials this weekend, Brian, because more than 200 have come out here over the Easter long weekend to support this event. And we could not do it without them. And that's not an exaggeration. We literally couldn't do this without them. So thank you to all of our volunteer officials uh, representing the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour and doing it so extraordinarily professionally as they always do. If you want to get involved with that, uh, you can volunteer for this race via the Bathurst Six Hour website, but more broadly head to the Motorsport Australia website and uh, learn how to become a volunteer. Quite literally, the closest you can get to the sport without actually driving the racing car. So we'd love to see you. So thanks to all the volunteers, more than 200 this weekend. Uh, thanks to them for spending their weekend with us and letting us put on this cool car race at Mount Panorama. And it's not just this six hour event that we're standing here watching. This morning at the hotel, you can see them out on the track at about quarter past seven, ready to go for the support categories as well. The fog was out, it was crisp in the morning, but they're out there, they're loving it. They're at their flag marshal points and they're contributing to make this event special and, and make it happen. So it's it's a point that uh, as a race car driver over the years, you always try and give them a bit of wave, you thank them, because you know that without these guys, without the support of them, we just don't have a uh, ability to go racing. Still just waiting for the field to cleanse itself here at the moment before this race gets back underway. So it's Gomesal, Quinn, Solteri, Kavic, Dean Campbell, the top five at the moment. Kavic so far leading in the X class. Liam Lowe Icono, position number six from Simon Hodges, seventh. They're the reigning champions. They've completed all compulsory pit stops, albeit six of them. And they're seventh overall at the moment, so they are very much in an early box seat in this race right now. Nathan Callahan who's been very strong as well in that A2 Camaro is eighth overall. Dimitri Agathos doing a really nice job as well inside the top 10 aboard that Subaru WRX Impreza that he shares with Harry Hayek. They're position nine right now and Tim Lay behind the wheel of the 23 machine, position 10 overall at the moment. So we've got three different classes filling up the top 10 positions and all these safety car periods at the moment are continuing to keep these A2 and A1 class cars right in the mix here. Six different race leaders so far. <laughs> this is the sixth safety car period of the race. Averages a 
about eight and a half safety cars a year. Last year was particularly busy, but there were 11 safety car periods, almost two hours of the race in the yellow last year. It was uh, pretty bruising all day at the office. And the first ever red flag? Uh, it was the second red flag. Yeah, we had, was it? Yeah, we had a red flag very early in the piece of the history of this race as well. Was that the one when the tree was across the track? Well, that was Bath's 12 hour. Oh, that was the 12 20, hour. That's 2010, right. the great wet of 2020, uh, 2010, that was. Gee, what a wet day that was. Well, and that race was won by the BMW that's second in the queue there. Yeah. Right now, the Matt Charter Peter O'Donnell car. It's probably still drying out from that day. Yes. <laughs> Lights are out on the safety car, and Ben Gomesal will lead the field to green. So the Ford Mustang will lead. He's the sixth different leader of the race so far for eight lead changes. And the Mustang will fire away into the lead. And the next car in the queue, in terms of track position, is Ryder Quinn. But the bright yellow local legends car is a long way back. Now, everyone's checked up. The Camry has <laughs> tried to do what he thinks is the right thing by getting across to the inside, but they're still not allowed to pass him until they get to the control line under the High Tech Oils Bridge. And as a result, we've got this massive traffic jam once again as the field runs through Hell Corner. So this is the car in second position on the road and the margin seven and a half seconds to Ben Gomesel. Yeah, I think the, the uh, Camry looked in the mirror there and thought, I'll just get out of the way. Yes. But unfortunately, the rules are the rules. So no overlap allowed until that control line, no overtaking. So the whole field had to bank up behind him. He's trying to get out of the way and found himself right in the middle of the battle. But uh, they've obviously got through that navigating well. And you can see the traffic jam that, uh, that we face now as we head up Mountain Straight. That's the, the number one BMW. And Simon Hodges on board trying to navigate his way through that traffic, knowing we don't want to have in contact, we don't want to get involved in anything. We've got pit stops up our sleeve. So it's just about being smart, being clever, be patient, find your way through the field, and you come across a Camry in the middle. Cars going everywhere. <laughs> That's such a narrow, blind bit of road. And TV only tells 50% of the story when you're going up there and when you get the opportunity to walk or even drive a lap of this place, you go, oh my goodness, how do they do this at race speed? So the leaders cross the top, a couple of cars out of track position here. Ben Gomesell showing a five second penalty on the 30 car. They'll need to serve that at their next pit stop. And Ian Saltari showing one of those as well. The Hardy Performance Volkswagen that runs in the A1 class is fourth out right and having a really good day so far. There it is, just behind the BMW coming out of Forest's elbow. Jim Musil started that car and did a nice job early. Those two have been together for quite some time in this race and keep developing the V-Dub to get some performance out of it. Ben Tavich there, he's uh, obviously found his way back into contention again after that issue this morning. Um, that car obviously is very fast. So I think it's going to be one of the ones in the afternoon. If Tommy Randall's got some fresh tyres, if he's got some track position here, we'll be in the fight. And uh, that'll be exciting to see. He's going to uh, now found his way back up into P3 in terms of on the road. Ben Commissal's five-second penalty. I must have missed that one somewhere. I did, wasn't aware what that was for. Um, but, yeah, obviously they're going to have to serve that at their remaining stop. So whilst they've only got the one stop to go, they're going to have to add five seconds to it. Nice little move by Ryder Quinn to put the 28 car another lap down. Gets that position done. Interesting rider who races a cup car with the paddle shifts and all that. And nicely adapting to the old school H pack with a hill towing. So he now moves second position, eight and a half seconds behind the leader. Cavage up to third, and you'd expect the yellow racing for a cure BMW to get to those two Mustangs reasonably quickly. Oh, this oh. is busy. Hodges, number one car. Seventh out right on the road, having ticked all the compulsory pit stop boxes remarkably before half race distance has got himself back into the mix. Dean Campbell's just in front. That car with Cameron Crick on board will have some serious energy about it later in the day as well. And behind them is the 23 BMW. Tyler Everingham in 24 and Tim Lane 23, eighth and ninth. So they're slowly bubbling their way back to the top, having gotten themselves out of sequence the last round of stops. That looked like an old Atari uh, video <laughs> game there, weaving their way through the small, the slower cars up Mountain Straight. One the, going one side, one going the other side. Do you remember the first version of the, sh uh, the video game Test Drive? Yeah. I had that on the Commodore 64. 
And that Sadly, would, I do. Like that, yeah. <laughs> Terrific game. As Tyler Everingham now putting some pressure on Simon Hodges. This is a battle for position on the road. They, they want to be they want to be gentle. They want to be kind. They don't want to make it too hard at the moment. We've still got over three and a bit hours of racing remaining. So uh, no risk of passing manoeuvres. Oh, I wouldn't go down there, Tyler, at the moment. Let's wait till we get down to the uh, bottom of the hill here and see if you can find a way through Simon Hodges. So a good, clean job there by the, the guys uh, battling for, where are we fighting for here? Six, seven and eight position on the road. Tim Lay just in behind them as well. New right rear tyre on the number 23 car. Here goes Tyler. This is for position. It, it feels like Hodges can afford to play this properly conservatively at the moment in car number one because they've done such a good job of pitting every time they can pit to get through their compulsory pit stops. So right now, they don't even need to worry about the track position game. They just need to keep themselves within QE of the leader and they're going to be in good shape when it all bubbles out at the end of the day. Callahan, by the way, for Camaro fans, 10th position, having stopped from the race lead during that last safety car. And now Tim Lay gets up the inside of Simon Hodges and takes that position away. He's seventh, Hodges back to eighth. The BMWs working their way forward. Ryder Quinn's just set that car's personal best lap of the race. Car number seven to 29.2. And he's closing the margin to Ben Gomesell for the race lead as well. So the patience of Tim Lay there, it's worked out. He's found his way past Simon Hodges. Simon Hodges will just sit back now, find that rhythm again, and uh, find his way through the traffic. There's Ryder Quinn on board as we head up Mountain Straight, up to fifth gear, and that roaring V8 Mustang as he approaches turn two. Uh, actually, also, well, on board, we were on board with the Camaro, weren't we? Sorry, I thought that was uh, Ryder Quinn. But the Camaro is, at, uh, is, is heading up the hill. So obviously these, uh, this car, we talked about it earlier, being an amazing, beautifully built car. And uh, the way these guys have brought this to Bathurst, they didn't know what it was going to be like today. They didn't know what they had handling-wise, reliability-wise. It's the first time it's really done any of these sorts of endurance races. But, um, you know, to be in this position so strong, so early in the day, and not really stress the car at all, it's fantastic to see. I'll tell you what, Jason, we're all fans of this car, I think. They're doing a nice job. Let's ride on board for a lap, shall we? Crank it up at home. The big V8, Mount Panorama, Chevy Camaro. Enjoy this in the high-tech oils, Bathurst 6 hour. Conrad Strait, she's pretty relaxed, but certainly going along nicely. Uh, leader has pitted, so Ben Gomesell pits from the race lead, which means Ryder Quinn now leads the race on lap 57 as we approach very nearly the halfway point of this race. But there's also a little bit of energy amongst it as well because Tyler Everingham's just set the quickest lap for car 24 in fifth position at a 225 0. There's still pace aboard these cars. What was your takeaway, though, from the Camaro riding on board for a, a lap of the mountain? He was certainly driving it nice and calmly, nice and smooth, easy on the throttle, easy on the brakes, not working the tyre too hard. Exactly what you need to do during an endurance race. Not overstress the car too much, and that's what I like about these big V8s. They're not high revving. They can use the torque and the engine. 
that, you know, look after the tyre. Um, so it's just about, you know, nursing that car through to the point where you really want to start pushing it. But lap times, and certainly we, we've talked about Tyler Everingham doing his fastest time. Uh, only recently, you've got uh, Ben Cavage also pushing pretty hard at the moment and is now right in behind the uh, rider queen car. So um, those X-Class cars, they've got to keep pushing because they've got to try and get that advantage so that when they have to stop those extra couple of times, they don't lose too much track position. Ben Cavage two seconds behind rider queen. So there is a battle for the outright lead looming at the moment. He's slowly catching rider. The rider's doing an awesome job at the moment, and this lap's actually extended that margin. Every came up to third. He's just got past Dean Campbell. Here is the 24 car in front of the 118 DA Campbell Transport Racing. Brand new car built by Cameron Hill and his dad Colin in Canberra. It's a sister car, an evolution of the car that won the race two years ago, which is still parked in the National Motor Racing Museum, just adjacent to Murray's Corner. It takes pride of place with some cool Bathurst winners down there as we see Tim Leggett down the inside of Ian Salteri. That is for track positions for fifth and sixth position. And the man from Orange gets himself up one spot. Let's go down to Aaron Noonan, who's back patrolling the lane. Well, Richard, I felt it was time for some comedic relief in this year's High Tech Horse Bath the Six Hour. So I came to Garage One with these two crazies, Tony Quinn, Grant Denny. They've been trucking along really well today in that number seven Mustang. You boys were just perving out here on the sister, the uh, the rival number 30 Mustang that you're fighting with, but things are going good here, TQ. Yeah, we haven't had a great weekend. It's been a bit lumpy, but we've just approached it in a casual fashion. We're doing it casual this weekend. It sounds very much like you, doesn't it? Yeah, it's six hours of just chill. <laughs> Is that actually... See what I mean about comedic relief? That's what we're going to get in the broadcast right now. Uh, Grant, how's it going? Are you going to get me serious or silly? <laughs> I'm just proud of us because we've got a manual gearbox. You know what I mean? I feel like a real man out there. Like, both of my legs are equally muscly, unlike all those BMW guys where they've only got one muscly leg and it looks like their left leg has skipped leg day for five years. Real men drive manuals. And he has three muscly legs, just just so that you know. Apart from all of that, is there a chance not only that you could win the class today, but are you sniffing a bit of... All right, you see what I mean? Comedic relief. Are we sniffing an outright result, or are we all about class today? No, never. No, we'll just be happy to finish and be upstairs. If we can do that, happy days, I think. Having said that, I think we're P2 at the moment, outright, and... But the, the, both A2 cars are at the front of the field, or one's just come in, so maybe we've jumped another spot. So we didn't think we were going to be an outright contender, but for whatever reason, maybe it's just because it's a thumping V8 and it's not a turbo, maybe it's least affected by the heat. So it's, it's the old girls holding out. A couple of old girls here holding out too. They're going all right today. Uh, comedic break's over. Time to get back to the serious stuff, Richard Bright. Thanks, Dean. Nice work. Tony will be proud of Ryder's job that he's doing out in front. You never, ever know what you're going to get with OT. You've raced against those two for a long time. Well, <laughs> as I mentioned it yesterday, actually, Grant Kent Zenny is the only guy that I've actually shared a race car with that I'm taller than. <laughs> so uh, he and I did a sand out 500 many years ago, and we had to uh, make the seat work for him. Usually it's the other way around. They've got to make the seat work for me. So, um, yeah, I mean, fantastic guys. Known it for many years. Do a great job and, uh, and certainly have enjoyed their endurance racing, whether it be uh, Nürburgring, whether it be Bathurst, whether it be Dubai, whether it be all over the world uh, in, in many different vehicles. We're all excited to be heading over to one of Tony's racetracks in New Zealand in a couple of weeks to Topor, the middle of the North Island. Supercars will be over there. Porsche Carrera Cup's heading over as well, so Ryder will be racing. Very exciting trip on the cards, and Tony's done great things with his racetracks. Uh, the, the effort that he's put into Queensland Raceway up there at Ipswich has transformed that venue Brisbane's only permanent racetrack, and it's a pleasure to visit that place. So, well done to Tony. Still enjoying his driving and still pushing on. And right now, leading the race. So they clearly missed that memo. They missed that one, I was going to say. We had to let Aaron know to uh, inform. They're actually leading the race, not second. Doing a very good job leading their class, obviously, at the same time. And right behind them is the four X-class cars that are hunting them down at the moment. Just looking further on down the field, Benjamin Gomesall just took the opportunity to do a pit stop then a moment ago. On my numbers, that's their fourth compulsory pit stop, so they've now also ticked that box as well. So they're sitting quite pretty in that battle for Class A too, the, the Mustang v Camaro battle. Almost getting towards a critical point in this race 
as well because within the next 10, 15 minutes is going to be a tricky point if we get a safety car because a lot of the pro drivers that started the race will be clear to jump back in the car and go to the end and almost do a double or a triple stint here possibly. So if a safety car comes out now, you're probably going to get burnt. But with about two hours, 45 minutes to go, which you can see is about 13 minutes away, that might be the window then for our pro drivers to jump back behind the wheel and go to the end. Unless you're already in the car, which in the case of Tyler Everingham, he is. So car 24, he's just got some track position. In fact, he's past Ben Cavage. So now he's second and going out in pursuit of Ryder Quinn. And last time around was a couple of seconds a lot quicker than the local legends Mustang. So car 24 is going hunting now. So Tyler's got another couple of stops to tick off. They've shown four of their stops completed in this race. You'd expect, uh, so Michael Olds been in that car already. Bree Morris you'd expect to do another stint and then Tyler in to the end for car 24, who have played themselves in nicely in this race. So across the line, Ryder Quinn, 2 minute 30.7, Tyler Everingham, 27.5 last time around, so three seconds quicker. We were talking earlier about the performance of Mark Griffith's car with Nash Morris behind the wheel. Ben Bargwan has gone down and caught up with Dad. He's chatting to Paul. Yeah, I'm here with, with Paul Morris and Nash Morris in the background. Strategist and Dad. I was just in here before with pit stop. It sounded like the safety car came out at a good time, but then there was a little bit of frustration as the car left. So you know, everything was OK, so we had about three minutes to milk to get Griffo out of the car for his, so he could have um, his hour rest. So we started out an extra lap, which means we lost a bit of track position on the on the train, so ended up at the back of the train, but uh, worked out perfectly for the for the driver time for Grippo. So he'll stay in there now, we'll do at least an hour, so Nash can get a rest, and then um, any time there's a safety car after that, we'll Nash into the end. Look, uh, I've been seeing a lot of these BMWs, X-Class cars, they're burning through tyres. How's the AMG working on tyres at the moment? Pretty good, like, um, you've got to remember this is a production car race, so we were cycling, heat cycling tyres all, all up all weekend, really, um, just putting them through heat cycles to toughen them up. Look, if you pull them straight out of the truck green and whack them on in the middle of the race without doing that, you're going to get some problems. So um, experienced people will know that. And now it's a six-hour race, so... Absolutely. Look, still a long way to go, but best of luck for you and your team. Yeah, no, all looking good. And, uh, yeah, thanks to Grupo for having, having us along. It's a pretty good race. So if you ever wanted to come to Bathurst and... Doing an enduro, this one's a cool one to do for everyone that can actually come and do it. Absolutely. What a great man Paul Morris has brought through so many youngsters in this sport as well through Norwell Motorplex up there at Brisbane, just watching the number one machine completing another compulsory pit stop in this race. I'll jot that one down in my uh, ever-growing list of <laughs> competitors right now on this machine, Richard Carr. Don't forget, class leaderboards, Ryder Quinn leading the way in class A2 over Nathan Callahan. That battle's been going all day, and the Mercedes up to third place there. Suzanne Palermo, the triple nine back in front in B1. They've had a ripper day. Matt Slavin leads the way in class C, that sole remaining HSV Astra in the race. Tim Barwick on top in class D in car number 22. And Andrew Jackman in front, car number 20 in class E as the high tech oils. Bathurst six hour continues. Moving. Ben Cavage just playing the long game still in this race, lets him go. And Tim Lay to the first sector, one minute at the moment. He's already pulled 2.1 seconds between himself and Ben Cavage in that battle for third. Ooh, we've got a car stopped on driver's left heading out of pit lane. And we mentioned if there was a safety car to fall at this particular point in the race, it would be very, very tricky indeed. And it is bang on that driving number for a lot of these pro drivers. So a critical point in this year's High Tech Alls, Bath the Six Hour coming up right now. For some of these key contending leading cars, they may not come in if the safety car comes out on this very first lap. They may have to wait a lap or two in order to plug their pro drivers in. Critical here if we get a safety car. And I can see the boards going out. No, I'm watching the, the guys on pit straight here with that safety car board. They had their hands on it ready to go. It's Elliot Cleary behind the wheel of this car. They were. Uh, some laps behind, 21 laps behind in 47th position at the moment. 
Elliott racing in the Trans Am series this year very successfully. Uh, Cody Gillis sharing this car for Rent for Race with Cameron Laws. They had some dramas earlier and we're being told it's a drive train error and that's the message they're getting on the dash of that car. So something on board there is telling them they've got some problems. It's still stranded run up Mountain Straight. If only they could get it up to the gate there, the Mountain Straight gate and get it out of the way. Otherwise, it could be a very awkward safety car. So let's take Will Davison for an example. He can jump back into the car with two hours and 49 minutes and four seconds to go. However, your driving time also concludes and continues on that last lap. So the driving time doesn't stop. Bang on six hours. You've got to build yourself maybe two and a half minute buffer, possibly. But I tell you what, looks like this recovery team's going to get this done still under green flag conditions. That's impressive. Yeah, they've got double yellows down at uh, turn one there. So as uh, the race cars are expected to do, double yellow flag, slow right down, no overtaking, and allows them to clear that. And hopefully uh, they can do that without actually introducing a safety car. No overtaking in that space. So once you get past the green flag, as you head up Mountain Straight, you can then again uh, resume overtaking. So. W yellow flags, they've covered it that under and they had decided to not go for the, the safety car. Although, as you say that, I'm standing here watching these guys with their boards in their hands. <laughs> the flag marshals are keen, they're ready to go, yeah. but they're waiting for race control to make the decision. They're very eager, aren't they? It's almost like something that we see at the Nürburgring 24, isn't it? When we've got a couple of recovery vehicles on the circuit. But as you mentioned, Jace, they're doing well at the moment to cover that with double waved yellows heading into Hell Corner. Just watching the in Solteri car here at the moment, doing a really good job in that battle for class honours at the moment. They're sitting in seventh overall, but more importantly, leading that class A1 as it stands right now. And these two, Ian Solteri and Jim Yussel, have had such an incredible experience driving with each other. They're long-time driving partners, and they're continuing to show the performance of this VW Golf R here at the half-hour point of this year's race. Certainly contenders for the A1. Ooh. They lead the class with Liam Lycono just in behind. I think a bit of a dip at the moment he's in. He was and he just, he nearly fired the thing into the fence as I gave him a wrap. He had that thing all crossed up then for a moment. We dead set thought he was going to end up in that driver's right wall then for a moment. Thankfully he gathered it up and he's back underway once again. But they're doing a really good job. Seventh overall. And here is what we think the car that's leading in terms of pit stops at the moment. They've done seven stops in this race. Jade No Jada will go to the finish here. Now that this car is plugged in, ready to go. Noons, what have you got for us? Well, Brian, there's plenty of familiar Bathurst endurance surnames at the six hour this year. Wilmington's been around for years and Braden Wilmington is in the 29 HSV. Brad Bourne, the Tickford Super 2 star, is in the car at the moment. Sixth in class, 17th overall. You made up 23 spots in the last stint, but there's a little bit of a bit of a thing going on with race control about a potential penalty. What's the story? Yeah, no, so there was uh, a little bit of confusion about a safety car. Um, I was going to pass a car, I slowed up, another car passed me, then they slowed up and I passed them back, so they've handed us a 15 second time penalty for that, so we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do with that. If, uh, if we can get around it, it'll be great, if we can't, we'll just wear it and keep going on and put our heads down and keep trying to do, do what we can. There's still uh, 2 hours 46 minutes left. With, uh, yeah, got plenty of time to make something happen anyway. Has race control written back to the emails? I've been watching the team here over here on the, the computers. What's the story? Do you reckon you're a chance of getting that 15-second penalty reversed and taken away? I don't know. Look, I, I hope so because, yeah, like the Marshall Point sort of half had the safety car board out. Then the next one sort of didn't, but you could see it at the next one after that. And then... Yeah, it's um, it's a tough one, so we'll see we'll see what we can do, and hopefully we can get the penalty overturned anyway. And uh, and yeah, but I, I just really like to take this uh, opportunity to thank Raztec Motorsports and Paul Razum for giving me the opportunity to come here and and uh, have a go at a Bathurst Enduro uh, with you know uh, at a, at an event that's closer to what Dad was doing at the Bathurst 1000 back in his era. Um, it's just a really cool event driving a. A heavy car that's got a H-pattern gearbox sliding around all over the place. It's uh, it's just so much fun and awesome to, to get like an hour and a half stint passing cars. And um, yeah, I, I just can't thank uh, Blast It, 
and statewide bearings enough for helping me get here, as well as Raceline, KYB Shocks, uh, Wheelworks, MMCR, Crash Repairs, Bowden's Zone, Brew Coffee Bar, Mount Gambia, Homestyle Bakery, mtwheels.com.au, Burson Auto Parts, Mount Gambia, and 110 Industries World well, Fabrication. <laughs> and Mum and Dad, too. Hey, I know why he named all those sponsors there. If you spin around, Steve, our cameraman, he read them all off the <laughs> T-shirt. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> Oh my <laughs> I thought he had a good memory, but <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> had a cheat sheet right, uh, right in front of him. It's very NASCAR of him. Now, Braden is a bit of an all-rounder. He's been racing Speedway. He pops up in Adelaide quite a bit in uh, Hyundai Excels over there. Oh, is this the Lycono car going slowly? Yeah, that just actually was in pit lane. So it's obviously rejoined and uh, it looks like it may have a bit of an issue. Fourth in Class A1 at the moment, so they were certainly in that battle for class honours, but going slow and speaking of going slow as well, more dramas coming out of the cutting. Emmanuel Messasama in the 86 class D car has come to a grinding halt and a lot of smoke coming out of the cutting there. And you've got to be careful because there is so much smoke. It's even struggling to see the exit apex there of the cutting, but thankfully enough, that smoke is now cleared as some of our faster cars make their way through. Benjamin Gomez saw there was just stepping out for a brief moment and we do go safety car conditions. And I would expect Richard Crowell a fair bit of action down the lane with some of our teams electing to do a driver change here and possibly electing to put some of those pro drivers back in the car and go to the finish line. Someone's getting a black flag as well. There's some quite vigorous waving going on at the start finish line, but we'll touch base on that. So the Toyota has expired quite significantly on the run up the hill and they've elected to manage that under a full course safety car. Seventh one in the race. And Tyler Everingham, the leader, 7.8 to the good over Tim Lay. Now, I wonder if you're Jaden O'Jada, do you stay out? And this is where their track position comes back to them, having ticked off all those pit stops now. Well, you, you could actually not. You could come in with them, but you don't yeah. have to do a 90 second stop. Right. Well, because they've passed their, their CPS, they can do a splash and get back out and maintain very good track position. The uh, wonder if there's oil on whatever the, the, the circuit there. We saw that little 86 uh, obviously expired on the way up to the cutting. So we'll, uh, hopefully the teams will be aware there may be some oil and so forth at the top of there. But yeah, it's that, uh, that point of the race, isn't it? You always know those safety cars are coming. It's now about the strategists and the laptops are going flat out trying to work out which way to go. What do we do? Do we stop? Don't we stop? So Tyler Everingham leads the race. Tim Lay second, Ryder Quinn third, 65 laps into the Bathurst six hour. For the fourth time in this race, Tim Lay, car number 23 leads the way. He stayed out under a, this next round of pit stops and the BMW M3 competition resumes the point in the 10th lead change of this race so far. Nathan Callahan up to second place. They've stayed out during that sequence as well. And Grant Denyer now behind the wheel of car seven, the Ford Mustang, their third. We've had some driver changes. Cameron Crick is behind the wheel of car 118. We believe he is good to go to the end. Jaden Ojeda has got some track position. He's now sixth. We believe he's good to go to the end. Thomas Randall now back behind the wheel of car 92. And likewise, is settling in for what will be a two and a half hour sprint race in those very fast BMWs. But there are cars that have ticked all of the boxes in terms of compulsory pit stops. And there are those who have not. And uh, the field need to get a wriggle on and catch up to the Bathurst Mazda safety car because we've been told it will be green this time by. So Tim Lay has stayed out. He's gone off sequence here at the moment compared to those around that have elected now to bolt in their pro drives and go to the finish here. So just looking on my stat sheet here at the moment in terms of pit stops, they last pitted that 23 machine at two hours, 36 minutes into the race. So they've been out there for near enough, say 40 minutes. They can certainly go a lot longer on that driving time. And for the first time today as well, we're about to see this man jump behind the Mustang, Aaron Seaton as well. So he's done no laps in this car yet, about to plug himself in and I would dare say also go to the end of the race. But timing not great because the leaders are in the chase. There's a big gap in the middle of the queue. So not everybody's all bunched up to the freight train. 
and the lights are out on the safety car. So a few drivers are going to win out of this. This has been really costly, though, for car number 30, and they're going to drop a lap. This could get them out of the game here in the final stages of this race, this late in the day, with only two and a half hours to go. So yeah. safety car in. This is Callahan. He's second. I'm not sure what's going on here because there's no overlapping allowed until you get to the control line. So the Osborne Motorsport car, I think, put the pass on the Toyota 86. The green flag flies. And finally, they get to the line and the big Camaro is going to gobble them all up. But I think there'll be some investigations on that restart. But this field, very spread out. It's a messy restart. And the, BMW, uh, the Ford Mustang, I should say, still being serviced in the lane. That's a strange decision to pit at that point. And they certainly uh, has hurt their strategy there, hasn't it? I mean, they've obviously, unless they expected uh, the field to do another lap under safety car, that might have given them an opportunity to get out and rejoin the back of the queue, but they were doing tyres as well. So they've well and truly been in pit lane now for a long time. Maybe they had no choice. It was what they had to do. That's my only thought, like you mentioned, Jason, they thought the safety car was going to stay out for another lap. Now, because they did tyres, their stop was 2 minutes and 13 seconds, so certainly a lot longer in the lane. Yeah, it's really burned them, and it's put Nathan Callaghan now and Grant Denyer right in that mix now in terms of that class battle and that lead. So, yeah, I mean, Aronson can go to the finish now, but he's going to have to get that lap back at some point. They have ticked all the compulsory pit stops in their class, but now they've really got to try and muscle their way back in here, and they're a long way down. Alexis Scott Gore getting out of the car. I imagine at the moment they'd probably get close to putting Steve Owen back in the car of that one that we just saw in pit lane for the finish. You see these Class D cars now battling out at the top of the hill with Grant Daniel stuck in behind them, trying to find a way through. Has to be patient. Needs to wait till he really gets down to the straight, and then he can use that grunt of that uh, Mustang to get past these D-class cars. So that's where the patience comes in. We're still playing that long game at the moment in terms of where the race goes. Grant Denyer sitting second in that A2 class and the uh, Nathan Callahan up the road a little bit further in regards to that Camaro. So we should see whether, I mean, look, obviously at the end of the day, we're aware that these other cars do have to stop. There is a chance for the 30 car to get itself back onto the lead lap. But certainly an interesting strategy from those guys to uh, make that choice of putting tyres on and extend the stop by nearly a minute. For those, yeah, I was just about to touch on this car. The youngest combination on the grid, 16-year-old Liam Lycono and 17-year-old Oliver. So Ollie, who's a Year 12 student at St Christian College, his little brother's only 16 and is in Year 11. Unfortunately, they've got the car back to pit lane, which is fortunate. Unfortunately, they've driven it straight into the garage. Now, the reason they do dive into the garage is because you can throw more people and more things at the car when it's inside the bunker. And this is a particularly busy little battle going on here because the juice, Jaden Ojeda, is putting the pressure on Cameron Creek. And this is fourth and fifth place, and it's pretty willing. And I wonder if this is a little taste test for the end of the race. And he's got two wheels. He's got four wheels off the racetrack. Just well, want to remind these guys there's two hours to go. Exactly. The intensity has now gone up another level, hasn't it? You can tell that these boys are now fighting for an outright result. Look at that. He's pushing hard. The engine hot. It's come back on again for the number one reigning champ machine. So if you think Jaden's not pushing hard enough, he certainly is right now. He's lost a little bit of car links between himself and Cam Cripp, heading back up Mountain Straight once again. But this, like you mentioned, Richard, this is going to be a taste for what we can expect. Big dive down the inside that time by by Jada. I thought he might have been a bit too far back as on his left-hand side, the Mazda, the 1-800 lasagna car comes to a halt. We might be on for another safety car. Don't say that. Oh, he squeezes up the inside Ooh. of the number 28 BMW at the kink before the cutting and he's clear. He's got so much confidence. Jaden Ojeda and up oh. inside at Reed Park as well. Continuing to attack inside these lap cars out. He raced the Bathurst 12 hour earlier this year with Craft Bamboo Racing. In fact, he was with that team last weekend. So he's got a, a little bit of a career brewing with Mercedes AMG, which is really exciting for this young guy. He did a great job in GT World Challenge Australia last year off the back of his success in this race. And man, he's chucking this thing around, having taken over car number one. Fifth outright, chasing fourth, Cameron Creek. 
I wonder if that warning light there is the, the one where, you know how you fix a warning light when you put a piece of tape over it and you can't see it anymore? That's, I, the way, that's one way. I think that's how they're... <laughs> he's going to deal with that. No, no, can't see the red. What red? Well, it's gone now. It's fine. Get some airflow back through that car. It's uh, obviously stuck up behind the traffic. Makes it uh, difficult to get some clean air. Now he's got a little bit of space. Get some clean air back through that car. and uh, But he's definitely down after to uh, Cameron Crick, isn't he? So these boys are going to be pushing pretty hard. Just Ajeda sat there for two hours. And, uh, well, sorry, he sat there for just over three hours. Watched all this unfold and said, I want to play. <laughs> Let me out there. Pent up frustration. Uh, this is a look down at Garth Walden Racing at Mitsubishi Lantern. Now, this is the car that crashed at the top of the mountain at Bronx Skyline earlier in the race. And is this an effort to get them back on track? Be a Lazarus like recovery if it is. Dimitri Agathos in the number 66 Subaru, middle of shot. Just gets up the inside. They've actually got this car into the top 10, up into eighth position outright. And in class A1, they are the leaders. This has been a well-traveled team. And then we found the, oh no, it no. not going to be a recovery, was it? It was uh, completely opposite. They are well and truly out. Maybe I was slightly overly optimistic there. You were confident, but no. Well, I call it. As you mentioned earlier, I can see a black flag being shown out of our commentary position here to the field. So we'll see if we can find out for you what that's all about in terms of a penalty being issued to a driver and a team. As you can see there, the, the 24, Brianna Wilson back in that car. She's just now nice, trying to find a nice rhythm. The Sharon car in behind. It's actually stayed pretty close just on that one lap down. So it still has an opportunity here to get that lap back as these pit stops unfold. But uh, as we can see down through the field, good little battle for A1, AMG with, uh, is that Nash Morris in the car now or Mark Griffith still in the car? So Mark Griffith uh, doing a fantastic job. Bathurst winner this year in the 12 hour in terms of their AMG. Now he's got the AMG here at the six hour, trying to do the double this year. If he can uh, and have two class wins at the mountain in one year, it'd be pretty special. I think Lexus rolls into the lane. They lost some time early on. Griffo gets up the inside there at Reed Park and gets the pass done on the Shaw RX-8. Maisie Place running all of the rotaries in the race this year. She's doing a, a superb job. Got the spare car out the back as well, Maisie Place Motorsports. They've been busy in the RX-8 Cup, which Rick Shaw runs. His son in the race as well. He's trying to get the vibe on where the lead is at. So it's 14 and a half seconds now lay to Callahan. What this is doing as well for car 23 is buying more flexibility at the end for Will Davison to make sure he's very safe on driver time at the end. Cameron Crick's now found his way past Grant Denyer. Again on the uh, track position as Ajada now finds his way past the A2 Mustang of Grant Denyer. So obviously now that uh, heating up a little bit at the top of the time sheet. We've now got one more A2 car in between these leading X-Class cars at the moment, and that is the Gamara of Nathan Cattle Callahan out there, who's still hanging on to P2. And uh, now Grant Tanya can just tuck in behind and watch this X-Class battle, knowing that they've got stops to do. And uh, who knows where it's going to end up by the end of the day. And we've got the 45 AMG in pit lane. Oh, I'm up on the jack stand, so a drum with that car as well. So two of the four cars from GWR Australia with issues. One of them retired, the other one not looking particularly healthy. Jackson Rice in the lane in car 31 for Osborne Motorsport. As we jump on board the Ford Mustang. Uh, if you're interested in the various class leaders in class D, the number 22 Next Step Earth, Earthworks Toyota 86, Mitch Wooler and Tim Barwick leads the way in the race. Patrick Navin is behind the wheel of car 77. He shares that with Nathan Halstead. He's leading class C in the Volkswagen Scirocco. Noons? Uh, Rich, you just mentioned about the 45 Mercedes that's up, jacked up in Garth Walden Racing. They're done for the day. The three Kiwis having a steer of this car. Uh, drive shaft drama, and they don't have another one to go back out. If we have a little look underneath here, uh, that would be it. And I'm not very mechanical, by the way, but that bit should be in there, and it's not. 
just watching Jamie Ussel there on screen at the moment as well. We've been talking about how, how they've been doing a tremendous job so far today in the Volkswagen Golf R. Almost understeered straight into the fence there at Griffin's Bend. He was so lucky to get away with that. They're third in class at the moment for what is a tremendous battle in Class A1. Led so far by Dimitri Agathos in the Subaru Impreza WRX. Mark Griffith in the Mercedes AMG A45 second and Jem Ucell position three at the moment and they're all line of stern in terms of the overall battle right now. They're eighth, ninth and tenth. That's forming up really well at the moment but Jem Ucell, he can count his lucky stars after that one because that was almost a massive crash of the tyres there at Griffin's Bend. Thomas Randall back down the inside of Aaron Seaton there who is a lap down at the moment so just out of kilter now and is struggling now to try and get that lap back here in this particular race as the 81 machine pulls back into pit lane for another compulsory pit stop. David Russell behind the wheel at the moment. They're 24th overall. But they are four laps down and a day of what could have been for them after their pace that they had in qualifying. But unfortunately, a flat right rear tyre, a flat left rear tyre has meant they are a long way away from this race. So. Still a while to go. I'm just trying to still crunch some numbers here at the moment when certain drivers can jump back into the car. Looking at my nine, uh, numbers, Tyler Everingham. Oh, this is big, big, big moment for Tim Lay. The You're race kidding me. leader, 15 seconds to the good and almost puts it into the wall at Forest Elbow. And then this was another almost equally large moment for Jem Ucell at the top of Mountain Straight at Turn 2. So I think he had to avoid Mark Griffith in front there in the Mercedes AMG A45. So that's what caused the moment. But my goodness me, Tim Lay, leader of the race, nearly threw it away there. That was so close to touching that wall and I cannot believe he got away with that. How many times do you see that at that point of the racetrack and the car easily makes contact with the wall? And speaking of contact and running wide, unfortunately, the 42 of Kim Anderson, that Honda Integra Type R, has run wide down there at the final quarter, 28th overall at the moment and fourth in Class D. Lose a little bit of time, thankfully not too much though, but yeah, that was hold your breath stuff for Tim Lay. Rob Zoanetti, Kim Anderson, Brian Smith, three South Australian blokes who just wanted to go to Bathurst. They race in the South Australian Hyundai XL series quite competitively and they've uh, decided to build themselves a program with Team Integra. Well done to those guys. It's been a great program. A little trip up down there on the run down to the National Motor Racing Museum and indeed Bathurst City after that. But nevertheless, they will live to fight another day. Tim Lay leads the race 20 seconds in front of the Chevy Camaro. Cameron Crick in the BMW still sits third. Of the safety car at Mount Panorama Bathurst. You're watching the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour for 2024. It's been a beauty of a race so far and it continues to challenge us as some cars are recovered from the racetrack. The 86 car was dealt with under waved yellows, but it's Elliot Cleary behind the wheel of the number 90 BMW. 335, uh, 330 I, I should say, has been parked on the exit of turn two, Griffin's Bend. Meanwhile, pit stops are happening. Tim Lay, the race leader is in. Nathan Callahan in the Camaro, second is in. Cameron Creek, third in the BMW is in. And they're going for new tyres on that car on the right hand side of car 118. Cameron Creek drops down a spot. So Grant Denny stayed out. Ojade is in, Randall's in, Browner Wilson is in. So the top seven cars on the road before this yellow have all peeled off into pit lane. The reason why I think they've done this is now if everything runs green to the end of the race, a lot of these cars can now get to the finish on one more pit stop. So if you factor in a lot of these teams up and down the lane, tell me that with some of these cars, they can do an hour and 20 on fuel. So keeping that in mind, you're sort of in a little bit of a window here of one more stop to get to the end. Interesting to note, Brianna Wilson, that's come at an awkward time for them for safety car because Tyler cannot get back in that car yet and get to the end. Nunes. Ben Bagwana. Sorry. Down in the lane here, very special story. I'm here with Maisie Place, Andy Duffin, where they've got the RX-8 super team here. Look, Maisie, how special is this to you? It's so cool to see. We love it. How special is it to you? 
Uh, when I was coming into this event, I didn't actually know I was going to be the first female owner and first uh, female to run a team here at the Six Hour. So it was kind of a surprise when I got here and got fed all this information. I was like, oh, wow, this is actually making history. And to have the three rotor racing boys here from New Zealand debut in my brand new race car, it feels very, very special. And you mentioned to me before that you feel more stressed being in the garage here than driving. Is that true? I think it's just that extra stress of uh, when I'm driving, if the car has a problem, it's only me it affects. But uh, other people driving one of my cars, I get more stressed because if the car's not perfect, I feel disappointed in myself. So we had an exhaust break uh, in our second stint, which we, I think, lost three laps replacing. My arms are covered in burns. Uh, but yeah, the car's back out there circulating well and the boys are having a ball. And Andy, Maisie said you were one of the star drivers of this team, so I hope you're living up to that. But look, how is your day going so far? I mean, what an opportunity. It's a bucket list thing for us to come and race at Bathurst. I mean, we've watched it on TV. We've had to come and watch supercars here and. Uh, just iconic part of the world and you know, to come and support Maisie and run the car that she's prepared, it's an honour really and she's done a fantastic job for us. Well it's amazing to see this, we all love it, I hope the rest of your day goes well and best of luck. Thank you Thank so you. much. Cheers. Oh, nice work Ben Barguana, great stuff, great story, Maisie's worked extremely hard both as a driver but also as building that car. Um, terrific stuff, great story, and they're doing a, a really good job in that battle in Class C in the RX-8 Cup. Little race within a race there. So one make series that runs around Australia, the rx 8 Cool championship. They come here, and it's a little internal rivalry with them with the other cars in the class as well, which is uh, good fun. So this is the Camaro <laughs> continuing to see themselves on television and be pretty happy about life. So they it's like have a different stop. pair of gloves. But it's a different pair of gloves. We had a driver change in that I car. I reckon that's a Josh Muggleton I think that's pair Josh Muggleton. <laughs> gloves, which will be good. He'll be fast towards the end. We also saw a pit stop for the Class B leading 999 BMW. So Suzanne Palermo jumping out of that car and Courtney Prince will jump in. So Courtney qualified that car on pole position in class and she's now got the job, I would think, to bring that car home in the Class B battle. So they're right in the mix there to get themselves on the top step of the podium for Team Puccini Racing, who are running three cars this weekend. That pit lane garage has been a hive of activity all weekend long. So a little reset, and now we've got those stops out the way. We'll get an idea of the running order when everyone ticks across the control line in a couple of seconds. We do know that car number seven is back in front, and that's the local legends Ford Mustang. Grant Denier is behind the wheel of that car. I would expect Ryder Quinn to be in that car at the finish. And it is the car that last year stole the win in the final corner from Ryan Kasher in a remarkable finish. Great battle to the line. Right behind him is Aaron Seaton in that 30 car. We saw that uh, stop that caught them out a little. That's put them a lap down. They're right behind the leader, but they're actually going to try and unlap themselves here and get themselves back onto the lead lap. So. They've got their stops out of the way. That may work towards them if we, if they are able to get past Daniel, if Aaron's able to clear him and there is another safety car, then he's back in the game again. So whilst they went down a lap, they're still in 12th position. They're the second car on the road. Noons. Richard, I've just stopped into the Camaro garage and I thought for a second they had an unscheduled stop, but Nathan Callan's just stepped out, but that was part of the plan. But you didn't know about what had happened with this tyre, though. It's probably good you didn't. No, I didn't know. Um, the car's been going mint, so that's that's the end of its life. So we've got real good value for money out of that one, that's for sure. It's got a little bit of a bulge there, but you guys are having a stonkingly good day. You've done your four now, compulsory stops being an A2 car. Good to go to the end. What can Josh Muggleton do with this? Well, as you've seen in qualifying, Josh is a bit of a legend. So um, I don't know what he can do, but it's going to be special, that's for sure. This has been such a great weekend for you guys. First time in the six hour with this car. It's done a couple of Australian production car championship events, but it's run pretty well without drama. Has it gone better than you expected? I think it has. Um, so practice probably as we expected. Uh, once Josh qualified it, none of us were expecting that. That was that blew us away. Chris's pace this morning. Once I seen that, I thought, wow, we're actually we're contenders. I didn't think we would be, but we are. That, that car was on top of the leaderboard there for a while. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. I'll have to uh, have to record that one. I'm sure we know some people who might be able to get a copy to Nathan at the end of this weekend. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. It's a great story. And they're in the mix somewhere. Certainly class contenders, no doubt. 
that battle shaping up between themselves and the seven Ford Mustangs. So Mustang v Camaro is a great storyline anywhere you go. Slightly different sequence as far as pit stops to go. And the, the local Legends car's got another stop they need to bowl over before the end of the race. Speaking of that local Legends car, crunching some numbers. So I reckon with about an hour and 50 minutes to go, they can put Ryder Quinn back into that car. So that's going to be the window that they'll be looking towards. And certainly... If that is the case, the safety car comes out around then, that would be definitely to their liking. Two hours and 14 minutes to go. Interesting to cover off as well, the stop for Tim Lay at the time for car number 23. They did plug Will Davison into that car, so a lot of the pro drivers now back in for our battling class X. So Ojeda, Crick, Davison, remember Tyler Everingham still yet to jump into that 24 machine. His window to get back into that car is going to open within the next 15 minutes. So they're going to be a little bit off kilter here at the moment. And remember, they tried to buy a little bit of track position back earlier in the race with that middle stint that we saw a short time ago with Everingham in the car. So still a little way off yet for those to climb back in. The Sharon Rentals BMW, not a bad job for them either. They're still a lap down, but they're back up to 14th overall. So. If things go their way, they might be half a chance of trying to squeak their lap back as well. Just trying to pick them up where they might be in the queue there. There they are. They're not too far away towards the uh, front either. So they might be half a chance to get that lap back very shortly. Building towards a restart here at Mount Panorama. Very quick replay of... Ooh, awkward little front to nose contact. We've been telling you all weekend that the battle for... Even Class E is just as intense as it can be for the outright battle, and that is proof positive of that. <laughs> and that was for the battle in the Class Lead, believe it or not. So, a little bump and run, possibly. I like it. So, safety car pulls off. Grant Denya will lead an endurance race at Mount Panorama once again. But there is some pressure because behind him, that number 30 car needs to get past. He needs to get back on the lead lap of the race to buy themselves back into contention. And it's Aaron Seaton behind the wheel. It is very important that they get past so that if and when there's another safety car, they can get back on the lead lap. He'll go around the outside of Grant Denier, who gives him just enough racing room on the exit. And there'll be a Mustang drag race up Mountain Straight. And I think Aaron Seaton will get that job done. At the same time, Grant Denny doesn't need to fight this too hard. It's not for position. Might come back and bite them a little bit later in the race, but Aaron's still got a full lap to make up on the rest of this field. And so too is the interest in the Sharon Rentals car, who have been a lap off the pace for most of the day after that early drama when they were deposited in the gravel trap up at Brock Skyline. This is looking positive for them as well, finally it might actually pay off and they can get themselves back into the outright battle as well. It's been a long day for them though, hasn't it, in order to get back into this position as well. Here's Jaden Ojeda as well, trying to work his way back towards the front of this race. He's second outright as it stands behind this car of Grant Denyer. Oh, wow, e juice <laughs> He's just carving people up on the run past the middle grade. Now, the problem with that, those two cars just unlapped themselves. Yes. Fantastic job, guys. Well done. The problem is, car one is now about to pass <laughs> about the car seven. It's about to so that's again. going to be the leader who's going to hunt the, the, uh, those two cars down and try and pass them. So Aaron Seaton now out in front is going to have to do a, a stellar job to keep in front of that uh, BMW. Hopefully, uh, when uh, uh, Jada gets passed through here on Denia, which we expect to see quite easily, there it is. There's also position uh, two in X-Class, Cameron Crick sitting there as well. And then Will Davis is not far behind them either. So they're going to have to, uh, Aaron's going to have to have the head down and try and stay in front of these X-Class cars to get that lead back, as well as the Sharon car as well. Aaron's good, but he's in a different class car relative to these very, very fast bimmers. I think the more important challenge is probably for the Sharon BMW to do the same. But it might not be Ojeda they have to worry about. It could be Cameron Crick, because he's trying to fight for what is now the race lead. So another lead change, 12th of the race. Car number one back in front, led very early. They then bowled off all of their pit stops before the halfway point of the race. And now they've finally got themselves back to the point. So Ojeda leads a lap for the first time today. And then Cameron Crick is right behind and looking to get himself in car 118 to the lead. 
Carl, Carl won in the first 45 minutes. We weren't sure what was going on. They were in pit lane. The drama was happening. Back into pit lane after another stop again. But here we go. Two hours to go, and they are absolutely leading this race and in the best position. Not only have they got track position, they're full of fuel, and they've only got the one stop to go. Richard Crowell, let's go back to Friday morning. We said towards the end of this race, it'll be Jaden OJ to beat Cam Crick, <laughs> and they have had some history in the past as well. So this is going to be absolutely on for young and old, and we've still got just over two hours remaining. The interesting thing for my mind, both these cars have completed all their compulsory pit stops. So this is a straight out fight. There's going to be no real difference in terms of pit stops once they make their final pit stop in this race. So this is an all out battle now for P1. Well, it'll come down to fuel at the end, won't it? And who can make the shortest final pit stop to get some track position? Yeah, you were talking up the fact that these two will be battling at the end. But it's not the end yet. There's still, <laughs> there's still a third of the race to go. It's a long way. And Ojeda caught up behind the sharing car at the top of Mount Panorama. Does he bomb it down the inside slash outside? <laughs> no. Sharon wants to stay on that lead lap as poss long as he possibly can. The car that's currently chasing them down, Will Davison, who is going to get a bit of an advantage out of this traffic at the moment, they've got a full CPS to do. So whilst the... Uh, we talked earlier about those uh, those long pit stops. The problem is these two have got a short stop in terms of fuel. The 23 car, a full long CPS to go. Cricky got a good run out of the elbow. But there's not quite enough room to get down there. And these two should be reasonably evenly matched in straight line motivation. This is a great fight. This is just a little taste test for what's still to come. Creek in the toe of our race leader as they barrel down towards the king. Even a production car, 265 k's an hour on the approach to the fastest corner in Australian motorsport. Ojeda has to cover his line. Creek looking to squeeze his way past. How long do they keep this intensity up? Aaron Seaton's trying to not look in the mirror at the moment. <laughs> he just wants to head down. He wants them to battle to give him a little bit more time to stay on that lead lap. But at the pace these two are pushing, I don't think that's going to last very long. What he wants right now is some waved yellows all around the circuit because that would be the free kick they need. It would be a bad story for the Sharons, but it might get that Mustang back into the Class A mix at the end of the race. Cameron Crick is not letting go of Jaden Ojeda, who is a form driver in great shape and driving a lot of racing cars, a lot of seat time this year. So he is as sharp as anybody in a very good car that is the defending winner of this race last year. Two hours ago, track position is king at the moment, but these guys got to be careful too. There's still a long way to go on these tyres. They start overheating them, overworking them, working the brakes too hard. They might find themselves in a little bit of trouble later in the day. We saw tyres going onto these cars, particularly uh, the, the 118 car. We know that's now got four tyres on it. It did two left-hand tyres at the uh, fifth stop, at the sixth stop, they took two right-hand tyres, so they're probably the strongest car in terms of condition, in terms of preparation, ready for the last part of this sprint of the race. It's a very good point, isn't it? Because tyres, even at this point in the race now, is gonna make a little bit of a difference as well as they are now right onto the back of Seaton here in front. 15 second time penalty, car 118, passing under yellow during safety car. Oh. It's Cameron Creek, the car that's second on the road. So there's no wonder he's got some motivation to get past Ojeda. He wants to get out in front and try and disappear to get that time. So he will have to serve that at the final pit stop for them in the race, which otherwise would have been a short stop just for fuel only. So that could prove to be extremely costly for the DA Campbell transport car. They go past Aaron Seaton, who had a couple of glorious brief laps of being back on the lead lap of the race and is now one lap behind. Ojeda box, crick to the outside. These two got stuck into each other at Sandown and they had a reasonably feisty exchange in the opening round of the Australian Production Car Championship at that famous Victorian circuit. So there's a little bit of heat, a little bit of metal between them. Ojeda making that very wide, isn't he? He's giving a little bit of movement. He, oh, now he's defending quite hard. Cameron Crick's got a bit of overlap right to the fence. Is this the last two laps? What are we doing here, guys? Is, is it too early for that, Jason? Yes. <laughs> that would be my call, but yeah. if he wins the race, I'm, I'm probably wrong. <laughs> 
the end of the day, look, track position's the key, but now knowing that that car behind has got a 15-second time penalty, it's high-risk manoeuvring blocking like that at this point of the race. And all the leaders back into the 26s straight away. Bang, bang, bang. 26-6 for the leader, 26-6 for Crick, of course. They're locked together. 26-1 for Davison, so he took more than half a second out of them. And Tom Randall took time out of them too. He's fourth and is actually challenging Will Davison. So their battle from earlier in the race is about to pick up and launch again. Certainly that would have got the attention of race officials up in uh, race control. You're allowed to defend, you're allowed to move. But if you start doing it consistently, they won't like it very much. They may give him a bad sportsmanship flag and remind him that he's not allowed to do that for the entire race. So whilst you're allowed to defend once and you're allowed to make a put position in the car, you've got to be careful when it comes to overlap and making sure that you give the other car some racing room. And drivers were reminded of that at the driver's briefing earlier in the week. You can block towards the end of the race. I don't count two hours still out from the finish as the end of the race here at the moment. You can certainly tell that the intensity has just gone to another, another level at the moment. But I mean, if you're Ojeda and you know now that this car has got a 15 second penalty, why not play the blocking game and hold him up? Because if he gets down the road, he's gonna buy himself 15 seconds back into this race. Jeez, it's, it's a tough call to make at the moment, but it's elbows out and it's anyone's game right now. Yeah, but if Ojeda gets a time penalty for blocking Correct. like that early, there's no point, is there? And well, or even worse, you have a slight touch, you end up with flat tyres. So there's risks you've got to take. At the end of the day, these boys are out there racing hard. It's great to see. It's what we want to see in terms of uh, this type of racing. These two X-Class cars, two of the fastest cars in the field. And definitely, there's no doubt that Cameron Crick is definitely the fastest car at the moment. He's going to have to go the long way around this time. And cleanly, he has managed to find a way yeah. past. So now he's got to open up a reasonable gap, doesn't he? And a safety car is going to kill him because even if he gets a 20 second lead now and there's a safety car, it brings that one car back into the equation. So Cameron Creek puts the 118 in front for the first time today. 27 years of age, he hails from Camden in Sydney's southwestern suburbs. He is a busy boy this year. He's racing in the Super Ute series very successfully. He's racing in the Super 2 um, championship in supercars and he'll do some wildcard stuff later this year as well. He's got a full dance card, racing with Dean Campbell. They've been together for three years now. It's a great partnership. They know how each other function. And he now leads this race. That's the first time today that that car has led. What a way to do it. Arm wrestle with the defending champion. And there's still two hours to go until the final lap of the race starts. But if that is how the end plays out, sign me up. So the, uh, str the strategic guys, this is the engineers be sitting there at the moment, reverse engineering this race from their point of view, working out when they can get that last stop in. There's Cameron Crick, big move, down the outside of the chase. He's outbraked Jaden Ojeda and nice and clean around the outside, fantastic racing. Probably one of the passes of the race that we've seen at the moment, wasn't it? Let's go back into the lane, Nunes. Gents, that fight for the lead has been epic, but we'll just grab a moment here because this weekend at Bathurst with the six hour, every car is on MRF tyres, no matter what class it's in, what make it is, what model it is. Uh, Vivek from MRF's with me. You've got it all covered here. You're guaranteed a win, but boy, the temperatures today have been a little bit more than previous years, but the MRF's have been standing up pretty well. Yes, uh, thanks, Aaron. It's been, it's been a great year this year. After being here for five years, uh, we have done well so far keeping the fingers crossed for next two hours. No major dramas, but we covered right from the smallest car to BMW M4 to the Mustangs. Uh, the tires are working so far so good, so I'm looking forward to it. We've seen a very fast pace here this weekend in qualifying and in the race so far. What do you put that down to this year in 2024? I think in 2024, the tires are very, very fresh. Uh, people are running on second week of February tires made in uh, second week of February in last week of March, you know. Uh, never happened before. Uh, tires are very, very fresh. Every competitor is happy. Um, there are small niggles which will happen because the tires are too fresh. So if you don't put through the heat cycle, sometimes the properties don't bind together and then the green tire might have an issue. But people are extremely happy this weekend. Uh, I will have a beer out to the, today, uh, which is very happy. Got a funny feeling there's some crews will be having a beer or three later on. It's always hard to predict anything at Mount Panorama, but I reckon I can pick one thing today. MRF Tyres is going to win about the six hour. Thank you very much. 
Nice work, Nerds. Thank you. More than 600 MRF tyres fitted this weekend across the 59 cars that ultimately made it to the start of this race. Class leaderboards, Cameron Crick in front now. He's got 2.5 to the good of Jaden Ojeda. Jem Usel on top in A1. They've had a great day in the Harding Performance Triple Two car. Harry Hayek up to second place and going along well. And Nash Morris in third in car number 91, the Mercedes. Grant Denyer still leads the way from Josh Muggleton, but there's more to play out in class A2. That is going to be an epic towards the end. Really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Tony Levitt still running in third position there in the Mercedes AMG. Courtney Prince, Team Puccini leads the way with from Darcy Inwood in the Class B fight with Gary Manel up next. Peter Faulkner, the son of the great John Faulkner in car 46, iconic number two, uh, leads the way in Class C over Patrick Navitt, the pole sitter there. Mitch Wooler still on top in Class D in car 22. Toyota 86 looking for their seventh Bathurst victory this weekend. And Ben Shaw on top in Class E. There's under two hours to go at Bathurst. Handle little BMW. And there's uh, Ojeda now trying to find his way through the traffic as well. So Cam Crick has extended that margin now to 4.4 seconds. So keeping in mind, we've got to keep an eye on that 15 second margin once they get towards the compulsory pit stop. The final one that these guys will make towards the back end of this race. So it's all on the front of the field. Cam Crick from Jaden OJ to one and two. Will Davis in position number three. Thomas Randall, P4. The fourth overall, and that's the battle for Class X because then when you go to fifth overall, it's the leader in Class A2 at the moment. Grant Denya leading Josh Margleton. The battle between the Mustang and the Camaro. And those two not separated by much on the racetrack at the moment either. And if you have a look at their compulsory pit stops towards the back end of this race, Josh Muggleton is looking good. They've ticked all the boxes compared to Grant Denya. They have still got one more compulsory pit stop to do in this race. They will hand it over to Ryder Quinn and the window for those guys have just opened. So if they get a safety car now, they might be good to put Ryder in the car and therefore go to the end of the race. damage work going on the back of this BMW that's been running around in Class B. John Fitzgerald, Aaron Zerifoss and Brent Howard, car number 105. Here's how this race has played out in the last little stanza. It's been properly busy. We've been rattling through the leaders and the lead changes. There's been 13 of those so far among nine different leaders in this race. Unfortunately, the young bloke from Wollongong with a big crash on the exit of the cutting tool, the right front corner out of his Ford Mustang. Down the inside went Tyler Everingham, who raced his way to the front very quickly. In a, an uncertain period of the race where there were a lot of strategies overlapping and car stopping and some that hadn't, we were trying to work out who was where. But the consistent thing was that between these BMWs, it has been properly feisty. Certainly has. It's been good to watch, hasn't it? As Everingham made his way towards the front before making a pit stop and handing it over to Brianna Wilson. Tim Lay at the time was really trying to make up some ground on Ben Cavich and did so going into the chase. He would ultimately hand the car over to Will Davidson for the final point. But how was this moment from Tim? Seriously lucky going down in a forest elbow. Probably the save of the year in Australian motorsport so far from Tim Lay. And then this great battle as Ojeda would, would jump into that number one car, get past the leader at the time in Grant Denyer, but then would go on this blocking battle between himself and Cam Crick. Cam would ultimately get through, but keeping in mind in the back of your head, Cam Frick has a 15 second time penalty that he must serve at the next compulsory pit stop. But this was the move for the race lead around the outside into the chase. Jaden put up the white flag for the moment and said, all right, you go through and let's battle this one out later in the day. So Cam Frick leads at the moment by 7.4 seconds. Couple of cars towards the rear of the field, just going off towards the edge of the racetrack as well. But it sets up this amazing battle now between Cam Frick Jaden no, Jada, Will Davison and Thomas Randall. Class lead, class lead, Muggleton oh, oh, oh. and Grant Denyer. And there's a little bit of paint traded down there on the exit of Murray's. The Camaro's on the outside of the road, the Mustang on the inside. The Camaro was nose in front as they crossed the line and he'll be clear in front when they get to turn one. It was right on the ragged edge there. This is for the class lead in A2 for normally aspirated Big V8 coupes, it's Mustang v Camaro, and Camaro in front now. 
feisty. And we thought that car would do good things when Josh Muggleton got behind the wheel. He's cleared to go to the end of this race. Chris Lewis and Nathan Callahan, the two boys from WA, have done such a superb job so far to get that car into contention. And now Josh has got the job to bring it home and he's just wrestled the class lead away. Not only that, they're battling for P5 and P6 on the road as well. So a genuine podium outright can, um, position is not out of the question for this Camaro. Bugs, the way this car's gone, it's a possibility. There's still some turn up of the books to come, I'm sure, in this race and, and involving those leading BMWs. There's still so much more to play out. These two will genuinely believe they are in the mix. Absolutely. Seeing see the way uh, some of these boys are racing with two hours to go, who knows what's going to happen at the end of this race. But that Camaro has certainly impressed a lot of us here this weekend. It's a brand new car, turned up, done the job, had no real dramas throughout the course of the weekend. And here it is with an hour and uh, 50 minutes to go, now just taking the lead. Actually, it's a good little story. The car that's about to come up and lap is the number 20 1800 lasagna. Sounds ridiculous, but it's a your it's sources, a real thing. It's all your sources giving you that information. All right, thank you. Let's, let's put a pause on that one. I'll leave now. They got turfed into the wall uh, just before what some people call Chaz Corner on the run down the hill to the elbow. Early in the weekend, did quite a lot of damage to the point where the oil filter was hanging down a long way from the bottom of the engine at the front of that car. Um, the two front chassis rails were pointed in different directions. They took it to a shop in Bathurst to get straightened. They are now hauling in the race leader in Class E. So the Battle of the Masters, well, there's the leader. So they've just passed the Lasagna car, which is a bunch of blokes from Victoria who all race in the Porsche 944 Challenge. They decided to get together. They parked the Porsches and they've got themselves in the Mazda and they are doing a nice job and closing in. And that actually, I think, might be a lead change in Class E that's happened just behind this battle pack for Class A1. Actually, all three of the Class E cars there were in shot. So yeah. they're all very close together. There's only three of them left. We saw one that obviously uh, was uh, yeah not able to compete and finish the race, but all three of them are on the front straight here together at the moment in terms of the class battle for, for Class E. Doesn't matter where you look right now, there's something going on, isn't there? Definitely a change in Class E then through that particular point of the racetrack on that previous lap through the chase. So good battles all through the field right now. Doesn't matter whereabouts it is, and here it is. So it looks like they were just caught up ever so slightly with those cars in front and had to step aside. But I tell you what, this battle for honours in Class A2 is just awesome. We told Soldier the Prospect at the start of the day about the Camaro v Mustang battle, and it is living up to expectation right now. Awesome to see. So as we mentioned earlier, in A2, Aaron Seaton is third in that class. No, he's actually fourth in that class now. But the problem he has, he's now got the leaders in front of him. So whilst uh, the safety car comes out, he cannot get back onto the front of this group unless those leaders stop and he goes through. So that's the challenge they face sitting where they are at the moment. He is catching Levitt, who is the uh, C63. We, and Luke King, we saw that had a, a control alt delete. It had a reset uh, during the course of the day. And that's currently still sitting on the podium in the A2 class. Gee, they'll have a big celebration if they can get that big Merc to <laughs> the end of the race, let alone get the thing on the podium. They've yet to finish uh, a Bathurst Enduro, that team, and they've worked very, very hard to put that program together and lots of trials and tribulations so far this weekend. Here's Grant. He's going to go down the inside of the blue Ford Mustang and put them another lap down. That's the Greg Keem, Justin Matthews car. Those of you that followed Super Touring will be familiar with Justin Matthews' name. He was in the Faber-Castell BMW back in the day, privateer runner. Cool to see him back on the racetrack. It's good to see Grant then for a moment, just uh, giving a little bit of a wave to the car that he just passed. So thank you very much for giving me that space then and jumping down the inside. For an update in the lane, here's Aaron Noonan. Brian, we do like a fight back in the high tech oils Bathurst 6 hour. I just thought to give you an update. Remember, in the early stages when the Sharon car was off the road at the top of the hill, on the timing screen they were last. They were 58th in the motor race. They are now 13th overall and not far off the lead lap. You're never out of it here, are you? They're in the mix here. We haven't seen much of them on the screen in the last few hours, but we've got another drama on track here, but they're running just outside the 10. 
Noons, it could trigger another safety car, which could be critical for a couple of cars. And uh, it will be outside the fuel window for a lot of people too, so it could be quite awkwardly timed. Seth Gilmore in that 35 machine we were talking about in the battle in Class E, second in class. So unfortunately, they've just lost out of that battle. Talked about the fact race control will give them an opportunity, but that opportunity has passed. Safety car called again. And someone's having a real big issue trying to get it stopped down the bottom. It was the Team Integra car that had smoke pouring from all of the tyres, trying to get it stopped as the yellows flew. There's still some overtaking going on this, behind them too, by the way. That's just got my attention. Yeah. Um, we've got cars passing each other down the front straight here is what we saw on screen as well as the safety car has... Uh, ah, now that would uh, be the cause of a, a stoppage. We found the fence on the forest elbow. Been there, done that once in my life. It's not a nice feeling, I can assure you. Pushing hard they were, trying to catch class leader, and unfortunately pushed a little bit extra heading into the elbow, and that's what's caused the moment there. And the safety car once again, which for a few people has opened up a little bit of a window here. So for Grant Daniel, he can, if elected to, hand that car over to Ryder Quinn, and Ryder Quinn can go to the finish line. Likewise, Brianna Wilson, she can hand that car over here to Tyler Everingham and get him towards the end as well. Interesting call here from the number one. He comes into the lane because Cam Crick has decided to stay out. So safety car called, 16-year-old Seth Gilmore unfortunately finds the tyres and the fence at the top of Mountain Straight. Interestingly, his aunt is a Commonwealth Games cycling medalist by Shell Gilmore. So a bit of sporting pedigree, but a 16-year-old, another teenager with uh, a rude awakening at Mount Panorama showing how tough this place can be. Car number one in the lane. One hour, 45 minutes remaining. It won't make the end on fuel. No, they'll have to stop again, surely. So it's interesting to see why they took this opportunity because clearly they uh, put fuel in at the same time as Crick, so the, the fuel levels are very much the same. Um, but to be able to in-pit lane at the moment, I saw a little bit of damage on that car as it came down pit lane. Maybe they want to check that out, but uh, certainly when it comes to an hour and 45 to go, I don't think they're going to make it. The other thing for mine, Cameron Crick had the better part of 10 seconds, which now disappears. And remember, they've got a 15-second time penalty to serve. That's why. That's why, Brian, you've just picked it on the screen. You can see the car one putting right-hand tyres. At least one tyre on the back of that car, they've opted to go for some rubber. So they want to put themselves in a very strong position. They'll take the safety car. That means there's a green flag stop later. Green uh, racing stop that can only be a short one. Just top it up for fuel. Interesting. <laughs> very interesting. Like you said, if this race does go green at the end, then maybe that little tyre stop. It looked like right rear only, but it's an interesting call to pull that underneath this safety car, which might mean that their final pit stop late in the day might be a little bit shorter because they not, might not do a tyre stop, so to speak. So, Matty Harvey, who's down there, very experienced strategist, will certainly be making that call. And I dare say, he's got something worked up in amongst that calculator and that computer of his that might just be the golden little egg towards the back end of this race. The 75 Volkswagen Golf peels into the lane, so they've dived into the garage to get some work at it. You're only allowed a finite number of people over the orange line that delineates the garages and the working lane in pit lane. So in endurance racing, you'll often see them elect to peel off into the garage instead to get all the work done nice and quickly. Interestingly, there's a regulation this year that if you need to start restart the car with outside assistance, you have to push it into the garage to do so. So if it stalls and you can't refire, and that was a concern with the heat soak that was such a, a talking point coming into the race with those turbocharged cars, that if you want to put a jump battery on it or, or any other means of getting it fired up, you need to do that in the garage. So it was a particularly time uh, expensive thing. Anthony Levitt's in the lane in the Mercedes AMG out of ninth outright and third in the A2 class. So they're completing another pit stop. Now, I'm interested to hear from the team if we can about that decision to peel car number one off in and exactly what they think. Not that I believe for a second they'll give us a straight answer as to uh, how far they can go 
into the race before needing to put fuel in. So the last proper green flag sequence that we had in terms of compulsory pit stops in Bathurst 6A, you've got to go all the way back to 2022, and that was the Tom Sargent Cam Hill car. They did an hour and 17 minutes under green flag conditions. If you get a number of safety cars, hmm, I'm just going to point that one out there, but I'm still not certain that even an hour and 45 on fuel to get to the end with some safety car intervention is going to be enough. You're not going to invent 25 minutes of no. fuel. I wouldn't have thought at this point of the race, no. at any point of the race. So Crick stayed out for that reason. They're just going to go flat out until that final stop. Just as that safety car is crossing in front of the uh, control line there, I've just noticed that Levitt's made it back out of pit lane. So they've come in. That was the battle for the podium. If Aaron Seaton had got past, that would put him on the, the podium in that A2, but that Mercedes ducked out just in front of the safety car. So it's got a chance now to drive around and get back on the queue, which is going to make it very challenging for the 30 car to pass it. Got to beat the pace car. Got to beat the pace car or the race is over. As you can see there, what they do as the pace car goes past, the safety car goes past, they close the pit lane exit. So you've got to beat it. You've got to rush to the end. When the uh, train goes through, they then release the cars out of pit lane. With an update from the lane, here's Ben Barguana. Just to add some drama to this race, like there hasn't been enough already, I'm down here, car 118, with Cameron Hill, 15-second time penalty. What are your thoughts? Well, we just can't understand at the moment. Um, there was a car that was slowing, coming to a stop. He waved multiple cars through, and we've caught 15 seconds. Uh, you know, race control, we're, we're trying to talk to them, so... Um, Frustrating. Cam's got the speed, though. Um, we just need a few things to fall our way. Anything can happen, I guess. We'll wait and see. Still a decent amount of time to go. The car looks fast. Can you serve the time penalty under the pit stop, or are you going to still try to fight it before you do that? I will keep talking to race control, um, but we have to do the penalty under green if we're going to do it at the pit stop. So uh, it's been a lot of safety cars, but well, fingers crossed. Well, best of luck. We hope you uh, can get through it. Cheers, thanks. Ben Bagwana with Cameron Hill and the Merc has stopped. Now, it has done this before today on two other occasions. So they're hoping third time's a charm and they can get it rebooted and going again. Third in class at the time in class A2. So we play the waiting game as to whether or not that car will get back underway. A couple of pit stops in the meantime. Brianna Wilson has come back in, done a driver change. Tyler Everingham will be back in that 24 car as he exits the lane. And he will now go to the finish in that car, but still with an hour and 40 minutes to go, you would expect one more pit stop for those guys as well. Grant Denyer has stayed aboard the number seven at the moment in the battle in class A2 and fifth overall. Keeping in mind, the window has opened for Ryder Quinn to jump back into that car and go to the finish as well. But I dare say that Grant's probably going to try and get that car into a fuel window to get them home and only do one more stop because still they do need to tick off their fourth and final compulsory pit stop for Class A2. At AMG, Tony Levitt will get out and push that car to the line <laughs> to make it to the finish if he has to. They are so desperate to get that car to the finish jump on board. Courtney Prince on the triple nine. So they've been having a really good day. 15th outright at the moment on that car. And they are leading Class B. Turning that second from last year into a first this year. Well, and the car that's second in class at the moment is the 143 Subaru, which won the class 12 <laughs> months ago. So there's a little turnaround between those two. There's quite a good margin between them at the moment, although that will close under safety car. Braden Wilmington's in the middle of that mix for the battle for Class B. Courtney's done a superb job, as has Team Buccini, to get themselves into class contention. And we're going to go back to racing this time by. So when I spoke to Cam Hill earlier, earlier on in the week, he told me that that car, driven by Cam Crick at the moment, could do probably just over an hour on green flag alone. And when I told him, well, there's some other cars up and down the lane that are saying an hour and 20, he went, no, surely not. <laughs> so he reckons because they've got a little bit of a smaller tank in that car, so still the window definitely not open for that 118 machine. And as we mentioned, they're still going to have to serve that 15-second time penalty at and their final stop. And it's worth remembering, they can't do that under a safety car period. Mm. So it has to be either be in a green stop or it'll be added at the end of the race. Yep. So really, it's really hurt their opportunity. They're going to fight that. Um, clearly, if a car is going slow, 
the busy opportunity to go past it under those conditions, but they'll have to look at the evidence they've got. But he's taken the opportunity to open that gap again because he's the lead car, the green flag's out, he's off and running, and the cars behind have to now wait until they get past the control line. P2 and P3, that's the uh, Linton car with Davison at the wheel, and of course the Cabbage car with Randall at the wheel, and now fighting for that podium position, which really, looking at the time penalty, is actually for the lead of the race. Josh Muggleton behind them in the Camaro is the next car in the running order. Then it's Grant Denny, then it's Jaden Ojeda. But remember, they took the opportunity to pit 10 pit stops for car number one. They've been in the lane 10 times in four hours and 21 minutes. And yet somehow they're probably still the favourites for this race at the end. And if you can't work that at home, don't worry. We sort of can't either, but that's the way this race plays out. Well, what they've done is they've continued to take the opportunity under safety car, just keep topping the car up. They're, they're pushing their final pit stop deeper and deeper in the race, which means it's going to be shorter deeper in the race as well. 100%. As he squeezes up the inside, that's right, um, uh, Grant Daniel, I should say, just in front, the bright yellow tail of the local Legends Ford Mustang. So I think he'll get them relatively quickly, and then he'll go out after the Supercars boys in front. Oh, that was very close. And three wide, Ojeda <laughs> squeezing up the inside. That was incredible. And somehow he's emerged out the other side, but for a moment they were three abreast on the run past Solomon Park. Yeah, Jada had two wheels of the dirt there. Uh, yeah, obviously trying to make sure we get that done. He was on the right side of it, but certainly puts the pressure. And this is what happens when you make those decisions. Bury yourself in the field. That risk comes back again in terms of those overtaking maneuvers with the slower traffic. Oh, I mean, the juice and two wheels in the dirt at this place is pretty much standard operating procedure because it won in the race last year with that big pass on Conrad straight when he needed it. Cameron Crick right now is on lap record pace. It's already gone in this race. Will Davison 224-0, but Crick set the quickest first sector of the entire car race so far on lap 88. So he's pressing on out in front. He's got 4.2 seconds over Davison. And they are vital, vital seconds. Bearing in mind, he's got a 15 second time penalty to serve. Lap time check as they cross the line. 2.24.1, it's the quickest lap of the race for that car. On lap 89, Cameron Crick is flying and he needs to. The whole race could rely on this next stint. He has to build a margin to get 15 seconds somehow magic out of it so he can pit and still be in the game at the end if it goes green all the way so where he's lucky he has done his compulsory pit stops so when he does pit the 15 seconds will be added if it's under green then he can take whatever fuel he needs to get to the end now at one minute 33 we, we estimate that they can't really go much more he's not going to stop in the next 33 minutes so no. depending on what happens um, in terms of safety cars it's certainly going to be a, an interesting way it's going to play out you can see that Class D car had that big slide, and there's Ojeda down the grass, got the job done. He's pretty cool about it, no stress. Oh, this I suspect will be an exciting onboard. Just watch and listen to this. No stress, oh, easy. <laughs> right, <laughs> mate. No worries. Oh, he does things that just make you step back and go, how on earth is that possible, Baron? It's that time of the day that the mice are starting to get into the machinery. The 29 HSV has just come in in the last minute or two. The car that uh, Braden Wilmington was behind the wheel of, they've got a, a misfire with this car. And I want to take you next door as well because it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a dead car park in here. Have a look at all these cars. The 78 Astra, that was out earlier in the day. We've got the 35 Mazda that crashed at the top of the hill before. The Class Eka, they're pretty keen to get that back in the game because there's a class podium on the line. And have a look at this, the 75 Volkswagen. They've got a gear selection issue with that. I was just having a chat to the boys who've been steering it. They've lost fourth and sixth gear. It's a very long track to drive around here in first, second and third in a Golf. Oh, just stick it in the high gear. It'll be all right. <laughs> I had to finish the 12 hour once with a handbrake because I had no brakes left. Oh, in really? The car. So that was in the. Uh, Whoa. The, uh, here we go. I've got a bit of a move going on here. Josh Muggleton, he's had a look at the uh, number one car. 
Both they both, both gobbling up the 91 Mercedes AMG of Mark Griffith and Nash Morris at the same time as that position change. So Ajada goes to fourth now. This car still on the lead of its class, still on the lead lap of the race. Only 17 seconds behind Cameron Creek, who's still punching away in the 24s. He's the fastest moving thing on Mount Panorama at the moment. Ojeda, very wide. The exit of Murray's, he got that very wrong. And it'll just open the door slightly for Muggleton, who will have a play with it, but probably won't need to send it at turn one. They are ultimately in a different race. And if something happens to the BMWs, the Camaro will be there to pounce. 5.7 seconds, Crick to Davison. 24.6 last time round, plays at 25.9 for Will Davo and Tommy Randall at a 1 minute 26.1. So Crick comfortably quicker. 5.7 seconds the margin, hour and a half to go in the race. I was, I was going to play the who do you like game, but I'm just going to leave that for the moment. I'm going to park it. Let's do that at 60 minutes to go. We'll see what our team thinks. We played that Crick game home. at dinner last night. I don't think any of our predictions... No, we were so all far, so. completely wrong. <laughs> That's what we love about this race, is the unpredictability, the uncertainty, the who's going to do what and see how it plans out as the day goes on. It is Justin nice. Muggleton sliding that Camaro across the top of the mountain. It is nice going into a car race not knowing who's going to win at the end, isn't it? Or Absolutely. not having even, uh, even a real hint of who's going to win at the end. And even when we get to this point, like you're, you're an hour and a half out, you've got the lead car with a 15-second time penalty. You've got supercar drivers now chasing that lead car down in terms of uh, experience, knowledge, and winning races at this mountain. Will Davison's done it a couple of times in the past. He knows how to get the job done. So they're pushing very hard, although Cameron Crick's doing a great job slowly opening up that gap. He's gonna need 15 seconds up his sleeve, but another safety car is gonna destroy that little advantage. So Ojeda now, he knows we know he's got that fresh right rear tire on, so he's gonna be pushing that car that little bit harder. And then of course we go back to this A2 battle. That, that Camaro sounds amazing, doesn't it? Down, great. The, down the front straight. And I tell you what, Josh Muggleton only gave away five tenths across the top of the mountain in that middle sector to this car, number one. It's a properly quick race car. And there's still a bit to play out in this race. And if something slightly crazy happens, of which there have already been several moments, they could find themselves very close to the pointy end when we get to the six hour mark. 91 laps into the race. Cameron Crick's lead is 6.1 seconds now. The class battles continue to play out. We've been talking about Class A2 a lot. Jim Usel still leads the way in the Harding Performance Volkswagen Golf R that's in eighth position outright. Harry Hayek, former Aussie international who raced overseas for a couple of seasons. He was in Aussie F4 in the mid-2010s. He's second in that class at the moment, just outside a couple of seconds, about 15 seconds behind Jim Usel. Aaron Seaton 10th now and third in class. So the dramas for the AMG with Luke King behind the wheel have allowed Aaron Seaton to get the car he's sharing with the father and son Gomisal combination to third position in class, but still looking for that lap to get themselves in contention for a win. And then Courtney Prince continues to lead the race in class B. However, has Matt Charter catching her? in the battle of the BMWs, and there's just eight seconds between the two of those. That's car triple nine in 15th, and car 28 in 16th position. So there's a little battle going on there for class B that could have a little twist of the tail at the end of this car race too. Right on form there is your class B1 leaderboard. So Prince, Charter, Chris Holt, Harry Inwood, the Bathurst boys there at the moment, and Brett Howard too. Continuing to battle it out as we've got the 1800 lasagna entry in class E, your class leader, in fact, coming in to complete another pit stop there. So 33rd overall, but still leading class and doing a really good job. And considering the weekend they've had, wouldn't it be an incredible story if they can turn the, the wrongs around from earlier on the weekend, a repaired car, a late night, and land on a top step of a Bathurst podium? So, do you know what? I'm going to correct myself. I think the Triple Nine's got a lap over Matt Charter. Confirm that for you, but I think they're a lap clear. So I think they're in a very good position. They are, just confirmed. So, um, it's actually not a, a close battle. Charter is quick, so what Matt Charter's doing, the gap's come down from nine seconds to six in the last lap. 
Chart is trying to unlap himself in the GWS car. The uh, Spinifex recruiting entry sharing with Peter O'Donnell to try and unlap himself from Courtney Prince. He raced in Crow a cup last season. Get himself back onto the lead lap in class and then try and make up about two minutes and 40 odd seconds to fight for the lead. So that'll be worth watching. But right now, Team Puccini and Young Court have got a lap on their closest rivals in that battle for Class B. It's working out really well for them, isn't it, at this point of the race as we look now at Tyler Averingham in the 24 machine. Right, Daniel you're in behind. This is sixth and seventh overall right now as Everingham gets very crossed up then going through Murray's corner and back down the main straight once again. His lap time on that one was a 227.4, so about two seconds away from what Cam Crick is doing out in front. And just on board now with Grant Denyer here once again. Oh, Denyer, big moment. Lights up the rear tyres then. Very lucky to hold on to that. He's giving a little bit of a shake in the head there at the moment as well as he looks in the rear vision mirror. Moment, lucky to hold on to the rear end of that Mustang though. That's all it takes, that one little slide, that one moment, you drop a wheel. That's why the concentration's intense in this race. It might not be at a full pace that you're driving the car all day, but that concentration is what leads to those small mistakes. Then you're lucky to get away with that one while he holds down second in class at the moment. And uh, what I can tell you is that Aaron Seaton is flying in that class at the moment in terms of where he's at, but he's got a long way to go to catch up to the uh, Grand Denier car. this story as well for the Shown Rentals BMW 12th overall now but still a lap down so when Noons last reported on them they were 13th well they're up to 12th at the moment and continuing to fight their way back in this race after being carted off into the kitty litter at the top of Mount Panorama in the early portion of the six hour here back into the lane and Aaron Noon. Uh, Brian, I stopped in at Garth Walden racing to catch up with Brianna Wilson, who's been behind the wheel of the 24 BMW today. In the game here, Tyler Everingham's at the wheel at the moment. Has it been a smooth day from where you've been sitting? Yeah, it's been it's been smooth so far, um, other than a couple gearbox uh, issues. But I mean, they, they were minor, so it didn't really stop us at all. Um, yeah, we're looking good for the end of the race and hopefully we can cross that line in a good position. <laughs> this race is your Bathurst, isn't it? I mean, you've come out of Pulsar Racing. They've been a support category here at the Six Hour this weekend. This is the one that matters to clubby races, state races, but you can share the track with supercar drivers, Super 2 guys. It's a really good mix. It's a, it's a whole pile of fun. Yeah, it's, it is a whole lot of fun. And also in a BMW, it's, it's even more fun. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit faster than the Pulsar, let's face it. Just, yeah, a little bit faster. Pulsar's um, got a little bit more power to, to make out of it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you go back and watch Tyler Everingham's behind the wheel for the run home. Fingers crossed for a good result. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. They're in the game for late in the race, and that's all you need to be at the moment. But as we saw early on, that gearbox little gremlin, I reckon, is certainly hurt, hampering their top end speed. Wanted to have a look at this HSV Astra. Three started the race. This is the only one that remains. And it's the number 46 track day car of Peter Faulkner and Matt Slavin. And as we touched on earlier, if the Faulkner surname feels familiar, it is because it should be familiar. Dad John, a veteran of the great race and Australian touring car racing right through the 70s, 80s and into the 90s when he was still a leading privateer. And we're hustling a... VS Commodore up against some heavily well-credentialed guys. Matt Slavin's done a good job too, 38-year-old out of Melbourne who races Carrera Cup now, runner-up in Sprint Challenge last year in the Pro-Am class. And that team's done a nice job getting that car reliable and they are in the lead in Class C. So it's a tough battle Class C and there's been some pretty diverse results in that over the years. And this is another look at Grant Denya, big slide. Just got a little bit of the inside kerb, which therefore dropped off onto the dirt, and that's just what kicked the rear end of the Mustang out. Yeah, the tyre squealed in the background there as well, but good job saving that one. And he continues on as well. So the final point I wanted to make on the uh, 46 car was that the team boss is Phil Butt, and there was a marriage down there <laughs> yesterday. We had a wedding in pit lane at Mount Panorama as the Camaro boys watch Josh Muggleton on from their garage so uh, it's a big moment Phil was involved in that so they've been operating that race team for some time and they've put together a nice program currently leading their class Patrick Navin it's been a
a good battle too in the Volkswagen Scirocco car number 77. So that will continue all the way down to the line. There's not much between those two cars. Hour and 22 to go. We're not that far away from what we suspect will be the final round of pit stops at Mount Panorama. The high-tech oils, Bathurst six hours, building to the flag. Well, let's get an update in the lane with Aaron Noonan. We've got a drama with the A2 class leading Camaro. It's come in for its stop, Josh Moggleton at the wheel. They went to refuel the car. They can't get the fuel to flow. So they've decided to abandon that for the moment, get the right side tyre change done, and then they'll get back to the refueling. But it's cost them critical time. The Camaro that's contending for the win in A2, top five overall. This is a real drama. They're still trying to get the fuel to flow here into the fuel lines. Meanwhile, the tyres are done. The jacks on the right side have got the car back on the ground. They're clear now of the tyres and they're going to send it. They need to get it back out there while they try to sort this out. It's a big drama. Noons, they're going to lose a lap to Cameron Creek, who's just gone through. But this could be race done for them regardless because they're going to have to stop and put fuel in. So they'll buy themselves a little bit of time, but what a moment in the race for a car that has surpassed our expectations so far this weekend and has been a genuine contender in the top five all weekend long. And they've not got fuel in this car. That would have been their final stop to the chequered flag. We've been ruminating over our race leaders as well with Cameron Crick leading the race now by 11.5 seconds. And the question was, when do you stop? We think they're right on the very edge of their fuel window to put fuel in that car and get to the end. So the question is, do you stop now while it's green, serve your 15 second penalty that you've got for an infringement earlier in the race? Do you do that now while it's green? Because you cannot serve that penalty under yellow. If they have a safety car now, it's race done because they'll have to make another pit stop or they'll have 15 seconds added to their race time at the end. But you may as well put a line through them then. This field is so competitive. I'm, uh, I'm umming and ahhing because I'm not convinced that their fuel window is open just yet. So, yeah, if you get a safety car right now, you'd probably have to take it because you're down on fuel, but you're going to have to then take the 15 seconds at the end of the race. So I reckon Cam Hill, who's managing this entry this weekend, is a very nervous boy right now because, like I said, I don't think... They're quite in that fuel window to get home. If what he was telling me earlier in the weekend, that they're just over an hour if you go green on a tank of fuel. Be more stressed this weekend, Cam <laughs> Hill, than getting punted by <laughs> rivals in the supercar paddock last weekend at uh, Albert Park. The, the risk element goes up the longer they run right now because if they get a safety car, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to win this race. As soon as that window opens for them in terms of fuel, if it's still green, you pit. You absolutely have to pit that car. And I don't think that's too far away. It will certainly be within the next 15 minutes. An hour and 15 to go in this race. This is Will Davison. He sits second, 11.2 seconds behind Cameron Creek. One pit stop to make to get them to the line, but it will be a timed stop only. They've... Oh, actually, wait, no. wait, it'll be a full compulsory stop. My mistake. Four, it will be. 23. Yeah, it, we... will, it will be a time stop. It'll be 90 seconds. Mandatory full compulsory stop because they still have that one box to tick. Now, just crunching some numbers from last year. So, Jaden Ojeda is very much on a similar strategy to what they used here 12 months ago. So, they did a pit stop. Just going back to the numbers again. at four hours, 10 minutes. Their last stop came at four hours and 17 minutes, but their second to last stop has almost come at the exact same time as this time last year. So what that means in terms of refilling this car to get home, their stop last year was 56 seconds. So I reckon you've got to put a very similar amount of fuel in that car. That's going to be the number that we'll have to watch out for at the back end here. So look for a minute's worth of pit stop time for car number one. Aaron? Gents, I'm still with the Camaro team. They're still trying to get to the bottom of this refueling rig issue. Uh, I just spoke to Chris Lillis. They reckon they've got a little bit of fuel in that car at the last pit stop, but nowhere near. It just wouldn't couple onto the side of the car. The fuel tower's definitely got fuel in it, but they're desperately trying to sort this out to get the fuel flowing. 
so as they can fill that car up when they get it back in here. But it's it's so cruel, this place. They've had such a beautiful weekend, such a great day so far, fighting for the class win in A2, and this one's tripped them up at the moment. They're still in it, they're still trying to sort this out, but time will tick out with how much juice is in the Camaro. It's those little one percenters at Mount Panorama, isn't it? We continue to hear those stories time and time again. It's these little things that you would never think of that rear their ugly head. Trying to understand that. I mean, at the end of the day, we usually see the fuel continue to flow when one of the seals gets jammed or they can't then open up the valve. But for it not to flow at all, it's a bit of an odd situation. One option they've got is to go next door and say, hey, can we do a deal and use your fuel rig? Problem with that is you pull up and try that and it doesn't line up perfectly, you can't get any fuel in either. So their best plan at the moment is to try and get that car around and see if they can repair that issue with that fuel rig and find a way to get that car filled up for the end of the race. Bathurst day and production cars, don't you just love it? And an hour to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. It's good though at the moment, and I hope this isn't gonna be my curse, but we have had a fair bit of green flag running at the moment which is good to see. We've had 25 minutes under green right now, which is, I think, the second longest period in the race that we've seen. And it's come at such a crucial point in this race, when we're speaking of, in terms of the final pit stop time anyway. So there's the Camaro. They've actually uh, made the decision to come back into pit lane, as we can see there. I noticed just in shot was Aaron Seaton's passed that car for second place. Now that's uh, a good result for those guys. However, they're still a lap down, or not actually a full lap down, but they're very close to lap down on the Denya car. So a long way to go to get back to the lead of that class. The Camaro back in pit lane. Let's have another go and see if we can get some fuel in this car. And Bugs, that might be good news for the Denya car. I've just heard from Craig Denya, a legend of our sport, one of the best motorsport broadcasters there's been as well. Um, just mentioning that that car's struggling with some overheating and a sticking clutch pedal too the uh, local Legends car, so they've got a few little issues there. They might need a lap's worth of margin in the closing stages to try and defend their win from 12 months ago. This doesn't look promising, does it? I, I didn't see any fuel going in that. They've tried to put it on. Oh, Bathurst Dramas, here we go. We're in that last part of the race. They've done an amazing job for five hours, but Nuge just down there in pit lane can help us out and understand what's going on. Yeah, delay bugs with that right front to get that off there at the moment. They didn't get that done on the last stop when they did the right side tyres. So they haven't even plugged the fuel in this time. So, oh boy, tough stuff. Tough stuff here at Bathurst with what's been going so long. As they're sitting in the lane, the number seven Mustang's just gone by. It's in garage one at the end of the pit lane. So they've now replaced on the Camaro the right front, but no fuel's gone on board this car. So it means they've sent that car without fuel, and are they just going to keep trying to run until they can get the rig to work? Yeah, yep. That's all they can do, Rich. They've only got what they've got in the tank. They won't make it to the end with what's no. in there. They've got to sort this out and find a way to get some more fuel into that car to make it home. Just ask the neighbours if they can borrow their fuel rig for the end, but... Wow. So this is... The, what will be the final stop for the game over at number seven car. They pick from the class lead in A2, remaining on the lead lap of the car race overall. And we're talking about that overall leading battle. It's actually come back now to Will Davison. The gap's come down from 12 seconds to 10 and a half. So as the stint goes on, car 23 has actually got a bit more performance. So it, it's a diminishing margins for our race leader at the moment. I think they've got to get that car into the lane very, very soon to tick that box. Did car seven go and then stall again? Ah, there it goes. Refires. <laughs> right Aggressively refires. Did it go all right? So Ryder Quinn, I would say, would be back in that car, and indeed he is. Heading back up Mountain Straight. I was just looking at times there a moment ago. The pace from Jaden Ojeda has dropped significantly as well. So when you compare that to Will Davison, I've been studying the trends a little bit in the last few laps. Davison has been almost a couple of seconds a lap quicker than, uh, than Jaden Ojeda. So maybe late in this race, with a little bit of cloud cover at the moment, maybe it's just going away a little bit from car one. 9.1 seconds now. Noons. 
Yeah, Rich, just a couple of updates for you. The 35 Mazda, the Class E car that crashed earlier, is in the lane and it's heading back onto the track. So great news for those guys. Uh, I'm still on Camaro Watch. We're going old school here. Remember days of the 70s and 80s with the refueling churns? That's their next option here to be able to get fuel into car 64. <laughs> I, did, I haven't seen that one before. Certainly not in the six hour. Incredible. So Will Davison, just looking at our timing screens here. Rich, you've pointed it out. There may have been a moment here for Cam Crick whilst we continue to watch Aaron Seaton here in the lane. I think the lead's changed. Yeah. Timing showing the lead's changed will confirm that for you. Well, he's done one minute 11 yeah. to the first sector. His first sector was horrible. So Cameron Crick has lost the race lead and all of that margin that they worked so hard to build up there is Will Davison, who we understand now leads the race into the chase. Three and a half seconds further back is Cameron Creek. Should come into shot somewhere soon behind the 23 car. They last pitted one hour and 14 minutes ago for the Cam Creek car. Are you suggesting maybe there could be some fuel starvation issues? Is that where you're leading? You're leading down that path, Brian. I'm just putting that number out there. As I can see, Cam Hill now managing this car. He is at the front of that box, and in comes what was, at the point, your race leader. But we don't know what happened across the top mount panorama. He's second effectively, making his last stop with one hour and seven minutes left in this race, right on a number to get them home. Now, we are under green flag conditions, so they can serve this 15-second time penalty, which they're doing right now. So no one can touch the car until they have completed the 15 seconds. Cameron Hill on the radio to his crew. They're counting him down. And then they'll go to work and they'll put a full tank of fuel into this BMW M2 competition. That is a long time, isn't it? That car sitting stationary. Couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, my prediction is there. They've really rolled the dice on that fuel and it's had a starvation issue. It's, it's, uh, it's coughed. They may have gone to reserve to get it back going again, but he's certainly lost a good 10, 15 seconds heading up the hill there somewhere. Well, if they did an hour and 14 minutes with a safety car intervention in that last stop, geez, they're right on the number here of possibly getting home even with an hour and six minutes to go. So they might still even be some of his faces still down there in that scene. No tyres either. So no tyres either. It was fuel only then for... Cam Crick sends him back down the lane. Feel for Steve, our cameraman, who's just run all the way down from the other end of the <laughs> lane to grab that shot for us. Big effort in warm conditions. Though overcast this afternoon at Mount Panorama. In the wall, class oh. leading number seven car. Big impact. Big impact at the top of the hill for Ryder Quinn. That's a large accident. Race changing moment all round. We hope Ryder's okay. It looks like it's just coming under the tree there before the grate. It looks like, yeah, that's about where that car's gone in. So whether he's hit the fence on the left-hand side first, you can see the mirror on the left-hand side of the car is actually folded in as well, and then it's driven hard into the right-hand side wall. So that's uh, certainly created some excitement in terms of the last part of this race. You'll see all those X-Class cars now pitting. We've asked uh, for a bit of medical intervention there. So um, we'll uh, see those X-Class cars um, all peel into pit lane because we're right in that window and it's just worked in the favour of the 118 car who was able to serve their penalty uh, and put them back into this race after they had that um, that that uh, issue. So, yeah, exactly what's happened there with, uh, with Ryder. He was just out of pit lane, probably one lap into his stint. The 23 car has now entered pit lane as we expected. I would expect to see the Randall car follow them in as well. And, uh, and of course, our Jada would need to fuel in their car also. This is actually going to be really tight on pit exit between Jaden O'Jada and Will Davison. The gap between them when they came into the pits was 28 seconds. Now, Will Davison needs to do a 1 minute 30 pit stop here with Jaden O'Jada. Probably maybe only a minute, but because we're under safety car, Jaden's actually getting balked, I would say, behind some slower cars and can't pass them underneath safety car conditions. He was 28 seconds behind. That's now blown out to 37 seconds. He's so maybe lane. this safety car hasn't worked out here for car one. We'll wait and see. It's going to be a race off pit lane here between Davison and Ojeda. What it does do is get the 118, Cameron Crick, back into the game. 
So even though it was awkward with the pit stop and the timing under green, it's going to play them back into the race. They're a minute and 51 down at the moment, so they're not going to have track position, but they will get back all of that time that they threw away and they'll be somewhere in the train with the leaders. Looks like pressures only for the Davison machine. Didn't look, look like they were going to change tyres. So we watch the Tyler Everingham machine there. There's, there's the shot there. So no tyres, just pressures there for the 23 car. It looks like tyres going on the Ojeda machine. It might be the right front. So they might have picked up on this as well, that they weren't going to jump this car because they were balked under safety car. But they might try and win this race on fresh rubber late. Will Davison out clear, minute 32 in the lane, ticks the box for their final compulsory and indeed final pit stop of the race. Both rear tyres on that car, we saw them put a, oh no, it's a 24 car, sorry, so that's going for tyres as well. So Tolling Everingham taking rear tyres there, they're jacking the car up, two rear tyres on that car. So most of those contenders in pit lane, this is the last stop, so this will be a sprint now. They'll build all on the table to get to the end of the race. Don't mind that swing to put rears on this car because they haven't quite had track position for a lot of the day, but they're going to roll the dice and give them a tyre advantage at the end, which is, I think, a good call. With Tyler behind the wheel, they've certainly got the performance ability to do it. Ojeda out. Crick's just crossed the line. And it's going to be tight between them to see where Cameron Crick comes out in relation, he's going to be third. So through all of that, through pitting just before the safety car, it's actually worked out okay for Cameron Crick, and we know that that car is fast, and they can contend. This is the scene. That's a great sign that young rider is out of the car and okay. Team Medical will take him to the medical centre here at Mount Panorama, but that car's had a very hefty impact basically Solman Park on the run-up before the famous metal grate top of Mount Panorama from the class lead. It's fantastic. The officials, they've sent the medical car. That's why we have those guys. They're there ready to go just in the case of this. They're first on the scene. They can deal with the driver straight away, understand where the driver's at, make sure he's OK to getting out of the car. And they've done a great job over the course of the day to uh, to allow for uh, rider to be able to get out of that car and into the... Uh, into the medical car and hopefully we've got a bit of footage coming up of the incident we can really get a good understanding of what's happened in terms of rider um oh that's a head-on hit that's a big hit isn't it the rear of the car stepped out and that's just gone face first into the fence we saw many years ago many will remember uh kevin bartlett rolling the camaro in the exact same place but for rider he's lost the rear of the car a little hit the curb and it's just gone, whoa, that's a big hit. Oh. And then the secondary impact as it slid down. So under the safety car, I think what's happened here is the Camaro team have put that car in the garage, and I think they've gone the old manual refueling option, which you can do in the garage, just not in pit lane. So he might keep them in the race, but... So they've tried plugging in again there now to get some fuel in it. So hopefully what they've done is they've solved that problem. Um, and what that certainly has done is uh, put uh, Glenn, or uh, sorry, Glenn, Aaron Seaton back into the lead of A2. Well, Glenn's running the car, so <laughs> technically it's the same thing. Wow, drama. There's 60 minutes to go on the mountain. There's still so much more to play out in the high-tech oils Bathurst 6 hour. So some race changing stuff here at Mount Panorama with little under one hour to go. The 118 Cam Crick DA Campbell transport car has been so quick all weekend, but that car has come back into the lane. Looks like they've almost like reset the car. It's just left its pit bunker. You can see it trundling down the fast lane now. They're gonna lose a bunch of time here and they're gonna be towards the back end of this train. Disappointment indeed for this team. They are going to have a real fight on their hands now because they're going to be, like I mentioned, you can see the train now coming through. They're going to be right towards the back of the bus here. So the safety cars let through all of those cars so they can pick up the leader, the actual race leader. Now they've got that situation under control at the top of the hill. They've now got the race leader, Will Davison, at the front of the queue. So, um, yeah, that's even worse for the 118 because there wasn't too many cars there. There was a lot in front of Will Davison. 
But unfortunately, now there's a lot more cars between them and that the other end of the circuit. Now, the interesting thing I can see here, once we get back under green flag conditions, there is two lap cars in between Will Davison and Jaden Ojeda. Keeping in mind, Ojeda has fresh rubber, at least on the right-hand side. Got to get confirmation, though, if it was just the right front. Remember, they did put fresh rubber on the right rear earlier in the race, but certainly along that right side anyway, that, that they did put a little bit more fresh rubber behind that car, so that will play to their advantage. It was fuel only for Will Davison at their final stop. As we've still got some more cars coming back into the lane here as well. Looks like Dimitri Agathos there on screen. He might be taking that car over from Harry Hayek in the latter, latter half of this race as well. Harry a little bit further deep in the train at the moment before they can bring that car back into the lane. And they're still doing really well. Leaders at the moment in Class A1 that's continue, continuing to have that fight with Ian Solteri and Jem Ucell in that Volkswagen Golf R. So plenty has happened in the first five hours of this year's High Tech Oils Bath the Six Hour. Let's bring you up to speed with what has been happening. We saw this incredible fight between Jaden O'Jada and Cam Crick. They continue to just belt at each other almost. A bit of sideways action. Ultimately, Cam Crick would go around the outside here at the chase to take away the race lead. On top of that, though, he also had a 15-second time penalty. So Jaden O'Jada kind of put up the white flag then, let him go through, and would decide to fight it out basically later on in the event. But as we've just seen a moment ago, that 118 machine has been in pit lane. Some great battles, though, for class honours. Class A2, the fight of the Mustang, and also the Camaro Grant, Daniel and Josh Muggleton fighting for the race lead in A2 at that particular point in time. Muggleton getting the upper hand, but for both these cars, which we'll see shortly, dramas for both of them. So A2 has changed dramatically within the last 90 minutes of this race. They just kept fighting each other. It was wheel to wheel through the final turn and down the high-tech oils pit straight. It continued throughout the course of that particular little portion that we had as we entered towards the five-hour mark. Ultimately, Muggleton would get the upper hand, but only just. How's Jaden Ojeda here? On the left-hand side, he's on the grass to get through some of the slower cars on a safety car restart. But this has been one of the big moments of the race. Unfortunately, Ryder Quinn getting it wrong, making heavy, heavy contact with the roll on driver's right, which puts us under safety car with just under an hour left in this race. But also, Cam Crick has been in in that 118 machine. What was position three, down to position six. Being told that car went into limp mode, which is why they pitted. They got it back out in front of the safety car to stay on the lead lap. Here's the leaderboard as it stands going into the last 50 minutes of the race. And the safety car's about to peel off to A2 leader. Remarkably, went a lap down, but Aaron Seaton finds himself leading the race. Could a Seaton win a Bathurst Enduro on a Sunday? That'd be big. And the Mercedes AMG second in class. The girls are leading class B to their 12th outright in the BMW. Courtney Prince, Puccini and Palermo have done an outstanding job. They're going along nicely. Class C leader is Nathan Halstead in the 77 car. That's the Volkswagen Scirocco. Class D still the Barwick uh, Wooler Toyota 86 GTS. They're still very much in the mix. And Mark Talbots leads the way in car 20. That is the car that was fenced earlier in the weekend. It left the racetrack to be fixed. And the little Mazda with a bunch of Porsche races from Victoria behind the wheel finds itself back in the lead of its class in Class E. And that would be a storyline amidst many that have occurred over the course of the day. We really hope you're enjoying our coverage of the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour. Richard Crow, Brian Vanderwecker, Jason Bargoiner in the box. We've got Ben Bargoiner and Aaron Noonan in the lane for you. They've been busy today because there's been so many stories. But the result is that with 51 minutes to go in the race, that is the reason the safety car came out. It's an ex-Ford Mustang now. The game over car really is over today. Will Davison leads. Jaden Ojeda, the defending champion, is second. No team has ever won this race twice. No team's ever won it back-to-back, -back, for that matter. Hodges and Ojeda won it last year. The car that Will Davison is driving, he shares with Berwick Linton and Tim Lay. They won this race in 2019. So there's a bit on the line to become the first repeat winners of the Bathurst Six Hour, but Will Davison 
has never won this race. There's a lot to play for, Aaron Noonan, and it all comes down to these final 50 minutes. Yeah, Rich, it really does, doesn't it? We are at the business end of the High Tech Oils, Bathurst 6 hour. I just went for the run all the way down there to the last garage. I wanted it on the public record that I made it all the way back here okay. Bad news for 118. The BMW went into limp mode, and I just spoke to Cam Hill. The car went back on the road. It's still in limp mode. They're in big trouble. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff in this race. And once again, Bathurst continues to boil towards a big finish here. So Will Davison will lead the field back to green two. Lap runners in between first and second overall. So Jade No Jade a little further back and already Will Davison has gone early. He had to go early to build this margin. Jaden is going to have to sit there. He cannot get past this slower Toyota 86 and he is burning time right now through Murray's corner. He will get back underway with bang on 50 minutes to go. Now he can stand on the loud pedal and right as that control line comes through, Jade No Jade gets past. He will also get down the Osborne Motorsport McGarn into turn number one as well. But like we've seen throughout the course of the day, traffic deeper in the field. Two drivers I want to watch in the middle of shot. Yellow car, Thomas Randall, car 92. Behind them, Tyler Everingham. Subaru going full rally mode on the outside of turn one. That's the local uh, Harry Inwood car. 118 back in pit lane. I think their day is done. They're not going to contend anymore. They're still battling mechanical issues. Everingham with lots of new rubber on car 24. Fourth. Randall pressing on in third place. Let's not rule out those two cars. Prepared by GWR Australia. They are definitely in contention for this race. And I've got to say, the outstanding performance in Salteri and Jem Usel, Triple Two Honey Performance Volkswagen, leading their class, yes, but fifth outright is an enormous potential result for those guys with, of course, a lot of the race still to run. Davison won himself 4.3 seconds by virtue of being the first car behind the safety car and by having a couple of lap cars between himself and Jaden Ojeda. And now the pursuit begins anew. Some people might have been doing their Easter egg hunt this morning. Well, the hunt will certainly be on right now for Jaden Ojeda. It's the 64 machine. Jeez, haven't they had a rough afternoon the last half hour of this race with fuel dramas down there in the pits. Looking at Randall and Everingham here. Going out of position three and four. They've got a little bit of traffic in front right now still as well with Aaron Seaton leading class. Everingham has been able to close now onto the rear here of Randall. Not sure if you can hear in the background of our commentary box microphone, but the car 118 is revving as it tries to leave the lane and maybe they might have been able to resolve that. We'll have to wait and see though. So Randall pulls towards drivers right here, heading down Conrod straight, just getting through the Aaron Seat machine that's a lap down. Everingham will try and do the same side by side though through the fastest point of the racetrack. Everingham gets through and still a car length away here from Randall. And the reason Aaron Seaton's getting a wriggle on is because he and the Mercedes AMG are on the same lap in the battle for A2 class the normally aspirated big banger cars in this race. So Luke King's behind the wheel of the Merc, 10th outright, only one spot behind and on the same lap. So that is a race for the class victory. That Mercedes has been parked three times in this race on the side of the road. Stopped, dead stick, but somehow they've managed to get it going. Ojeda, 2.24.9 last time around. That is the quickest lap of the race for car number one. Will Davison only managed 26-1. I wonder if there's a little bit of just conservation knowing they've got a bit of track position up the road. Tyres might be paying a yep. part as well in this one now for Ojeda. So it's going to be on very, very shortly for the race lead. We continue to watch third here at the moment. Randall holding sway right now in the yellow pages. 92 entry. If anything, now starting to pull a little bit of a margin as Muggleton. Oh, oh, slowing. Slowing, unfortunately, for Everingham. The car that was in position number four, it may have gone into some sort of a limp mode as well as it continues to halt. And more drama as well for the Honda Integra Type R. Class D, we might be under the intervention of a safety car once again because Everingham has stopped on the exit of Griffin's Bend. They've been battling with gear shift issues in that car all day, remember, so I Correct. wonder if that's reared its ugly head. Good point. Good point. Just as though Jada was trying to reel in in that battle for position number one as well. It's just come alive in the last hour, hasn't it? It's all happening. We've got cars stopped, cars in limp mode. Uh, a lot of pressure on cars with penalties. And now we've got the fourth place car, Tolling Erringham, stopped on the exit of turn two. Will he be able to get that car going again? There's that Honda. It looked like it did hit the fence, similar to that little Mazda 
unfortunately, that's the end of their day as well. To get into that fifth hour and have those sorts of things happen, so disappointing for the team. They've all worked so hard for the week. And unfortunately, that Class D Honda is certainly uh, uh, is, is not going to be able to safety make the car. finish of the race. But as we suspected, there's a safety car. We've got two cars stopped out there on the circuit. So we've got the uh, 42 car, the Class D car, little Honda Integra that has hit the fence at Forest Elbow and brought out the safety car again. And more importantly, I don't think there will be any lap runners in between first and second. So uh -oh. we should get a straight out fight once this race gets back underway. <laughs> Oh, doesn't it set up for a mouth-watery finish? What is it about Bathurst? It doesn't matter what event it is here. It always throws up something incredible in the last portion of this event. Well, it's the best place in the world, Brian, and that's about it. So... Not only first and second, and third as well. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So Thomas Randall will be well and truly in this, and that car has been quick all day into pit lane again. This is such a sad story for the DA Campbell Transport Outfit, who have been in contention... A reminder of your class leaders, Davison, OJ to Randall, the top three battling for a Bathurst victory on Sunday afternoon on Easter Sunday. In Salteri in front, Dimitri Agathos, the Subaru has been outstanding today. Nash Morris, potential podium as well for the AMG. Aaron Seaton leading Luke King in class A2. There's still a bit to play out there. The Camaro, remarkably, still third in class. So they're not done yet for a Bathurst podium, which would be a huge result. Courtney Prince leads Class B by a lap for Team Buccini. Nathan Halstead on top in the 77 Volkswagen in Class C. Tim Barwick in the Toyota leads the way in Class D. And the Mazda on top. Mark Talbot's behind the wheel of Class E. This race building towards a big finish. It's in the high-tech oils. Back the six outs, the eighth running of this race. There has never been a repeat winner and we are in the situation where first and second are both looking to become repeat winners of this race. And what a fight it is. Will Davison. Yep, Will Davison. He's a guy that's won the great race a couple of times. He's won supercar races. He's battled for championships. He's one of the best supercars drivers of the last couple of decades in our sport. He's battling with Jaden Ojeda, who is one of the rising young stars of Australian motor racing. He's got an international GT career on the horizon. He's got Mercedes, AMG and international racing teams behind him. And then in third place is Thomas Randall. This guy can do everything. He's an annoyingly good commentator. He's going to put us out of a job. He can play the piano. Oh, and it turns out, very good racing car driver. This is a great fight brewing. And we're behind the safety car for what is the 10th time today at Mount Panorama. It's been a busy day. Aaron Noonan, it's been a busy day down in the lane as well. Rich, I've got a feeling it's been a busy day that's not about to end anytime soon, but we've got a real mystery with the number 24 BMW. Mike Henry's been around this sport for a long time. This mountain has bitten you a few times. What's going on with Tyler Everingham? It's a bloody good question, to be honest. He was uh, strong, you know, we'd just done the stop, so we were ready to go to the end, had plenty of fuel, new rear tyres, so we were happy and in a strong spot, and then we saw the shot out of turn two behind our teammates and uh, on the wrong side and parked it up. So no radio straight away, so I'm guessing we've had some sort of power out but until we get him back here or it back here, we don't really know. Wouldn't you rather this happen five minutes in than five hours in? This place is cruel. What do you say? It's Bathurst, so every race at Bathurst is a good race, isn't it? And we all love it. It's why we come here and do it. So, um, you know, it's yeah, sometimes we, we've done everything. The boys have done a great job with the sponsors, the drivers, Sid, Fab, everybody just did a great job. So you, you can't complain, but um, it's damn cool when you get to here and you have one of those because everything was done. We'd done all the work. All we had to do was drive it home. The other thing is with Guth Walden Racing, they've still got one in the fight. 92, Thomas Randall behind the wheel. Has he got new tyres too? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, to be honest, I think um, that's the other side of the garage. So clearly we battle each other during the day. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's in a strong spot. And Thomas is quick. So uh, I think he looks good. I don't think the guys in front of us have put tyres on. So from this point, we might start roughing them up a bit and see if we can get him through. So for all the GWR crew, fingers crossed, we've still got one there. Game on. Michael Henry, a guy that engineered the Holden Racing Team to Bathurst success, so he knows a thing or two about winning at this place. OK, we're under safety car. We're about to peel off into pit lane and get this race green again. Who you got, Brian Vanderwacker? Well, thank you, because I get to go first, so I can steal all your picks. I'm going to go with Jaden OJ to that pace that we saw prior to the safety car. I think in terms of outright speed, that car has got it for me. 
Jason Bagwana. Well, if I take the 92, that leaves a 23 for you, so one of us will be right. What do you reckon? You're going to go 92? <laughs> I'm going Tommy Randall. That car was fast this morning. He was pushing pretty hard. He gave Will Davison a very hard time. He wanted to get on with it. Now we're at the sharp end of the day. I'm going the 92. Aaron Noonan and Ben Bagwana in the lane, boys. I'd like your prediction. This is the shootout we want at Mount Panorama. Who you got? Well, it's the shootout that you want. It's the shootout that we're going to get. I've got to go with Thomas Randall. I reckon he's in a great spot. Mike Henry's convinced me that he's got a car fast enough with the right rubber. Uh, Benny, who are you on board with here? Well, I was going to go with Tommy Randall too, but I don't want to copy you. So I'll go Will Davo. I'll back him in. It'll be interesting to see him get his first win here. I think it's going to be one of those scenarios where it's a BMW again. They've dominated this race in terms of the outright and the Class X over the years, but it's always a good question when you can't pick which one. So let's see. But they're all closed up. It's a classic Bathurst battle. Thanks, boys. Appreciate that. Let's see how this <laughs> no, plays no, no, out. No, no, no. Richard Crowell, come on. Who have you got? Well, do you know what? Will Davison, he's been copying it lately, unfairly copying it on social media. This is a guy that knows how to win a motor race at this place and everywhere. I think my money's on the 23, but it's easy to say that because he's leading. Either way, this is going to be spectacular because it's Bathurst, folks. It always is. A shootout on Sunday afternoon at Mount Panorama. It's what we want to see. And Will Davison, is he up to the challenge? Will it be Jaden Ojeda? Or could Thomas Randall pull a surprise from third? We've got 35 minutes to find out at Mount Panorama. The high-tech oils, Bathurst six hour is back underway. And this is a battle between the Bimmers. 35 minutes remaining. It might as well have just started the race now, isn't it? It's like a sprint. Here we go, guys. This is on. Will Davison, he's going to turn the mirror away. He doesn't want to look in the mirror. He just wants to head down, clean air, get the job done. We've seen that overheating issue that one car's had when it's been tucked up behind other cars. So he's going to have to find clean air as the day goes on to ensure he's got something to attack with. Tommy Randall is just going to sit at the back there and wait to see what happens with these bleeding two. He wants to get in the fight with 35 minutes remaining. But then there's Jaden Ojeda, and about the only place he hasn't passed someone at Bathurst is the Dipper, mainly because it's almost impossible to do so. But if anyone could do it, it might be him. Remember three wide coming out of or into the metal grate a couple of hours ago. This guy can do crazy things at the mountain. And Thomas Randall, he's just hanging back, just biding his time. I think he senses opportunity here. And while they might all be BMWs, they are most certainly all rivals. There's no team play here. And the top three all looking. The car in third place looking for their first Bathurst victory. The teams first and second looking to go and double up, although for drivers in both of those cars, it would still be a first Bathurst win. George Meadeke has jumped into car number one. Will Davison, the last time that car won the race, Wilbur was a spectator. So he's joined Tim Lay and Beric Linton. But Ojeda looking close, the car sliding, moving around, under brakes on the run into the cutting. I actually thought Jaden was going to have a look at that one then. I think he thought better of it, and he pulled back out of it again. Now he's just going to tuck it behind the 23 and let the M4 do its thing down the front straight here at Conrad into the chase. I don't think he's close enough this time to have an attack, but let's see these cars slide through the chase late in the day. The brakes are worn out, the tyres are hot and squirmy. This is where all they... Oh, he's sliding that car at the moment. Deep into the chase. They're pushing hard. This is fantastic to see. Production car racing at its very best right now. Gee, Davo looked actually really good on the exit then of the chase. Probably gained himself a car length then between himself and Ojeda. Ojeda again, that car wanting to squabble under brakes heading into Murray's corner. Just collects a little bit of that inside curb. But with 33 minutes to go, these two are going to go hammer and tong. Jaden just trying to bite his tie at the moment. Davo just trying to keep him behind. And if these two keep fighting, guess what? Tommy Randall's going to pick them both off. Jaden Ojeda, 224.93. That is three one hundredths off that car's best lap for the entire race on lap 109. But Will Davison in front punched out a 24.8. So car 23 still has plenty of speed as well. This is good stuff. And Randall just keeping a watching brief on just behind. At the moment, not showing the raw car speed in the breast cancer trials car. But who knows? He might be keeping something up his sleeve. Fourth place is still in, in Salteri. On the lead lap, 109 laps. So too Dimitri Agathos in fifth place. So should these three stumble and fall, they will be there to pick up the pieces. 
by no way and means is this done yet. Aaron Seaton continues to lead Class A2. He's six outright and has just set the quickest lap of the race for that car on lap 108. And oh. slowing goes one of our Class C contenders. Contenders, that was the leader of the class. The 77 car lost has lost bark. the front left. I can see that out the front here, but is that going to pull a safety car again? Surely. Close up the way. field yet again. It's out of the way at the moment, but we'll have to wait and see what race control wish to do with that. We've also got a black flag been issued for a car down at uh, the start finish line here as Jaden O'Jada now wants to try and press this on. He's definitely quicker across the top, isn't he? He's quicker down the hill. He gets right in behind Will Davis as they get onto the straight at Conroy. Pluck the gears and now tuck right in underneath the boot lid of that 23. The reigning champion, we're right on board with him here at the moment. He is right in underneath the rear of your race leader. Is he going to be close enough this time by? We saw him a moment ago squirm under brakes. This might be the opportunity here for Jaden O'Jada. Drives it in hard. We're right on board with your reigning champion. Davison ever so slightly covers. O'Jada will look towards the outside here. Davison holds on. It's going to be at Murray's corner here, though, once again. Davison, he is struggling at the moment because this car that we ride on board with has got fresher rubber, and he is using that to his advantage right now. Great race craft from Wilbur, though. He positioned the car nicely. He's done this before. He knows how to play this game. And confirming they've recovered the former Class C leader, Underwave Yellows, so there will not be a safety car. I don't know who'll have the biggest sigh of relief of that or not. <laughs> what a brilliant motor race. This is fantastic stuff, isn't it? This is what we've come to love at this glorious venue once again. Davison just ever so slightly pulling out that lead out in front. Look at O'Dana still sideways as he goes to Griffin's Bend. In fact, he's missed the apex by a mile, then he's going to cost himself a lot of time. Quick update down the lane with Aaron Noonan. Brian, this is taking me back some eight years. I just want to bring this up for you. Remember when Will Davison and Techno won the Bathurst 1000 in 2016? He had a flying Shane Van Gisbergen on his hammer. Where did he control him in that race? Forest elbow. That's where he got the margin. Look at the gap he's building across the top here. Has he let Ojeda cook the goodness in those tyres on car number one? You said it before. He's been around. He tested Formula One. He won in British Formula Three. He's won a pile of supercars races. I'll tell you what, he's going to be hard to beat from here because he'll make that 23 car pretty wide. But watch him control Ojeda off the elbow. That's the critical one here today. Well, Davison was one second quicker then to the first timing split. And you mentioned the point there about overheating these tyres. These MRF tyres are very easy to overheat. You sometimes have to give them a lap or two in order to come back to you. So very good point. Great update there in the lane with Aaron Noonan. Half a second faster, though, than was Jaden O'Jada through the top section of the racetrack. And once again, he is closing and slowing is your race leader. Will Davison <laughs> is slowing with 29 minutes in this race to go. It appears now maybe it's back up to speed but a race lead change your reigning champions now into position number one what has happened there is that a gear selection issue maybe they obviously couldn't pull the gear it's, it looks like it's come alive again so uh yeah obviously we need to find out what's happened to the bull davison car there lost the lead drama here we go 26 minutes 28 minutes to go and we've got a lead change Thomas Randall still looming just behind in third place. Will he get himself into this mix right now? Car 92 doesn't quite have the raw speed to go with these two out in front. The 227.6 for Davison. It hesitated badly coming out of the elbow. The point that Aaron was talking about how strong it was. And it was a fact because he was right up to that point. A hesitation for car 23. It's all the invitation, all the opportunity that Jaden O'Jada needed. And he now leads the race. A twist in the tail, and I wonder if there's still another one here to come. Davison not giving up, though, yet. It appears that that car is A-OK -okay for the moment and back on pace. We'll get an understanding as to what their first sector times are in just a moment. But Will Davison, now from going on to defence, is going to have to go into attack mode. So Will Davison lost two seconds in that last sector on that last lap. He's gone from hunted now to the hunter. So he's actually going to try and put the pressure on Ojeda. We talk about his skill out in front. Now we'll watch the skill from behind. 
across the top of the mountain. Ojeda is a little quicker, but it's where Will Davison's stronger at the bottom end of the circuit. So now he's got to work his way back onto Ojeda. Hopefully that issue that we saw doesn't repeat itself. We'd like to find out what that is, but if he can get right on the back of Ojeda, there's a good opportunity that he can put the pass on and get the job done. So 59-3 across the traffic. Oh. Hold your oh. breath. Oh. Hold your breath because on the dirt on the outside going down the S is Jade though, Jada. That cavalry is gonna unfortunately just caught the Thomas Randall machine who actually by the look shortcut then going down to the S's as well so he had to jump on the anchors and avoid what was going on we spoke about a twist in the tail we nearly had one right there Randall bailed he bailed across the escape road that's Aaron getting the lowdown from Tim Lay in the Berwick Linton pits right at the end of pit lane trying to get an understanding of where that hesitation was how was OJ to ride out wide just before the dipper Aaron yeah, Rich, I just came down to have a chat to Berwick Linton and Timmy Lake at gear shift. What's going on with 23? Um, I just did a full shift and didn't, cha didn't change gears, so don't know what's going on. But um, it's come back now, but, uh, yeah, it's yeah, painful. Is that the first time that's happened all day? Yep, first, first time all day. It happened in our test and we fixed it. But, yeah, it's perfect timing, isn't it? Definitely not, definitely not. 26 minutes to go, not done yet. Yeah, I wish I was in the car. I hate being out here. It's <laughs> terrible. It's very stressful, I'll let you go. This this race means everything to Tim Lay. Oh, is this the Dimitri Agathos Subaru that was oh. running second in Class A1 and it has cooked itself going down the hill. Oh, sheer disappointment. They were closing in on Ian Salteri as well and the dream that was looking like reality has now been shattered. Well, on maths, Salteri still got a five-second penalty, so they were actually class leaders. They were right in behind him, and now we've got this issue. But, again, that car stopped in that dangerous place. That may bring safety out a safety car. car. Yes, it certainly does. So, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Davo Ford was driver. closing in. Davison was closing in on that last lap. A 2.27 for Jaden Ojeda up against a 2.26.7. So Davo has got speed to burn. 12th safety car of the race. Equals the most. It, it does equal the record for the Bathurst six hour. It's not a record you try and chase, but <laughs> certainly makes things exciting, doesn't it? Thomas Randall gets to the back of these, so it sets up another sprint. It should just be a flat toe, you'd think, to get that car out of the way. Well, it might actually do it on its own. Oh. How much is that depositing fluid and stuff on the racetrack, though, will be the million dollar question. Hopefully it's just, uh, it's not putting it on the racetrack because, uh, doesn't look like it's dripping out. It might have just uh, had a turbo issue. It's burning all the oil through the turbo there. But uh, hopefully it's not putting a deposit on the racetrack because that is a dangerous place to be having oil all over the place. So certainly uh, now we've got the safety car, we shouldn't imagine that's going to be long to clean up considering that car is finding its way back to pit lane. Oh, oh this is forward with Jaden Ojeda to make the point that getting out into that dust on the outside there. It's so dusty and dirty offline. This is the Camry bailing through the gravel trap. Do they get out the other side? Production car ride height is a godsend sometimes and they've done that so they managed to survive. What a weekend adventure it's been for those guys and this is the Subaru expiring. That has turbo failure written all over it. That's the big initial plume of smoke out the back and from the exhaust of the WRX STI out of fifth position. Sometimes this race, this event, this place, it's just cruel. Sometimes? Aaron? Sometimes. A lot of the time. <laughs> Boys, I've just rifled back through the previous seven Bathurst six hours. Is this our 12th safety car of the day? Am I right with that? Yes, correct. Record. So we have equaled the record today. So uh, I do love a stab. Just before I left the uh, Davison, Lay and Linton garage, I grabbed Barry Linton quickly and said, does Will Davison have a license to send? And he said he knows what to do. <laughs> that uh, I read between the lines needs is yes. Yes, he does. 24 car obviously got that back on that flat toe into pit lane. They've obviously got that car back out now and it's good to see them rejoin the race. Obviously a number of laps down uh, but to make the finish is special for these teams. Agathos has tried to get that car back to pit lane but obviously it's now got to almost at the chase. They may be able to tuck that car away now in behind that barrier as you can see there which will make this uh, 
safety car with 22 minutes, 32 seconds remaining. It looks like we're going to come down to less than a 20 minute sprint, plus a lap, obviously, when that uh, the timer runs out. So it's going to be uh, a very much a sprint race to the end of this one. Oh, a lot of smoke there, wasn't it, on Conrod Straight? It's certainly not a house fire. It is certainly a car that has yeah. lunged itself. Look at that. It's an odd looking sight, isn't it? There's not a breath of wind. It's just sitting there in the. Uh, Above Kenya Bull's place, I think, is in there somewhere. <laughs> He's probably sitting back watching this, enjoying it uh, from his front deck. Oh, dear. Mount Panorama serving it up once again here. Late on an Easter Sunday afternoon here. Hope you've enjoyed the, the day wherever you might be. Of course, on this wonderful Easter Sunday, we've been enjoy enjoying ourselves here at the High Tech Oils Bath of Six Hour, and it's about to go to another level once again. Remember, 12 months ago, we had a late race safety car and we had a one lap dash to the finish. Well, we're not far off that at the moment here either. Yeah, well, I mean, it's going to be a 15 minute sprint race, isn't yeah. it? By the time they get that car recovered. What a setup this is. Brief mechanical glitch, hands the lead to <laughs> Jaden O'Jada and the defending champions. Who writes these scripts? The team that has won this race before. They finished second in 2021, Beric Linton and Tim Lay. They haven't had a lot of luck since then. They've qualified on pole more times than anyone else in the history of this race. But this race has only been won from pole twice in the seven previous editions. So it's not easy to win from the front row. The last time the race was run from pole in 2021, but Beric Linton and Tim Lay won it in 29 from pole position. They also have the honour of having led every single lap of that race, including during pit stops. That was a fair old domination that day. It has not been the case today. We're going back to green this time by, by the way. 20 minutes on the clock as we speak. It'll be about 18 by the time they get to the bottom of the big hill and send them loose again for another Bathurst sprint. So what, so to be around about nine, nine laps remaining in the race, I'd suggest somewhere maybe eight laps remaining in the race so it's uh, certainly not many opportunities for will davison to find a way through his best chance forest elbow the other one down at the chase so uh, in terms of the straight line speed those two cars look very very similar he's going to have to set him up across the top of the mountain and look for an opportunity out at forest elbow if he can get a really good run onto out of forest elbow onto the straight down at the braking zone at, at the chase so that's about his best opportunities for an overtake uh, Ojeda, we've seen him defend hard today, and that was with two hours to go in the race. So uh, he's prepared to put it on the line and make it happen. Quite sure where the rest of the field are. They're certainly not on the back of the safety car queue. Before we go back to green, uh, just bring up just BBD class leaders for those following at home. Uh, tenth outright, leader in class B1, Courtney Prince in the triple nine. Team Buccini, BMW, still leads the way with the... Uh, wheel falling off the wagon for the Volkswagen team. Matt Slavin now leads Class C. They're 16th outright. Tim Barwick in car 22. They've led a majority of the day in their Toyota 86. 17th outright and leading Class D. And Mark Taubit still on top in Class E in the Mazda. Their 30th outright. A lot of walking wounded behind them. There's the rest of the queue. The rest of the field caught up. And then further up the field, A1 is Ian Salteri leading the way over Nash Morris, who's a little bit further back and a lap behind. Aaron Seaton still leads A2 over Luke King, but they are on the same lap, so there's still plenty to play out there. The Mazda does the right thing and gets out of the way. The three BMWs are released. There's 18 minutes and 30 seconds on the clock, and another Bathurst Enduro comes down to a Sunday sprint. OJ to Davison and Randall to fight it out for the big win. Sound of beamers rocking through Hell Corner and up Mountain Straight. The fantastic drone shot looking down onto these top three cars as they work their way up Mountain Straight. O'Jada already starting to try and pull clear here. Davison's been pretty good here through Griffin's band. He's typically been a little bit better through the first sector and also the last sector, but it's been O'Jada that's been strong going across the top. BMW M4, BMW M3, BMW M2. Oh. oh, class leader. Class leader, Courtney Prince, slow. 
Now they've got a lap over the car that's second in class who actually just went through pit lane. That's the number 28 car with Matt Charter behind the wheel. But a hesitation from the class leading team, Puccini BMW. But Courtney looks like she's got that refired and has got it going again. At the first sector, 58-5. For Ojeda, 58-6 for Will Davison, 59-0 for Tommy Randall. These guys are pushing hard. In terms of the fastest lap of the race, that was a 58-4. So we know they're absolutely on the limit at this time of the race. What we may have seen with that safety car as well, remember how hard Jaden was pushing, probably over-pressuring those tyres, heating them up. I reckon this safety car period now has just been able to cool everything with those tyres, so this might have actually worked in his favour already. Davison starting to fall back into the clutches of Thomas Randall. New fastest second sector at the race, though, for Jaden Ojeda. 39.2 across the top and fastest in the second sector overall, so he is right now on fastest lap of the race pace. Restart lap so critical in a late race sprint. And right now, Jaden is absolutely nailing it. Well, this is the car that was second in Class B and it's been pushed into the garage to be worked on by Gary Minnell's on-track motorsport team. So both first and second in Class, stumbling at the end in Class B. Bring up to speed with Courtney Prince and make sure that car's still going. Ojeda through Murray's corner and to the line, lap time check to 2.24.09. It's almost very nearly the quickest lap of the race, but it by nine tenths is the quickest lap of the race for car number one. On lap record pace, the juice, and Will Davison continues to apply the pressure, the margin 1.1. Randall at 2.25.4 just doesn't quite have the raw speed. Well, that was a very quick garage visit for the number 28 car, and Matt Charter's back on the racetrack but has almost surrendered a position, not quite. The tortured sound of some MRFs being hurled at Griffin's Bend, protesting against the rate at which Jaden Ojeda wants to get that car through the middle of turn two. Visually, you, you can see the gap open up across the top of the mountain, but Will is certainly a little bit quicker in this first sector, and certainly in the last sector, there was a good oh, six, uh, five tenths in it. So. Here we go, we'll have a look at the, the sectors now. Jada pushing very hard as we hit 59, 58-9. Uh, 58-9 for both Will Davison, 59-0 for Tommy Randall. So again, pushing right to the limit with only 14 minutes remaining on the clock. One lap after 17.43 local time. So that countdown clock has just under 15 minutes. That's to basically what will be the final lap of the race. Utterly intense. Nothing between the three of them. These are world-class racing car drivers. All of them at the top of their game still. Fifty-nine-five across the top for Ojeda. Pulled three tenths over Davison across there. And in fact, oh. Davison's come back to Randall. Is it the same issue? Thomas is in the toe. Change of position oh. for BMWs. Randall on the grass. It was Ojeda last year. This time, Thomas, he goes down the inside and he takes second position away. And Will Davison is struggling with this car that has led so much of today's race. Another hesitation at exactly the same point, And all of a sudden, he's third. Oh, that is painful to watch. Poor Will Davison. He's had the same problem appear. Two laps where it's taken him from leading the race, then from second. Now he's back into third. They're still on the podium. But the pain of being in that car at the moment, watching Ojeda drive away, knowing that it's got that little problem. Tom Randall with the opportunistic move to get by, even if it meant sending it on the grass down Conrod. GWR is staying at number 505 Conrod Straight this weekend, so anyone that's wandered back to the house would have got the box seat view of that because it happened almost by the driveway of that residence. Here it is. And that is almost a carbon copy of what happened when the 23 car hesitated. Will, he moved a little bit, but look, you're going to, aren't you, at this point of a race? Thomas was well aware to that, and Randall sliced through and gets himself to second. And now what can the young Victorian do to challenge Jaden Ojeda? It's almost becoming one of the favourite passing opportunities here at Mount Panorama, on the grass, going down Conrod Strait. <laughs> 
Quite remarkable scenes here. So now it means that Ojeda has a 3.1 second lead out in front. Davison now trying to wrestle second place back here at the moment. I see leader in the lane, the Astro rolling through. They've got some margin. I wonder if that's just a little safety stop for them to make sure they get to the end of the race. 16th outright, Matt Slavin behind the wheel. There it is. Maybe it's a drive through, perhaps. I think it actually might be. Because they've just transited right through and have gone out the other side. of Mount Panorama will get a time check here for Randall, a 40 dead compared to a 40.2, so he was two tenths of a second quicker. Let's look at this Davison machine coming back down Conrod straight, a little better this time by. Just to put a full stop on that, it was a drive-through penalty for a pit stop breach, and I'm told they actually might have another one to serve following that. It's lucky they've got a few laps up the sleeve of those around them. 9 now from first back to second. So Jaden now just managing the pace here out in front. You'll see that in his rear vision mirror. So now he doesn't have to push this car as hard as what he was before because this is, as we've seen, much about getting the car towards the finish as it is trying to manage yourself. Davison up on the wheel, then you could see that with his red gloves, then going through the final turn at Murray's corner. Looking a little bit further back, Mercedes AMG, Josh Muggleton in front. Remember the fueling dramas that have blighted the Camaro in the final third of this race. They've been so good today. Luke King, seventh outright in the Mercedes AMG. These guys have had a remarkable day. It's been dramatic as well. And there have been times when we thought they weren't going to make it to the end. But as we jump on board, Luke's just set that car's quickest lap. 32.5. I don't think he's going to trouble Aaron Seaton up in front, but if the Mustang falters, the Mercedes will be right in the best position. But he's battling for track position too, because Nash Morris in car number 91 is right on his tail. And we can confirm for fans of uh, Courtney Prince and the Puccini team, the all-girl outfit, they're in, still in contention and still leading their class. They are ninth and still running, and they've got track position, so they're OK. The team that won the race last year in that class are second. Yep. Look like further back. That gap, 2.5 seconds. But Tommy Randall has just done three tenths quicker in the first sector. He's come alive with 10 minutes to go. This is still on. There's 2.3 two, there's seconds now between the leader and Tommy Randall, who's opening a little gap over Will Davison. He's had those tyres on that car. He's in a very strong position. And there's going to be a bit of traffic play into this right now. You can see here, O'Shea has been caught in a little bit of traffic, so that's going to close that gap up. If Tommy Randall can get a clean run through this traffic, we're going to end up now. It's under two seconds. So this is still alive in terms of this race position. 40.7 for Ojeda across the top. He lost nearly a second so far on this lap. And perfect timing for Randall and for Davison because they got to the lap cars on Conrod and drive past them. So much less of a delay for the cars in second and third. Lap traffic giveth and lap traffic taketh away in this race and the 12 hour, but right now it's given to those in second and third. The margin 1.9, it's back under two seconds. There's more traffic going to play into this. There's cars passing in front of us. So these guys are going to catch a number of cars in this next few laps. Can that traffic work in the favour of Tommy Randall? Is it going to be Ojeda that can weave his way through that traffic and make it clean? Can Will Davison get back after that, that gear shift drama he's experienced that's taken him from the lead of the race? He, wants, he doesn't want to give up. He's not prepared to give up just yet. This is still on with eight and a half minutes remaining. A 226.9 versus a 226.1 from first back to second. Will Davison, 226.6, and they're all within the 26s right now. But Randall, eight tenths of a second faster than on that previous lap. Interesting to note, though, Ojeda, even through that final second, was two tenths of a second quicker. So continuing to try and hold that lead out in front. This car's had traumas all day. Unfortunately, it was in the sand trap down there at the chase when Alice Buckley was behind the wheel. Continuing to roll through deep in the field at the moment. So eight minutes left in this race. 
the leaders will be coming up through the first timing intermediate very very shortly 59.5 for Jaden Ojeda exactly the same for Thomas Randall so there's the class D leader uh, the 22 and then is that car two right behind it as well no that's the, that's second in class I think that looks right it's right behind it there at the moment so Whilst that battle's been going, I'm just trying to get that information for you at the moment, exactly where they sit. But uh, in terms of those battles, it's fantastic to see this thing drag on all day. So, um, you know, right down to this last seven or eight minutes, you can see that they've got these battles that still continue right through. Brian to crunch the numbers in that Class D battle. It's a BMW going slowly through the chase. That's the 971. It's not the class leading B class car. It's the Team Pacini A1 entry. So Tim Barwick leading Class D, car number 22. And a lap behind is Andrew McMaster in the BMW 125i that's so far 17th overall in car yeah. two. So that's not a fight for a class leadership position. Traffic for the leader. Traffic for the car in second. This gap, concertinas, and ebbs and flows. It's 2.3 seconds now. Davison has dropped back behind as well here, so he's lost a fair bit of margin here. From second back to third, so whether or not, again, that issue is just starting to rear its ugly head here once again. Just over six minutes to go now as the leaders go back across the start-finish line. 26.3 that time by for Jaden Ojeda. Thomas Randall, 26.4 versus a 227.3. So almost a second slower than for Will Davison back there in position number three. Think about this 24-year-old from Sydney who leads the race. Think about Simon Hodges, who had the biggest moment of his career in racing last year in winning the Bathurst Six Hour, was presented with the plaque on Thursday by the Mayor of the Bathurst Regional Council, Jess Jennings, over at the National Motor Racing Museum. He will be forever recognised as a Bathurst champion. And think about George Medici, who was drafted into this team to give them some strategic flexibility, and it's paid off because George did an enormous job behind the wheel of car number one in the first third of this race. He drove for two hours and got them in a position where they could tick off all their compulsory pit stops early. It's given them flexibility. It's put them in the right place at the right time. As a team, they have performed brilliantly today, but it's still only 2.46 uh, seconds first to second. Jaden brought Matt Harvey across to come and strategize this car for this weekend. They've worked together a lot with their Mercedes program overseas. We mentioned earlier in the day that Matt has won the Team Le Mans. He's done some great things in the Nürburgring 24 hour. And remember, he slotted Jade No Jada into this car with just under three hours to go, which is right on the limit for your maximum driving time. But he's got a wall of 86s in front of him at, again, the worst possible point in this racetrack. How close did that get Randall? And once again, it's a little free pass for Thomas. So he's pulled another couple of tenths out. Closest winning margin, about the six hour history, 2.79 seconds last year. By car number one, what is car number one now? And this car off the side of the road, you would assume being driver's left pit exit, they'll leave it there. Randall is being pretty aggressive, carving up this traffic, working his way through. I think he knows it's his opportunity and it might be his only opportunity but it's going to take a pretty substantial delay for Jaden Ojeda to be caught up to have an effect on the outcome of this race. And it ebbs and flows. All of a sudden, it's back out to three seconds now. So it was two seconds at the top of the hill, three at the bottom, and that's just the ebb and flow of light traffic on the mountain. Even Will Davison then in the back of shot was having to really negotiate some of those cars coming out of Murray's corner as well as almost like a man-made chicane then coming down the high-tech oils pit straight. Graphic shot there of the gaps between your top three out in front as they rise the crest on Mountain Straight. And it's almost equal three seconds between each of them. So it's 3.1 O'Jada to Randall. And then a further 2.7 seconds back to Davison. Still Ian Saltieri, fourth overall, and remaining on the lead lap as well. Just one minute and 11 seconds away from the overall race lead. What a great performance that's been. It feels unfair picking a performance of the day in a race like this, doesn't it? But 
that's got to be right up there. Marks, just talk about the intensity of this and what it's like in the closing stages. You've been here. I mean, what is this like for these guys that are trading sector times that are as good as they've been in the entire race at the end when everything's worn out, everything's tired, drivers included? I mean, this is as good as it gets. Absolutely. And on that restart, we saw the pressure of those guys, the intensity, the way they pushed and uh, and to, to try and get that little gap. Jada did an amazing job. The fastest lap of the car after five and a half hours of the race closing stages. So right now, he's probably got a bit of a breather. He's just making good decisions around where to pick through this traffic, make sure he doesn't get that wrong. He can look in the mirror. The gap's opening a little bit. He'll start to feel a little bit more comfortable at this stage. Will Davison, he's not giving up. He knows that if he can get that car to stay on the podium, that's a great result considering he was leading and unfortunately had that uh, those shift issues that certainly hurt him. So obviously uh, you can see uh, Ajada flashing the headlights there, making that traffic aware, but it's the simple little mistake at this time of the race that can end the entire day's work. Go on, oh, Randall. Like that. Talking about it. <laughs> Big slide. There should be two laps remaining. A minute and 37. And then the clock will tick to zero and it will be one lap. Ojeda across the line. Randall throwing everything he possibly can in this BMW that's fought all day. They narrowly missed the podium last year and they were pretty gutted at GWR. They fought really hard. They might be gutted for a different reason this time by because they're within 3.1 seconds of winning the biggest production car race of the year. We've got some great shots there a moment ago of George Medici just watching on. He would be nervous inside that garage. The 38-year-old from Port Macquarie got a Class A2 win here in 2021 with some significant names in Paul Morris and Brody Kostecki. Never had an outright win before. This one is going to mean the world to him as well. One think of the family history there as well. Dad Andrew, one of the greats of our sport in open wheel racing in Australia and in touring cars as well. George, busy with the Medici Motor Group in Port Macquarie. Huge business. This is an opportunity to get away. He's got a young family. Who's that off the road? At the big HSV, car number 10. Been a fairly checkered day for them. Fortunately, it's not stuck and it drives onwards. Jada again, just catching some traffic. Likewise then for Randall. At a precarious point on the racetrack through the grade. And in fact, if anything, now that's actually brought Davison a little bit closer now towards the rear of Thomas Randall. So maybe that battle for third isn't quite, or second I should say, isn't quite done yet with a lap and a half to go. Blue flags waving. Randall may be under attack here in the very latter half of this race for Will Davison. Top three cars are covered by 4.4 seconds. Last year at the chequered flag, the top three cars were covered by 4.4 seconds. It is such a carbon copy the way this race has played out. Just different numbers in a different order. BMWs one, two, and three once again for the fourth consecutive year if they finish that way. They will start the final lap next time by. 121 laps in. So the record distance, 131. They're away aways from that. It's about average in terms of the seven races held before in terms of distance edging towards 760 kilometres of racing at Mount Panorama. Just what a year it would be for George Medici because he and his wife Jess are expecting their second child as well. So 2024 might just be a golden year in that household. There's one more lap to go now for Jade No Jade, your reigning champion. They have played it strategically perfectly today. And now, with 2.2 seconds to the good, they've got 6.213 kilometres to get back to the start-finish line and take out another Bathurst six-hour crown. And on that last lap, Jade No Jade is a 28-0. Tommy Randall a 27-0. 25-6. What's What's happening here? 25-6 for Will Davison, and he's now back into this game. The gap between the front two cars, three cars, is now just on two seconds. The, the traffic's going to play in it. I'm not, I'm not watching. What's happening here? Uh, this is not done yet. The margin <laughs> has closed in. It's two car lengths. They've got slow cars at the cutting. Ojeda has been ruthless with traffic. It's been his hallmark. He needs to be so now because Randall is right there, and Davison to the back. These are the top three cars after six hours of motor racing at Mount Panorama.
They're not purpose-built race cars. They're production cars. They're tuned up to go racing. They are out on their feet, and the top three covered by 1.1 seconds at the end of another Bathurst Epic. Is this over, or is there still something else to play out? So a Jada's car was slowing going up Mountain Straight. It appears to be OK now as they work their way down into the dipper. Again, though, lap traffic still in front of this Jada machine. We saw Thomas Randall really catch cars in the awkward moment. Speaking of awkward moments, Jada having go towards the inside here at Forest Elbow. Still, though, a car in front for the run down Conrod Straight. Thomas Randall is right there. He's going to get some toe from the race leader. There's nothing in it past the BMW. These are the top three cars in the Bathurst six hour. Has Jaden O'Jada done enough? <laughs> the nerves in the, in the pit boxes, this is amazing. You're only two quarters away and you still don't know what's going to happen. O'Jada sliding the car through the chase right down the end of the race. Look at that gap. There's nothing between it. Will Davison now right on the back of Randall. This is close. The quest has been been to oh. win this back to back. <laughs> Randall with a moment. It's on for second. Davison round the outside. They're going to wrestle for this one. Back to back. Task achieved. Jaden Ojeda does it for Simon Hodges and George Meineke wins at Bathurst. And the battle for second decided by two tenths of a second. Thomas Randall gets there. The top three covered by 1.4 seconds at the line after six hours and one minute of racing. And the juice has done it again. The relief, the pressure relief on those guys. That's an amazing result. Fantastic to watch. How was that battle for P2 as well? Jade, no Jada. Congratulations. Medecki, let's hear from them in pit lane. Fantastic job. Oh, Bugs, there was so much stress here. Two in a row, Simon. You got the big fella in this year. Two in a row, unbelievable. You look a little stressed here. Holy dooly, mate. I reckon my heart rate's been about 200 beats a minute for an hour. Um, no, that's awesome. It was so good. It, you know, thanks so much to Simon for, for allowing me to come and join this crew. It's, oh, what a day. How good. Simon, that call early to just keep stopping, keep racking up those stops, opened you up for the second half of the race. And look what happened. It did, thanks to Matt for that. So Matt has done that strategy at the 12 hour before. It was always our goal to get the CPS is ticked off as early as we could. And then it opened it up for Jaden, as you said. That was a great result. Tell me, was last year better or this year better because it was so close there at the end? I'll tell you after the celebrations tonight <laughs> at, at, at about 10 o'clock. I've got a funny feeling there's going to be a couple of beverages had tonight. What a stunning end to the high tech oils bath of six hour. Closest racing finish noons in the history of this race for first and second and first, second and third. BMWs one, two and three. Wow, A1 goes to the Volkswagen. Seaton wins Bathurst. A2 goes the way of the Ford Mustang. What a day. The pilgrimage has begun. The fans and the teams are working their way to that famous Mount Panorama podium where George Medici, Simon Hodges and Jaden Ojeda will celebrate at the end of a remarkable race, another incredible Bathurst six hour. And just before midday today, it started and we had all the usual Bathurst drama play out. The Sherrins, well, they finished sixth in the end. Remarkably, this was them within the first half an hour of the race, dipped into a spin at McPhillamy Park. There were moments all the way through a dramatic day. The car that finished fourth outright tipped the Lexus into a spin at the elbow and was penalised for that result. It was one of uh, a numerous number of incidents in this race that featured 12 safety cars over its duration. A spin for car number seven. We thought that might be the worst of it for Quinn, Quinn and Denya. They were able to recover from that and continue to punch on towards the end. Car 81, well, they were never really in the mix. A couple of punches early. There was a little bit of contact, and unfortunately, they managed to limp to the finish. But, wow, Tom McLennan finished ninth outright for that team. A, a tough start for he, David Russell, and Shane Small. And Brock Giblin's team, they were quick at occasion in the big HSV, but ultimately a right front drama. Cost them a lot of time early, and they limped their car home. And as always, the top of Mount Panorama provided plenty of moments, and this was a big one for this Ford Mustang that found contact with the fence and then heavier again, car number nine. Tyler Mecklen was behind the wheel at the time and quite a heavy impact. Restarts, they were so busy today as the lap cars got themselves out of the way. That was the 81 car locking both fronts on the running to Hill corner. 
and restarts and traffic indeed would determine the way this played out. The battle between Mustang and Camaro, if this is the future of Australian production car racing, sign us up because it was terrific today and it was only an unfortunate moment with a refueling issue that cost the Chevy Camaro a shot at winning at Bathurst on debut. But they'll be back and they have shown today that they are genuine contenders for a Bathurst victory. And then car 118, well, Cameron Crick and Dean Campbell were in the mix all day. They had a limp mode issue in that car. Production car electronics cost them and they would ultimately limp down the order and try and get themselves to the flag. This is a huge moment. Ryder Quinn leading the class. Light contact on the left, heavy contact on the right. Two impacts. The young Queensland is okay. The car written off and their day over and the class wins slipping away in their Ford Mustang. That handed the advantage to Aaron Seaton. And then the battle for the lead was well and truly on and Will Davison was using all of his wealth of experience and two Bathurst 1000 wins to cover off from Jaden Ojeda. But even then, ultimately, it wasn't his driving skill that changed the result here. It was a little gearbox glitch in car number 23 that opened the door for Jaden Ojeda to sail on through. He was wild through the lap traffic. They were pushing so hard at the end and they were having an almighty scrap for the race lead. And in the mix too, Thomas Randall. The last safety car was called when Dimitri Agathos and this Subaru Impreza failed late in the race. There was a safety car call that set up a race to the line. They were running sixth at that point, second in class and in for a massive result. That would be a key factor. It set up a sprint race to the finish. The three BMWs locked together with Ojeda, Davison and Randall battling it out. Three of the best car race car drivers in the country going at it at the end. And then once again for Will Davo, not much he could do. A hesitation out of the elbow. Randall took to the grass, he sliced past and that was second position right there and then and then in the late stages, wow, he had closed up. This was the battle for second all the way to the line. The two supercars rivals boxed on in the end. Randall got there, but it was back to back for Simon Hodges and Jaden Ojeda. And a first up Bathurst victory for George Medici. Car number one, position number one at the end of an incredible high-tech oils Bathurst six hour on Easter Sunday at Mount Panorama Bathurst. And that's what it means. A big Bathurst victory will confirm the results for you. BMWs one, two, and three. Some amazing class performances. And well done, Team Pacini. Prince, Pacini, and Palermo. They win their class. They finish 10th outright. That is a huge job for the all-girl team. They have punched so far above their weight today and they take a class victory at Mount Panorama. That is a huge, huge performance by them. Courtney Prince bringing that car home in the end. The Lexus got there in 11th outright. That's huge for A2. And the Camaro finishes as well. Well deserved to get that car to the end after their dramas. Matt Slavin and Peter Faulkner win Class C in the HSV Astra. And just behind them was the Class D winner. They dominated that class in the second half of the race. Barwick and Wooler, fantastic performance in the Toyota 86. And Class E, the Porsche boys from Melbourne, Talbots, Jackman and Westaway in the Mazda. That car destroyed earlier in the weekend. They patched it back together and they're going to get themselves a Bathurst trophy. Beyond that, well, the tale of the walking wounded and some cars that ultimately didn't make it to the end. Another tough Bathurst Enduro, 12 safety cars, 123 laps completed in the end. A lot of cars failing to make it to the end. Celebrations are going to be long and loud into the night at Mount Panorama. We're going to the podium. Let's celebrate on the Bathurst podium. Welcome to the trophy presentation of the 2024 High Tech Oils Bathurst 6 Hour. We congratulate all teams that finished today's race and pay special thanks to our volunteers for their invaluable efforts in Easter at Mount Panorama. So let's go straight to our first place today. Our winners of the 2024 High Tech Oils Bathurst 6 Hour, car number one in Class X, Simon Hodges, Jaden Ojeda and George Medici. <laughs> And we'll now call upon George Gambino, CEO of High Tech Oils, to present the winning trophy with his grandson, Christian.
Well, there it is, the winners of the high-tech oils, Bathurst six, six Hour. What a day it's been. It leaves you lost for words at the end. A remarkable performance. Thank you for joining us today. It's been an incredible day at the office. On behalf of the entire team that's brought you this broadcast from this morning to this afternoon, thanks for joining us. We hope you've had a fantastic Easter. We'll see you when the high-tech oils, Bathurst Six Hour, returns in 2024.